Section 13 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 27. Naval Affairs. Organization of the Navy Department. Two classes of vessels. Experiments for floating batteries and rams. The Norfolk Navy Yard. Abandonment by the enemy. The Merrimack Frigate made an ironclad. Officers. Trial trip. Fleet of the enemy. Captain Buchanan. Resolves to attack the enemy. Sinks the Cumberland. Burns the Congress. Wounded. Executive Officer Jones takes command. Retires for the night. Appearance of the Monitor. The Virginia attacks her. She retires to shoal water. Refuses to come out. Cheers of English man of war. Importance of the Navy Yard. Order of General Johnston to evacuate. Stores saved. The Virginia burned. Harbor defenses at Wilmington. Harbor defenses at Charleston. Fights in the harbor. Defenses of Savannah. Mobile Harbor and capture of its defenses. The system of torpedoes adopted. Statement of the enemy. Subterra shells placed in James River. How made. Used in Charleston Harbor. In Roanoke River. In Mobile Harbor. The Tecumseh. How destroyed. The organization of the Navy Department comprised under its general supervision a bureau of orders and details, one of ordnance and hydrography, one of provisions and clothing, and one of medicine and surgery. The grades of officers consisted of admirals, captains, commanders, surgeons, lieutenants, and midshipmen. Of the officers at the close of the first year, there were one admiral, twelve captains, thirty commanders, and one hundred and twelve first and second lieutenants. All of the principal officers had belonged to the United States Navy. Owing to the limited number of vessels afloat, many of these officers were employed on shore duties. The vessels of the Navy may be reduced to two classes, those intended for river and harbor defense, as ironclads, rams, floating batteries or river steamboats transformed into gunboats, and seagoing steamers of moderate size, some of them of great speed, but, not having been designed for war purposes, were all unsuited for a powerful armament, and could not be expected to contend successfully with ships of war. Early in 1861, discussions and experiments were instituted by the Navy Department to determine how floating batteries and naval rams could be best constructed and protected by iron plates. Many persons had submitted plans, according to which cotton bales might be effectively used as a shield against shot. Our deficiency in iron, and also in rolling mills to prepare it into plates, caused cotton to be sometimes so employed, though the experiments had satisfied the Navy Department that, instead of cotton being rendered impenetrable by compression, it was really less so than in looser condition, and that iron must needs be of great thickness to resist the direct impact of heavy shot at short ranges. An officer of the Navy, as skillful in ordnance as he was in seamanship, and endowed with high capacity for the investigation of new problems, Lieutenant Catesby Appar Jones had conducted many of these experiments, and, as will be seen hereafter, made efficient use of his knowledge both in construction and in battle. After Virginia had seceded from the United States, but before she had acceded to the Confederate States, viz., on the 19th of April, 1861, General Tolliver, in command of Virginia forces, arrived at Norfolk. Commodore Macaulay, United States Navy, and Commandant of the Navy Yard, held a conference with General Tolliver, the result of which was, quote, that none of the vessels should be removed nor a shot fired except in self-defense, end quote. The excitement which had existed in the town was quieted by the announcement of this arrangement, but it was soon ascertained that the German town and Merrimack, frigates in the port, had been scuttled, and the former otherwise injured. About midnight, as elsewhere stated, a fire was started in the navy yard, which continued to increase, involving the destruction of the ship houses, a ship of the line, and the unfinished frame of another. Several frigates, in addition to those mentioned, had been scuttled and sunk, and other property destroyed, 
to an amount estimated at several million dollars. The Pawnee, which arrived on the 19th, had been kept under steam, and taking the Cumberland in tow, retired down the harbor, freighted with a great portion of valuable munitions, and the Commodore and other officers of the yard. In the haste and secrecy of the conflagration, a large amount of material remained uninjured. The Merrimack, a beautiful frigate in the yard for repairs, was raised by the Virginians, and the work immediately commenced on a plan devised by Lieutenant Brooke, Confederate States Navy, to convert her hull, with such means as were available, into an ironclad vessel. Two-inch plates were prepared, and she was covered with a double-inclined roof of four inches thickness. This armor, though not sufficiently thick to resist direct shot, sufficed to protect against a glancing ball, and was as heavy as was consistent with the handling of the ship. The shield was defective in not covering the side sufficiently below the water line, and the prow was unfortunately made of cast iron. But when all the difficulties by which we were surrounded are remembered, and the service rendered by this floating battery considered, the only wonder must be that so much was so well done under the circumstances. Her armament consisted of ten guns, four single-banded brook rifles, and six nine-inch Delgren shell guns. Two of the rifles, bow and stern pivots, were seven-inch. The other two were six and four-tenths inch, one on each broadside. The nine-inch gun on each side, nearest the furnaces, was fitted for firing hot shot. The work of construction was prosecuted with all haste. The armament and crew were put on board, and the vessel started on her trial trip as soon as the workmen were discharged. She was our first ironclad. Her model was an experiment, and many doubted its success. Her commander, Captain, afterward Admiral, Franklin Buchanan, with the wisdom of age and the experience of sea service from his boyhood, combined the daring and enterprise of youth, and with him was Lieutenant Catesby Appar Jones, who had been specially in charge of the battery and otherwise thoroughly acquainted with the ship. His high qualifications as an ordnance officer were well known in the Old Navy, and he was soon to exhibit a like ability as a seaman in battle. Now the first Confederate ironclad was afloat, the stars and bars were given to the breeze, and she was new christened the Virginia. She was joined by the Patrick Henry, six guns, Commander John R. Tucker, the Jamestown, two guns, Lieutenant Commanding John N. Barney, the Beaufort, one gun, Lieutenant Commanding W. H. Parker, the Raleigh, one gun, Lieutenant Commanding J. W. Alexander, the Teaser, one gun, Lieutenant Commanding W. A. Webb. The enemy's fleet in Hampton Roads consisted of the Cumberland, 24 guns, Congress, 50 guns, St. Lawrence, 50 guns, steam frigates Minnesota and Roanoke. 40 guns each. The relative force was as 21 guns to 204, not counting the small steamers of the enemy, though they had heavier armament than the small vessels of our fleet, which have been enumerated. The Cumberland and the Congress lay off Newport News. The other vessels were anchored about nine miles eastward, near to Fortress Monroe. Strong shore batteries and several small steamers, armed with heavy rifled guns, protected the frigates Cumberland and Congress. Buchanan no doubt felt the inspiration of a sailor when his vessel bears him from the land, and the excitement of a hero at the prospect of battle, and thus we may understand why the trial trip was at once converted into a determined attack upon the enemy. After the plan of the Virginia had been decided upon, the work of her construction was pushed with all possible haste. Her armament was on board, and she was taken out of the dock while the workmen were still employed upon her. Indeed, the last of them were put ashore after she was started on her first experimental trip. Few men, conscious as Flag Officer Buchanan was of the defects of his vessel, would have dared such unequal conflict. Slowly, about five knots an hour, he steamed down to the roads. The Cumberland and Congress, seeing the Virginia approach, prepared for action, and, from the flagship Roanoke, Signals were given to the Minnesota and St. Lawrence to advance. The Cumberland had swung so as to give her full broadside to the Virginia, which, silently and without any exhibition of her crew, moved steadily forward. The shot from the Cumberland fell thick upon her plated roof, but rebounded harmless as hailstones. 
at last the prow of the virginia struck the cumberland just forward of her starboard forechains a dull heavy thud was heard but so little force was given to the virginia that the engineer hesitated about backing her it was soon seen however that a gaping breach had been made in the cumberland and that the sea was rushing madly in she reeled and while the waves engulfed her her crew gallantly stood to their guns and vainly continued their fire she went down in nine fathoms of water and with at least one hundred of her gallant crew her pennant still flying from her masthead the virginia then ran up stream a short distance in order to turn and have sufficient space to get headway and come down on the congress the enemy supposing that she had retired at the sight of the vessels approaching to attack her cheered loudly both ashore and afloat but when she turned to descend upon the congress as she had on the cumberland the congress slipped her cables and ran ashore bows on the virginia took position as near as the depth of water would permit and opened upon her a raking fire the minnesota was fast aground about one mile and a half below the roanoke and st lawrence retired toward the fort the shore batteries kept up their fire on the virginia as did also the minnesota at long range and quite ineffectually the congress being aground could but feebly reply several of our small vessels came up and joined the virginia and the combined fire was fearfully destructive to the congress her commander was killed and soon her colors were struck and the white flag appeared both at the main and spanker gaff the beaufort lieutenant commanding w h parker and the raleigh lieutenant commanding j w alexander tugs which had accompanied the virginia were ordered to the congress to receive the surrender the flag of the ship and the sword of its then commander were delivered to lieutenant parker by whom they were subsequently sent to the navy department at richmond other officers delivered their swords in token of surrender and entreated that they might return to assist in getting their wounded out of the ship the permission was granted to the officers and they then took advantage of the clemency shown them to make their escape in the meantime the shore batteries fired upon the tugs and compelled them to retire by this fire five of their own men our prisoners were wounded flag officer buchanan had stopped the firing upon the congress when she struck her flag and ran up the white flag as heretofore described lieutenant jones in his official report referring to the congress writes quote, but she fired upon us with the white flag flying wounding lieutenant minor and several of our men we again open fire upon her and she is now in flames end quote. the crew of the congress escaped as did that of the cumberland by boats or by swimming and generously our men abstained from firing on them while so exposed flag officer buchanan was wounded by a rifle ball and had to be carried below his intrepid conduct won the admiration of all the executive and ordnance officer lieutenant catesby appar jones succeeded to the command it was now so near night and the change of the tide that nothing further could be attempted on that day the virginia with the smaller vessels attending her withdrew and anchored off sewell's point she had sunk the cumberland left the congress on fire had blown up a transport steamer sunk one schooner and had captured another casualties reported by lieutenant jones were two killed and eight wounded the prow of the virginia was somewhat damaged her anchor and all her flagstaffs were shot away and her smokestack and steam pipe were riddled otherwise the vessel was uninjured and as will be seen was ready for action on the next morning the prisoners and wounded were immediately sent up to the hospital at norfolk during the night the monitor an ironclad turret steamer of an entirely new model came in and anchored near the minnesota like our virginia she was an invention and her merits and demerits were to be tested in the crucible of war she was of light draught and very little save the revolving turret was visible above the water was readily handled and had good speed but also like the virginia was not supposed by nautical men to be capable of braving rough weather at sea the virginia was the hull of a frigate modified into an ironclad vessel she was only suited to smooth water and it had not been practicable to obtain for her such engines as would have given her the requisite speed her draught twenty-two feet was too great for the shoal water in the roads and the apprehension which was excited lest she should go up to washington might have been allayed by a knowledge of the deep water necessary to float her 
her great length depth and want of power caused difficulty in handling to be anticipated in many respects she was an experiment and had we possessed the means to build a new vessel no doubt a better model could have been devised commander brooke who united much science to great ingenuity was not entirely free in the exercise of either our means restricted us to making the best of that which chance had given us in the morning the virginia with the patrick henry the jamestown and the three little tugs jestingly called the mosquito fleet returned to the scene of the previous day's combat and to the completion of the work the destruction of the minnesota which had the evening before been interrupted by the change of tide and the coming of night the monitor which had come in during the previous night and had been seen by the light of the burning congress opened fire on the virginia when about the third of a mile distant the virginia sought to close with her but the greater speed of the monitor and the celerity with which she was handled made this impracticable the ships passed and repassed very near each other and frequently the virginia delivered her broadside at close quarters but with no perceptible effect the monitor fired rapidly from her revolving turret but not with such aim as to strike successively in the same place and the armor of the virginia therefore remained unbroken lieutenant commanding catesby jones to whom buchanan had entrusted the ship when he was removed to the hospital soon discovered that the monitor was invulnerable to his shells he had a few solid shot which were intended only to be fired from the nine-inch guns as hot shot and therefore had necessarily so much windage that they would be ineffective against the shield of the monitor he therefore determined to run her down and got all the headway he could obtain for that purpose but the speed was so small that it merely pushed her out of her way it was then decided to board her and all hands were piped for that object then the monitor slipped away onto shoal water where the virginia could not approach her and commander jones after waiting a due time and giving the usual signals of invitation to combat without receiving any manifestation on the part of the monitor of an intention to return to deep water withdrew to the navy yard in the two days of conflict our only casualties were from the cumberland as she went down valiantly fighting to the last from the men on shore when the tugs went to the congress to receive her surrender or from the perfidious fire from the congress while her white flags were flying none were killed or wounded in the fight with the monitor as this was the first combat between two ironclad vessels it attracted great attention and provoked much speculation some assumed that wooden ships were henceforth to be of no use and much has been done by the addition of armor to protect sea-going vessels but certainly neither of the two which provoked the speculation could be regarded as seaworthy or suited to other than harbor defense a new prow was put on the virginia she was furnished with bolts and solid shot and the slight repairs needed were promptly made the distinguished veteran commodore josiah tattnall was assigned to the command of the virginia vice admiral buchanan temporarily disabled the virginia as far as possible was prepared for battle and cruise in the roads and on the eleventh of april commodore tattnall moved down to invite the monitor to combat but her officers kept the monitor close to the shore with her steam up and under the guns of fortress monroe to provoke her to come out the little jamestown was sent in and pluckily captured many prizes but the monitor lay safe in the shoal water under the guns of the formidable fortress an english man-of-war which was lying in the channel witnessed this effort to draw the monitor out into deep water in defense of her weaker countrymen and as barney on the jamestown passed with his prizes cut out in full view of the enemy's fleet the englishmen with their national admiration of genuine game as a spectator described it quote, unable to restrain their generous impulses from the captain to the side boy cheered our gunboat to the very echo end quote. i quote further from the same witness quote, early in may a magnificent federal fleet the virginia being concealed behind the land had ventured across the channel and some of them expressly fitted to destroy our ship were furiously bombarding our batteries at sewell's point dashing down comes old tattnall on the instant as light-stepping and blithe as a boy but the virginia no sooner draws into range than the whole fleet like a flushed covey of birds flatters off into shoal water and under the guns of the forts quote, where they remained after some delay and there being no prospect of active service 
the Commodore ordered the executive officer to fire a gun to windward and take the ship back to her buoy. Here, ready for service, waiting for an enemy to engage her, but never having the opportunity, she remained until the tenth of the ensuing month. The Norfolk Navy Yard, notwithstanding the injury done to it by conflagration, was yet the most available and equipped yard in the Confederacy. A land force under General Huger had been placed there for its protection, and defensive works had also been constructed with a view to hold it as well for naval construction and repair as for its strategic importance in connection with the defense of the capital, Richmond. On the opposite side of the Lower James, on the peninsula between the James and York Rivers, we occupied an entrenched position of much natural strength. The two positions, Norfolk and the peninsula, were necessary to each other, and the command of the channel between them essential to both. As long as the Virginia closed the entrance to the James River and the entrenchment on the peninsula was held, it was deemed possible to keep possession of Norfolk. On the 1st of May, General Johnston, commanding on the peninsula, having decided to retreat, sent an order to General Huger to evacuate Norfolk. The Secretary of War, General Randolph, having arrived just at that time in Norfolk, assumed the authority of postponing the execution of the order, quote, until he, General Huger, could remove such stores, munitions, and arms as could be carried off, end quote. The Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Mallory, was there also, and gave like instructions to the Commandant of the Yard. To the system and energy with which General Huger conducted the removal of heavy guns, machinery, stores, and munitions, we were greatly indebted in our future operations, both of construction and defense. A week was thus employed in the removal of machinery, etc., and the enemy, occupied with the retreating army on the peninsula, did not cross the James River above either to interrupt the transportation or to obstruct the retreat of the garrisons of the forts at Norfolk and its surroundings. When our army had been withdrawn from the peninsula, and Norfolk had been evacuated, and the James River did not furnish depth of channel, which would suffice for the Virginia to ascend it more than a few miles, her mission was ended. It is not surprising that her brilliant career created a great desire to preserve her, and that it was contemplated to lighten her and thus try to take her up the river but the pilots declared this to be impracticable, and the court which subsequently investigated the matter sustained their opinion that, quote, the only alternative was then and there to abandon and burn the ship, end quote. The statement of Commodore Tatnall shows that the Virginia could not have been taken seaward, and that such was the opinion of her first commander. He said, quote, I consulted Commodore Buchanan on the character and power of the ship, he expressed the distinct opinion that she was unseaworthy, that she was not sufficiently buoyant, and that in a common sea she would founder, end quote. She could not, it therefore appears, ascend the river, was unseaworthy, and was uncovered by the retreat of the troops with whom she had cooperated. So on the 10th of May, the Virginia was taken to Craney Island, one mile above, and there her crew were landed. They fell in and formed on the beach, and in the language of the eyewitness heretofore quoted, quote, then and there, on the very field of her fame, within sight of the Cumberland's top gallant masts all awash, within sight of that magnificent fleet still cowering on the shoal, with her laurels all fresh and green, we hauled down her drooping colors, and, with mingled pride and grief, we gave her to the flames, end quote. At Wilmington, North Carolina, the southwest bar was defended by Fort Caswell, and New Inlet Bar by Fort Fisher. The naval defenses consisted of two ironclads, the North Carolina and the Raleigh. The former could not cross any of the bars in consequence of her draft of water. Her steam power hardly gave propulsion. She sank during the war off Smithville. The Raleigh's services were almost valueless in consequence of her deep draft and her feeble steam power. She made one futile trip out of New Inlet, and after a few hours attempted to return, but was wrecked upon the bar. The brave and invincible defense of Fort Sumter gave to the city of Charleston, South Carolina, additional luster. For four years that fort, located in its harbor, defied the Army and Navy of the United States. When the city was about to be abandoned to the Army of General Sherman, the forts defending the harbor were embraced in General Hardy's plan of evacuation. The gallant commander of Fort Sumter, Colonel Stephen Elliott, Jr., with unyielding fortitude, refused to be relieved, 
after being under incessant bombardment day and night for weeks. It was supposed he must be exhausted, and he was invited to withdraw for rest. But on receiving the general order of retreat, he assembled his brave force on the rugged and shell-crushed parade ground, read his instructions, and, in a voice that trembled with emotion, addressed his men in the glowing language of patriotism and unswerving devotion to the Confederate cause. The cheers which responded to the utterances of their colonel came from manly and chivalric throats. Yielding to the inevitable, they claimed for the stars and bars a salute of one hundred guns. As it was fired from Sumter, it was re-echoed by all the Confederate batteries, and startled the outside blockaders with the idea that a great victory had been won by the Confederacy. The naval force of the Confederacy in Charleston Harbor consisted of three ironclads. Their steam power was totally inadequate for the effective use of the vessels. In fact, when the wind and tide were moving in the same direction, it was impossible for the vessels to advance against them, light though the wind might be. Under such circumstances, it was necessary to come to an anchor. On one occasion, the ironclads Palmetto State and Chicora ran out of Charleston Harbor under favorable circumstances. The Palmetto State assaulted the Mercedetta, commanded by Captain Stellwagen, who unconditionally surrendered. But the ironclad, being under orders to follow her consort in chase of the enemy, and having no boats to which to transfer her prisoners, the parole of the officers and men was accepted, with their promise to observe the same until its return. The surrender was accepted, and an honest parole was a consideration for not being sunk on the spot. Captain Stellwagen abided but a short time, when, getting up steam, he broke his plighted word and ran off with the captured vessel. The deficiency of speed on the part of the Confederate ironclads frustrated their efforts to relieve the city of Charleston from continued blockade. The harbor defenses of Savannah were entrusted to Commodore Tatnall, who defended the approach to the city with a small steamer of one gun, an inefficient floating battery and ironclad, which had been constructed from a blockade runner. Several attempts were made to attack the enemy's vessels with the ironclad, but these were frustrated by the delay in opening a passage through the obstructions in the river, when tide and opportunity were offered. Her draft was too great for the depth of water, except at high tides, and these were at long intervals. The ironclad was armed with a battery of four guns, two seven-inch and two six-inch. Her force consisted of some twenty-one officers and twenty-four men, when she was fully furnished. Another vessel was under construction and nearly completed, and Commodore Tatnall, notwithstanding his well-known combative instincts, was understood to be unwilling to send the Atlanta alone against the enemy's blockading vessels. Lieutenant Webb, who had been lately placed in command of the Atlanta, took her to Warsaw Sound to deliver battle singly to the two ironclads, Weehawken and the Hant, which awaited her approach. The Atlanta got twice aground, the second time inextricably so. In this situation she was attacked, and though hopelessly, was bravely defended, but was finally forced to surrender. Mobile Harbor was thought to be adequately provided for, as torpedoes obstructed the approach, and Forts Morgan and Gaines commanded the entrance, aided by the improvised fleet of Admiral Buchanan, which consisted of the wooden gunboats Morgan and Gaines, each carrying six guns, and Selma four guns, with the ram Tennessee of six guns. In all, 22 guns and 470 men. On August 4, 1864, Fort Gaines was assaulted by the United States force from the seaside of the beach. The resistance made was feeble, and the fort soon surrendered. On the next day, Admiral Farragut stood into the bay with a force consisting of four monitors, or ironclads, and 14 steamers, carrying 199 guns and 2,700 men. One ironclad was sunk by a torpedo. Admiral Buchanan advanced to meet this force, and sought to run into the larger vessels with the Tennessee, but they avoided him by their superior speed. Meanwhile, the gunboats became closely engaged with the enemy, but were soon dispersed by his overwhelming force. The Tennessee again stood for the enemy and renewed the attack with the hope of sinking some of them with her prow, but she was again foiled by their superior speed in avoiding her. The engagement with the whole fleet soon became general and lasted an hour. Frequently the Tennessee was surrounded by the enemy, and all her guns were in action almost at the same moment. Four of their heaviest vessels ran into her under full steam 
with the view of sinking her. While surrounded by six of these heavy vessels, which were suffering fearfully from her heavy battery, the steering gear of the Tennessee was shot away, and her ability to maneuver was completely destroyed, leaving the formidable Confederate entirely at the disposal of the enemy. This misfortune, it was believed, saved the greater part of Farragut's fleet. Further resistance becoming unavailable, the wounded admiral was under the painful necessity of ordering a surrender. His little fleet became a prey to the enemy, except the Morgan, which made good her escape to Mobile. This unequal contest was decidedly creditable to the Confederacy. The entire loss of the enemy, most of which is ascribed to the Tennessee, amounted to quite three hundred in killed and wounded, exclusive of one hundred lost on the sunken ironclad, making a number almost as large as the entire Confederate force. On August 22nd, Fort Morgan was bombarded from the land, also by ironclads at sea, and by the fleet inside. Thus Forts Powell, Morgan, and Gaines shared the fate of the Confederate fleet, and the enemy became masters of the bay. On this, as on other occasions, the want of engines of sufficient power constituted a main obstacle to the success which the gallantry and skill of the seamen so richly deserved. The system of torpedoes adopted by us was probably more effective than any other means of naval defense. The destructiveness of these little weapons had long been known, but no successful modes for their application to the destruction of the most powerful vessels of war and ironclads had been devised. It remained for the skill and ingenuity of our officers to bring the use of this terrible instrument to perfection. The success of their efforts is very frankly stated by one of the most distinguished of the enemy's commanders, Admiral Porter. He says, quote, Most of the southern seaports fell into our possession with comparative facility, and the difficulty of capturing Charleston, Savannah, Wilmington, and Mobile was in a measure owing to the fact that the approaches to these places were filled with various kinds of torpedoes, laid in groups, and fired by electricity. The introduction of this means of defense on the side of the Confederates was for a time a severe check to our naval forces, for the commanders of squadrons felt it their duty to be careful when dealing with an element of warfare of which they knew so little, and the character and disposition of which it was so difficult to discover. In this system of defense, therefore, the enemy found their greatest security, and, notwithstanding all the efforts of Dupont and Dahlgren, Charleston, Wilmington, and Savannah remained closed to our forces until near the close of the war." End quote. In 1862, while General McClellan was in command of the enemy's forces below Richmond, it was observed that they had more than a hundred vessels in the James River, as if they were about to make an advance by that way upon the city. This led to an order placing General G. J. Raines in charge of the submarine defenses, and on the James River opposite Drury's Bluff, the first submarine torpedo was made. The secret of all his future success consisted in the sensitive primer, which is unrivaled by any other means to explode torpedoes or subterra shells. The torpedoes were made of the most ordinary material generally, as beer barrels fixed with conical heads, coated within and without with rosin dissolved in coal tar. Some were made of cast iron, copper, or tin, and glass demijohns were used. There were three essentials to success, viz. the sensitive fuse primer, a charge of sixty pounds of gunpowder, and actual contact between the torpedo and the bottom of the vessel. There were one hundred and twenty-three of these torpedoes placed in Charleston Harbor and Stono River. It was blockaded by thirteen large ships and ironclads, with six or seven storeships and some twenty other vessels. The position of each one was known, and they could be approached within a half mile, which made it easy to attack, destroy, or disperse them at night by floating torpedoes, connected together by twos by a rope one hundred and thirty yards long, buoyed up and stretched across the current by two boats, which were to be dropped in ebbing tide to float down among the vessels. This plan, says General Raines, was opposed by General Gilmer of the Engineer Corps, on the ground that, quote, they might float back and destroy our own boat, end quote. One was sent down to go in the midst of the fleet and made its mark. An act of devoted daring was here performed by Commander W. T. Glassell, Confederate States Navy, which claims more than a passing notice. While the enemy was slowly contracting his lines around Charleston, 
his numerous ships of war kept watch and ward outside of the harbor our few vessels almost helpless by their defective engines could effect little against their powerful opponents the new ironsides the pride of their fleet lay off morris's island this glassell resolved to attack with a steam launch carrying a torpedo spar at the bow with an engineer pilot and fireman he steered for the ironsides under cover of a hazy night as he approached he was hailed by the lookout and the next moment struck the ironsides exploding the torpedo about fifteen feet from the keel an immense volume of water was thrown up covering the little boat and pieces of timber falling in the engine it was rendered entirely unmanageable so as to deprive commander glassell of the means of escape on which he had relied a rapid fire was concentrated upon him from the deck of the ship and there remained no chance except to attempt an escape by swimming ashore to secure liberty to his country he risked and lost his own and found for the indignity to which he was subjected compensation inasmuch as the famous new ironsides was long rendered useless to the enemy one hundred and one torpedoes were planted in roanoke river north carolina after a flotilla of twelve vessels had started up to capture fort branch the torpedoes destroyed six of the vessels and frustrated the attack every avenue to the outworks or to the city of mobile was guarded by submarine torpedoes so that it was impossible for any vessel drawing three feet of water to get within effective cannon range of the defences two ironclads attempted to get near enough to spanish fort to take part in the bombardment they both struck torpedoes and went to the bottom on apalachi bar thenceforward the fleet made no further attempt to encounter the almost certain destruction which they saw awaited any vessel which might attempt to enter the torpedo guarded waters but many were sunk when least expecting it some went down long after the confederate forces had evacuated mobile the tecumseh was probably sunk says major general d h maury on her own torpedo while steaming in lead of farragut's fleet she carried a torpedo affixed to a spar which projected some twenty feet from her bows she proposed to use this torpedo against the tennessee our only formidable ship but while passing fort morgan a shot from that fort cut away the stays by which the torpedo was secured it then doubled under her and exploding fairly under the bottom of the ill-fated ship she careened and sank instantly in ten fathoms of water only six or eight of her crew of a hundred or more were saved the total number of vessels sunk by torpedoes in mobile bay was twelve viz three ironclads two tinclads and seven transports Fifty-eight vessels were destroyed in southern waters by torpedoes during the war. These included ironclads and others of no mean celebrity. End of section 13。section 14 of the rise and fall of the Confederate government, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 28. Naval Affairs Continued. Importance of New Orleans. Attack feared from up the river. Preparations for defense. Strength of the forts other defenses the general plan ironclads raft fleet of the enemy bombardment of the forts commenced advance of the fleet its passage of the forts batteries below the city darkness of the night evacuation of the city by general lovell on appearance of the enemy address of general duncan to soldiers in the forts refusal to surrender meeting of the garrison of fort jackson the forts surrendered ironclad louisiana destroyed the tugs and steamers the governor moore the enemy ship varina sunk the mccray the state of the city and its defenses considered public indignation its victims efforts made for its defense by the navy department the construction of the mississippi 
New Orleans was the most important commercial port in the Confederacy, being the natural outlet of the Mississippi Valley, as well to the ports of Europe as to those of Central and Southern America. It was the depot which, at an early period, had led to controversies with Spain, and its importance to the interior had been a main inducement to the purchase of Louisiana. It had become before 1861 the chief cotton mart of the United States, and its defense attracted the early attention of the Confederate government. The approaches for an attacking party were numerous. They could, through several channels, enter Lake Pontchartrain to approach the city in rear for land attack, could ascend the Mississippi from the Gulf, or descend it from the northwest, where it was known that the enemy was preparing a formidable fleet of ironclad gunboats. In the early part of 1862, so general an opinion prevailed that the greatest danger to New Orleans was by an attack from above that General Lovell sent to General Beauregard a large part of the troops then in the city. At the mouth of the Mississippi there is a bar, the greatest depth of water on which seldom exceeded eighteen feet, and it was supposed that heavy vessels of war, with their armament and supplies, would not be able to cross it. Such proved to be the fact, and the vessels of that class had to be lightened to enable them to enter the river. In that condition of affairs, an inferior fleet might have engaged them with a prospect of success. Captain Hollins, who was in command of the squadron at New Orleans, and who had on a former occasion shown his fitness for such service, had been sent with the greater part of his fleet up the river to join the defense there being made. Two powerful vessels were under construction, the Louisiana and the Mississippi, but neither of them was finished. A volunteer fleet of transport vessels had been fitted up by some rivermen, but it was in the unfortunate condition of not being placed under the orders of the naval commander. A number of fire rafts had also been provided, which were to serve the double purpose of lighting up the river in the event of the hostile fleet attempting to pass the forts under cover of the night, and of setting fire to any vessel with which they might become entangled. After passing the bar, there was nothing to prevent the ascent of the river until Forts Jackson and St. Philip were reached. These works, constructed many years before, were on opposite banks of the river. Their armament, as reported by General Lovell, December 5, 1861, consisted of Fort Jackson, six 42-pounders, 26 24-pounders, two 32-pounder rifles, 16 32-pounders, three 8-inch columbiads, one 10-inch columbiad, two 8-inch mortars, one 10-inch mortar, two 40-pounder howitzers, and ten 24-pounder howitzers. Fort St. Philip, six 42-pounders, nine 32-pounders, 22 24-pounders, four 8-inch columbiads, one 8-inch mortar, one 10-inch mortar, and three field guns. General Duncan reported that, on the 27th of March, he was informed by Lieutenant Colonel Higgins, commanding Forts Jackson and St. Philip, of the coast defenses, which were under his, General Duncan's command, that the enemy's fleet was crossing the bars and entering the Mississippi River in force, whereupon he repaired to Fort Jackson. After describing the condition of the forts from the excess of water and sinking of the entire site, as well as the deficiency of guns of heavy caliber in the forts, he proceeds, quote, It became necessary in their present condition to bring in and mount and to build the platforms for the three 10-inch and three 8-inch columbiads, the rifled 42-pounder, and the five 10-inch seacoast mortars recently obtained from Pensacola on the evacuation of that place together with the two rifled seven-inch guns temporarily borrowed from the naval authorities in New Orleans. It was also found necessary to repair the old water battery to the rear of and below Fort Jackson, which had never been completed for the reception of a portion of these guns, as well as to construct mortar-proof magazines and shell rooms within the same." End quote. One of the seven-inch rifled guns borrowed from the Navy was subsequently returned, so that, when the forts were attacked, the armament was 128 guns and mortars. The garrisons of Forts Jackson and St. Philip were about 1,000 men on December 5, 1861. Afterward, so far as I know, the number was not materially changed. The prevailing belief that vessels of war in a straight, smooth channel could pass batteries led to the construction of a raft between the two forts, which, it was supposed, would detain the ships under fire of the forts long enough for the guns to sink them. 
or at least to compel them to retire. The power of the river, when in flood, and the driftwood it bore upon it, broke the raft. Another was constructed, which, when the driftwood accumulated upon it, met a like fate. Whether obstructions differently arranged, such as booms secured to the shores, with apparatus by which they could be swung across the channel when needful, or logs such as were used, except that being unconnected together, but each separately secured by chain and anchor, they might severally yield to the pressure of the driftwood, sinking so as to allow it to pass over them, and, when relieved of the weight, rising again, or whether other expedient could have been made permanent and efficient, is a problem which need not be discussed, as the time for its application has passed from us. The general plan for the defense of New Orleans consisted of two lines of works, an exterior one passing through the forts near the mouth of the river, and the positions taken to defend the various water approaches. Nearer to the city was the interior line, embracing New Orleans and Algiers, which was intended principally to repel an attack by land, but also by its batteries on the river bank to resist approach by water. The total length of the entrenchments on this interior line was more than eight miles. When completed, it formed, in connection with impassable swamps, a very strong line of defense. At the then high stage of the river, all the land between it and the swamps was so saturated with water that regular approaches could not have been made. The city, therefore, was at the time supposed to be doubly secure from a land attack. In the winter of 1861-62, I sent one of my aide-de-camp to New Orleans to make a general inspection, and hold free conference with the commanding general. Upon his return, he reported to me that General Lovell was quite satisfied with the condition of the land defenses, so much so as to say that his only fear was that the enemy would not make a land attack. Considered since the event, it may seem strange that, after the fall of Donelson and Henry, and the employment of the enemy's gunboats in the Tennessee and Cumberland, it was still generally argued that the danger to New Orleans was that the gunboats would descend the Mississippi, and applications were made to have the ship Louisiana sent up the river as soon as she was completed. The interior lines of defense mounted more than 60 guns of various caliber, and were surrounded by wide and deep ditches. On the various water approaches, including bays and bayous on the west and east sides of the river, there were 16 different forts and these, together with those on the river and the batteries of the interior line, had in position about 300 guns. One ironclad, the Louisiana, mounting 16 guns of heavy caliber, though she was not quite completed, was sent down to cooperate with the forts. Her defective steam power and imperfect steering apparatus prevented her from rendering active cooperation. The steamship Mississippi, then under construction at New Orleans, was in such an unfinished condition as to be wholly unavailable when the enemy arrived. In the opinion of naval officers, she would have been, if completed, the most powerful ironclad then in the world, and could have driven the enemy's fleet out of the river and raised the blockade at Mobile. There were also several small river steamers which were lightly armed, and their bows were protected so that they could act as rams and otherwise aid in the defense of the river. But from the reports received, they seem, with a few honorable exceptions, to have rendered little valuable service. The means of defense, therefore, mainly relied on, were the two heavy-armed forts, Jackson and St. Philip, with the obstruction placed between them. This was a raft consisting of cypress trees, forty feet long, and averaging four or five feet at the larger end. They were placed longitudinally in the river, about three feet apart, and held together by gunnels on top, and strung upon two two-and-a-half-inch chain cables fastened to their lower sides. This raft was anchored in the river abreast of the forts. The fleet of the enemy below the forts consisted of seven steam sloops of war, twelve gunboats, and several armed steamers, under Commodore Farragut. Also, a mortar fleet consisting of twenty sloops and some steam vessels. The whole force was forty-odd vessels of different kinds, with an armament of three hundred guns of heavy caliber of improved models. The bombardment of the forts by the mortar fleet commenced on April 18th, and, after six days of vigorous and constant shelling, the resisting power of the forts was not diminished in any perceptible degree. On the 23rd, there were manifest preparations by the enemy to attempt the passage of the forts. This, 
as subsequently developed, was to be done in the following manner. The sloops of war and the gunboats were each formed in two divisions, and, selecting the darkest hour of the night, between 3 and 4 a.m. of the 24th, moved up the river in two columns. The commanders of the forts had vainly endeavored to have the river lighted up in anticipation of an attack by the fleet. In the meantime, while the fleet moved up the river, there was kept up from the mortars a steady bombardment on the forts, and these opened a fire on the columns of ships and gunboats, which, from the failure to send down the fire rafts to light up the river, was less effective than it otherwise would have been. The straight, deep channel enabled the vessels to move at their greatest speed, and thus the forts were passed. Brigadier General J. K. Duncan, commanding the coast defenses, says in his report of the passing of Forts Jackson and St. Philip by the enemy's fleet, quote, The enemy evidently anticipated a strong demonstration to be made against him with fire barges. Finding upon his approach, however, that no such demonstration was made, and that the only resistance offered to his passage was the anticipated fire of the forts, the broken and scattered raft being no obstacle, I am satisfied that he was suddenly inspired, for the first time, to run the gauntlet at all hazards, although not a part of his original design. Be that as it may, a rapid rush was made by him in columns of twos in echelon, so as not to interfere with each other's broadsides. The mortar fire was furiously increased upon Fort Jackson, and in dashing by, each of the vessels delivered broadside after broadside of shot, shell, grape, canister, and spherical case, to drive the men from our guns. Both the officers and men stood up manfully under this galling and fearful hail, and the batteries of both forts were promptly opened at their longest range, with shot, shell, hot shot, and a little grape, and most gallantly and rapidly fought until the enemy succeeded in getting above and beyond our range. The absence of light on the river, together with the smoke of the guns, made the obscurity so dense that scarcely a vessel was visible, and, in consequence, the gunners were obliged to govern their firing entirely by the flashes of the enemy's guns. I am fully satisfied that the enemy's dash was successful mainly owing to the cover of darkness, as a frigate and several gunboats were forced to retire as day was breaking. Similar results had attended every previous attempt made by the enemy to pass or to reconnoitre when we had sufficient light to fire with accuracy and effect. End quote. The vessels which passed the fort anchored at the quarantine station about six miles above, and in the forenoon proceeded up the river. Batteries had been constructed where the interior line of defense touched both the right and the left bank of the river. The high stage of the river gave to its surface an elevation above that of the natural bank, but a continuous levee to protect the land from inundation existed on both sides of the river. When the ascending fleet approached these batteries, a crossfire, which drove two of the vessels back, was opened upon it, and continued until all the ammunition was exhausted. The garrison was then withdrawn, casualties, one killed and one wounded. The regret, which would naturally arise from the fact of these batteries not having a sufficient supply of ammunition, is modified, if not removed, by the statement of the highly accomplished and gallant officer, Major General M. L. Smith, who was then in command of them. He reported, quote, had the fall of New Orleans depended upon the enemy's first taking Forts Jackson and Philip, I think the city would have been safe from an attack from the Gulf. The forts, in my judgment, were impregnable, as long as they were in free and open communication with the city. This communication was not endangered, while the obstruction existed. The conclusion, then, is briefly this. While the obstruction existed, the city was safe. When it was swept away, as the defenses then existed, it was within the enemy's power. End quote. On the other hand, General Duncan, whose protracted, skillful, and gallant defense of the forts is above all praise, closes his official report with the following sentence quote, Except for the cover afforded by the obscurity of the darkness, I shall always remain satisfied that the enemy would never have succeeded in passing Forts Jackson and St. Philip. End quote. The darkness to which he referred was not only that of night but also the absence of the use of the means prepared to light up the river. As further proof of the intensity of the darkness, and the absence of that intelligent design and execution which had been claimed, I will quote a sentence from the report of Commodore Farragut. Quote, 
at length the fire slackened the smoke cleared off and we saw to our surprise that we were above the forts end quote. on the twenty fifth of april the enemy's gunboats and ships of war anchored in front of the city and demanded its surrender major general m lovell then in command refused to comply with the summons but believing himself unable to make a successful defense and in order to avoid a bombardment agreed to withdraw his forces and turn it over to the civil authorities accordingly the city was evacuated on the same day the fort still continued defiantly to hold their position by assiduous exertion the damage done to the works was repaired and the garrisons valiantly responded to the resolute determination of general duncan and colonel higgins to defend the forts against the fleet still below as well as against that which had passed and was now above on the twenty sixth commodore porter commanding the mortar fleet below sent a flag of truce boat to demand the surrender of the forts saying that the city of new orleans had surrendered to this colonel higgins replied april twenty seventh that he had no official information that new orleans had been evacuated and until such notice was received he would not entertain for a moment a proposition to surrender the forts on the same day general duncan commanding the coast defenses issued the following address quote, soldiers of forts jackson and st philip you have nobly gallantly and heroically sustained with courage and fortitude the terrible ordeals of fire water and the hail of shot and shell wholly unsurpassed during the present war but more remains to be done the safety of new orleans and the cause of the southern confederacy our homes families and everything dear to man yet depend upon our exertions we are just as capable of repelling the enemy today as we were before the bombardment twice has the enemy demanded your surrender and twice has he been refused your officers have every confidence in your courage and patriotism and feel every assurance that you will cheerfully and with alacrity obey all orders and do your whole duty as men and as becomes the well-tried garrisons of forts jackson and st philip be vigilant therefore stand by your guns and all will yet be well j k duncan brigadier general commanding coast defenses not less lofty and devoted was the spirit evinced by colonel higgins his naval experience had been energetically applied in the attempts to preserve and repair the raft as immediate commander of fort st philip he had done all which skill and gallantry could achieve and though for forty-eight hours during the bombardment he never left the rampart yet with commendable care for his men he kept them so under cover that notwithstanding the long and furious assault to which the fort was subjected the total of casualties in it was two killed and four wounded their conduct was such as was to be anticipated for had these officers been actuated by a lower motive than patriotism had they been seeking the rewards which power confers they would not have taken service with the weaker party their meed was the consciousness of duty well done in a righteous cause and the enduring admiration and esteem of a people who had only these to confer during the twenty fifth twenty sixth and twenty seventh there had been an abatement of fire on the forts and with it had subsided the excitement which imminent danger creates in the brave a rumor became current that the city had surrendered and no reply had been received to inquiries sent on the twenty fourth and twenty fifth about midnight on the twenty seventh the garrison of fort jackson revolted en masse seized upon the guard and commenced to spike the guns captain s o comey's company the louisiana cannoneers of st mary's parish and a few others remained true to their cause and country the mutiny was so general that the officers were powerless to control it and therefore decided to let those go who wished to leave and after daybreak to communicate with the fleet below and negotiate for the terms which had been previously offered and declined under the incessant fire to which the forts had been exposed and the rise of the water in the casemates and lower part of the works the men had been not only deprived of sleep but of the opportunity to prepare their food heroically they had braved alike dangers and discomfort had labored constantly to repair damages to extinguish fires caused by exploding shells to preserve their ammunition by bailing out the water which threatened to submerge the magazine yet in a period of comparative repose these men who had been cheerful and obedient as suddenly as unexpectedly broke out into open mutiny under the circumstances which surrounded him 
General Duncan had no alternative. It only remained for him to accept the proposition which had been made for a surrender of the forts. As this mutiny became known about midnight of the 27th, soon after daylight of the 28th, a small boat was procured, and notice of the event was sent to Captain Mitchell on the Louisiana and also to Fort St. Philip. The officers of that fort concurred in the propriety of the surrender, though none of their men had openly revolted. A flag of truce was sent to Commodore Porter to notify him of a willingness to negotiate for the surrender of the forts. The gallantry with which the defense had been conducted was recognized by the enemy, and the terms were as liberal as had been offered on former occasions. The garrisons were paroled, the officers were to retain their sidearms, and the Confederate flags were left flying over the forts until after our forces had withdrawn. If this was done as a generous recognition of the gallantry with which the forts had been defended, it claims acknowledgment as an instance of martial courtesy, the flower that blooms fairest amid the desolations of war. Captain Mitchell, commanding the Confederate States Naval Forces, had been notified by General Duncan of the mutiny in the forts and of the fact that the enemy had passed through a channel in rear of Fort St. Philip and had landed a force at the quarantine some six miles above, and that, under the circumstances, it was deemed necessary to surrender the forts. As the naval forces were not under the orders of the general commanding the coast defenses, it was optional with the naval commander to do likewise or not as to his fleet. After consultation with his officers, Captain Mitchell decided to destroy his flagship, the Louisiana, the only formidable vessel he had, rather than allow her to fall into the hands of the enemy. The crew was accordingly withdrawn, and the vessel set on fire. Commodore Porter, commanding the fleet below, came up under a flag of truce to Fort Jackson, and while negotiations were progressing for the surrender, the Louisiana, in flames, drifted down the river, and when close under Fort St. Philip, exploded and sank. The defenses afloat, except the Louisiana, consisted of tugs and river steamers, which had been converted to war purposes by protecting their bows with iron, so as to make them rams, and putting on them such armament as boats of that class would bear and these were again divided into such as were subject to control as naval vessels and others which in compliance with the wish of the governor of louisiana and many influential citizens were fitted out to a great extent by state and private sources with the condition that they should be commanded by river steamboat captains and should not be under the control of the naval commander this of course impaired the unity requisite in battle for many other purposes they might have been used without experiencing the inconvenience felt when they were brought together to act as one force against the enemy. The courts of inquiry and the investigation by a committee of Congress have brought out all the facts of the case, but with such conflicting opinions as render it very difficult, in reviewing the matter, to reach a definite and satisfactory conclusion. This much it may be proper to say, that expectations founded upon the supposition that these improvised means could do all which might fairly be expected from war vessels, were unreasonable, and a judgment based upon them is unjust to the parties involved. The machinery of the Louisiana was so incomplete as to deprive her of locomotion, but she had been so well constructed as to possess very satisfactory resisting powers, as was shown by the fact that the broadsides of the enemy's vessels, fired at very close quarters, had little or no effect upon her shield. Without power of locomotion, her usefulness was limited to employment as a floating battery. The question as to whether she was in the right position, or whether, in her unfinished condition, she should have been sent from the city, is one, for an answer to which, I must refer the inquirer to the testimony of naval men, who were certainly most competent to decide the issue. One of the little river boats, the Governor Moore, commanded by Lieutenant Beverly Cannon, like the others, imperfectly protected at the bow, struck and sunk the Varina, in close proximity to other vessels of the enemy's fleet. Such daring resulted in his losing, in killed and wounded, seventy-four out of a crew of ninety-three. Then finding that he must destroy his ship to prevent her from falling into the hands of the enemy, he set her on fire, and testified as follows, quote, I ordered the wounded to be placed in a boat, and all the men who could to save themselves by swimming to the shore and hiding themselves in the marshes. I remained to set the ship on fire. After doing so, I went on deck with the intention of leaving her, 
but found the wounded had been left with no one to take care of them. I remained and lowered them into a boat, and got through just in time to be made a prisoner. The wounded were afterward attended by the surgeons of the Oneida and Eureka, end quote. This, he says, was the only foundation for the accusation of having burned his wounded with his ship. Another, the Manassas, lieutenant commanding Worley, though merely an altered tugboat, stoutly fought the large ships, but, being wholly unprotected, except at her bow, was perforated in many places as soon as the guns were brought to bear upon her sides, and floated down the river a burning wreck. Another of the same class is thus referred to by Colonel Higgins. Quote, at daylight I observed the McRae gallantly fighting at terrible odds, contending at close quarters with two of the enemy's powerful ships. Her gallant commander, Lieutenant Thomas B. Ouget, fell during the conflict, severely, but I trust not mortally wounded. End quote. This little vessel, after her unequal conflict, was still afloat, and, with permission of the enemy, went up to New Orleans to convey the wounded, as well from our forts as from the fleet. On the 23rd of April, 1862, General Lovell, commanding the military department, had gone down to Fort Jackson, where General Duncan, commanding the coast defenses, then made his headquarters. The presence of the department commander did not avail to secure the full cooperation between the defenses afloat and the land defenses, which was then of most pressing and immediate necessity. When the enemy's fleet passed the forts, he hastened back to New Orleans, his headquarters. The confusion which prevailed in the city when the news arrived that the forts had been passed by the enemy's fleet shows how little it was expected. There was nothing to obstruct the ascent of the river between Forts Jackson and St. Philip, and the batteries on the river where the interior line of defense rested on its right and left banks, about four miles below the city. The guns were not sufficiently numerous in these batteries to inspire much confidence. They were, nevertheless, well served until the ammunition was exhausted after which the garrisons withdrew and made their way by different routes to join the forces withdrawn from New Orleans. Under the supposition entertained by the generals nearest to the operations, the greatest danger to New Orleans was from above, not from below the city. Therefore, most of the troops had been sent from the city to Tennessee, and Captain Hollins, with the greater part of the river fleet, had gone up to check the descent of the enemy's gunboats. Batteries like those immediately below the city had been constructed where the interior line touched the river above, and armed to resist an attack from that direction. Doubtful as to the direction from which, and the manner in which, an attempt might be made to capture the city, such preparations as circumstances suggested were made against many supposable dangers by the many possible routes of approach. To defend the city from the land, against a bombardment by a powerful fleet in the river before it, had not been contemplated. All the defensive preparations were properly, I think, directed to the prevention of a near approach by the enemy. To have subjected the city to bombardment by a direct or plunging fire, as the surface of the river was then higher than the land, would have been exceptionally destructive. Had the city been filled with soldiers whose families had been sent to a place of safety, instead of being filled with women and children, whose natural protectors were generally in the army and far away, the attempt might have been justified to line the levee with all the effective guns and open fire on the fleet, at the expense of whatever property might be destroyed before the enemy should be driven away. The case was the reverse of the hypothesis, and nothing could have been more unjust than to censure the commanding general for withdrawing a force large enough to induce a bombardment, but insufficient to repel it. His answer to the demand for the surrender showed clearly enough the motives by which he was influenced. His refusal enabled him to withdraw the troops and most of the public property, and to use them, with the ordnance and ordnance stores thus saved, in providing for the defense of Vicksburg, but especially it deprived the enemy of any pretext for bombarding the town and sacrificing the lives of the women and children. It appears that General Lovell called for 10,000 volunteers from the citizens, but failed to get them. There were many river steamboats at the landing, and if the volunteers called for were intended to man these boats and board the enemy's fleet before their land forces could arrive, it cannot be regarded as utterly impracticable. The report of General Butler shows that he worked his way through one of the bayous in rear of Fort St. Philip to the Mississippi River above the forts 
so as to put himself in communication with the fleet at the city, and to furnish Commodore Farragut with ammunition. From this it is to be inferred that the fleet was deficient in ammunition, and the fact would have rendered boarding from river boats the more likely to succeed. In this connection it may be remembered that, during the war, John Taylor Wood, Colonel and ADC to the President, who had been an officer of high repute in the old navy, did in open boats attack armed vessels, board and capture them, though found with nettings up, having been warned of the probability of such an attack. Footnote. Captain Wood had a number of light rowboats built, holding each about twenty men. They were fitted with cradles to wagons, and could be quickly moved to any point by road or rail. He writes, quote, In August 1863, I left Richmond with four boats and sixty men for the Rappahannock, to look after one or two gunboats that had been operating in that river. Finding always two cruising together, I determined to attempt the capture of both at once. About midnight, with muffled oars, we pulled for them at anchor near the mouth of the river. They discovered us two hundred yards off. We dashed alongside, cut our way through and over the border nettings with the old navy cutlass, gained the deck, and after a sharp, short fight, drove the enemy below. The prizes proved to be the gunboats Satellite and Reliance, two guns each. Landing the prisoners, we cruised for two days in the Chesapeake Bay. A number of vessels were captured and destroyed. End, quote. End of footnote. Many causes have been assigned for the fall of New Orleans. Two of them are of undeniable force. First, the failure to light up the channel. Second, the want of an obstruction which would detain the fleet under fire of the forts. General Duncan's report and testimony justify the conclusion that to the thick veil of darkness the enemy was indebted for his ability to run past the forts. The argument that the guns were not of sufficiently large caliber to stop the fleet is not convincing. If all the guns had been of the largest size, that would not have increased the accuracy, but would have diminished the rapidity of the fire, and therefore, in the same degree, would have lessened the chances of hitting objects in the dark. Further, it appears that the forts always crippled or repulsed any vessels which came up in daylight. The forts would have been better able to resist bombardment if they had been heavily plated with iron, but that would not have prevented the fleet from passing them as they did. Torpedoes might have been placed on the bar at the mouth of the river before the enemy got possession of it, and subsequently, if attached to buoys, they might have been used in the deep channel above. Many other things which were omitted might and probably would have been done had attention been earlier concentrated on the danger which at last proved fatal. If the volunteer river defense fleet was ineffective, as alleged, because it was not subject to the orders of the naval commander, that was an evil without a remedy. The governor of Louisiana had arranged with the projectors that they should not be subject to the naval commander, and the alternative of not accepting them with that condition was that they would not agree to convert their steamers into war vessels. Unless, therefore, it can be shown that they were worse than none, their presence cannot be properly enumerated among the causes of the failure. The fall of New Orleans was a great disaster, over which there was general lamentation, mingled with no little indignation. The excited feeling demanded a victim, and conflicting testimony of many witnesses most nearly concerned, made it convenient to select for censure those most removed and least active in their own justification. Thus the naval constructors of the Mississippi and the Secretary of the Navy became the special objects of attack. The selection of these had little of justice in it, and could not serve to relieve others of their responsibility, as did the old-time doom of the scapegoat. New Orleans had never been a shipbuilding port, and when Messrs. Tift, the agents to build the ironclad steamer Mississippi, arrived there, they had to prepare a shipyard, procure lumber from a distance, have the foundries and rolling mills adapted to such iron work as could be done in the city, and contract elsewhere for the balance. They were ingenious, well informed in matters of shipbuilding, and were held in high esteem in Georgia and Florida, where they had long resided. They submitted a proposition to the Secretary of the Navy to build a vessel on a new model. The proposition was accepted after full examination of the plan proposed, the novelty of which made it necessary that they should have full control of the work of construction. To the embarrassments above mentioned were added interruptions by calling off the workmen occasionally for exercise and instruction as militiamen, 
the city being threatened by the enemy. From these causes, unexpected delay in the completion of the ship resulted, regret for which increased as her most formidable character was realized. These constructors, the brothers Tift, hoped to gain much reputation by the ship which they designed, and from this motive agreed to give their full service and unremitted attention in its construction, without compensation or other allowance than their current expenses. It would, therefore, on the face of it, seem to have been a most absurd suspicion that they willingly delayed the completion of the vessel, and at last wantonly destroyed it. Mr. E. C. Murray, who was a contractor for building the Louisiana, in his testimony before a committee of the Confederate Congress, testified that he had been a practical shipbuilder for twenty years, and a contractor for the preceding eighteen years, having built about a hundred and twenty boats, steamers, and sailing vessels. There was only a fence between his shipyard and that where the Mississippi was constructed. Of this latter vessel, he said, quote, I think the vessel was built in less time than any vessel of her tonnage, character, and requiring the same amount of work and materials on this continent. That vessel required no less than two million feet of lumber, and, I suppose, about one thousand tons of iron, including the false works, blockways, etc. I do not think that amount of materials was ever put together on this continent, within the time occupied in her construction. I know many of our naval vessels requiring much less materials than were employed in the Mississippi, that took about six or twelve months in their construction. She was built with rapidity, and had at all times as many men at work upon her as could work to advantage. She had, in fact, many times more men at work upon her than could conveniently work. They worked on nights and Sundays upon her, as I did upon the Louisiana, at least for a large portion of the time." End quote. The Secretary of the Navy knew both of the Tifts, but had no near personal relations or family connection with either, as was recklessly alleged. He, in accepting their proposition, connected with it the detail of officers of the Navy to supervise expenditures and aid in procuring materials. Assisted by the chief engineer and constructor of the Navy, minute instructions were given as to the manner in which the work was to be conducted. As early as the 19th of September, he sent twenty ship carpenters from Richmond to New Orleans to aid in the construction of the Mississippi. On the 7th of October, authority was given to have guns of heaviest caliber made in New Orleans for the ship. Frequent telegrams were sent in November, December, and January, showing great earnestness about the work on the ship. In February and March, notice was given of the forwarding from Richmond of capstan and main shaft, which could not be made in New Orleans. On March 22nd, the secretary, by telegraph, directed the constructors to, quote, strain every nerve to finish the ship, end quote, and added, quote, work day and night, end quote. April 5th, he again wrote, quote, spare neither men nor money to complete her at the earliest moment. Cannot you hire night gangs for triple wages, end quote. April 10th, the secretary again says, quote, enemy's boats have passed island ten work day and night with all the force you can command to get the mississippi ready spare neither men nor money end quote. april eleventh he asks quote, when will you launch and when will she be ready for action end quote. these inquiries indicate the prevalent opinion at that time that the danger to new orleans was from the ironclad fleet above and not the vessels at the mouth of the river but the anxiety of the Secretary of the Navy, and the efforts made by him, were of a character applicable to either or both the sources of danger. Thus we find as early as the 24th of February, 1862, that he instructed Commander Mitchell to make all proper exertions to have guns and carriages ready for both the ironclad vessels, the Mississippi, and the Louisiana. Reports having reached him that the work on the latter vessel was not pushed with sufficient energy, on the 15th of March, he authorized Commander Mitchell to consult with General Lovell, and if the contractors were not doing everything practicable to complete her at the earliest moment, that he should take her out of their hands, and, with the aid of General Lovell, go on to complete her himself. On the 5th of April, 1862, Secretary Mallory instructed Commander Sinclair, who had been assigned to the command of the Mississippi, to urge on by night and day the completion of the ship. In March 1861, the Navy Department sent from Montgomery officers to New Orleans, 
with instructions to purchase steamers and fit them for war purposes. Officers were also sent to the north to purchase vessels suited to such uses, and in the ensuing May an agent was dispatched to Canada and another to Europe for like objects. And in April 1861, contracts were made with foundries at Richmond and New Orleans to make guns for the defense of New Orleans. On the 8th of May, 1861, the Secretary of the Navy communicated at some length to the Committee on Naval Affairs of the Confederate Congress his views in favor of ironclad vessels, arguing as well for their efficiency as the economy in building them, believing that one such vessel could successfully engage a fleet of the wooden vessels which constituted the enemy's navy. His further view was that we could not hope to build wooden fleets equal to those with which the enemy were supplied. The committee, if it should be deemed expedient to construct an ironclad ship, was urged to prompt action by the forcible declaration, quote, not a moment should be lost, end quote. Commander George Minor, Confederate States Navy, Chief of the Bureau of Ordnance, reported the number of guns sent by the Navy Department to New Orleans between July 1st, 1861, and the fall of the city to have been 197, and that before July, 23 guns had been sent there from Norfolk, being a total of 220 guns, of which 45 were of large caliber, supplied by the Navy Department for the defense of New Orleans. Very soon after the government was removed to Richmond, the Secretary of the Navy, with the aid of Commander Brooke, designed a plan for converting the sunken frigate Merrimack into an ironclad vessel. She became the famous Virginia, the brilliant career of which silenced all the criticisms which had been made upon the plan adopted. On May 20, 1861, the Secretary of the Navy instructed Captain Ingram, Confederate States Navy, to ascertain the practicability of obtaining wrought iron plates suited for ships' armor. After some disappointment and delay, the owners of the mills at Atlanta were induced to make the necessary changes in the machinery and undertake the work. Efforts at other places in the West had been unsuccessful, and this was one of the difficulties which an inefficient department would not have overcome. The ironclad gunboats Arkansas and Tennessee were commenced at Memphis, but the difficulty in obtaining mechanics so interfered with their construction that the Secretary of the Navy was compelled, December 24, 1861, to write to General Polk, who was commanding at Columbus, Kentucky, asking that mechanics might be detached from his forces so as to ensure the early completion of the vessels. So promptly had the ironclad boats been put under contract that the arrangements had all been made in anticipation of the appropriation, and the contract was signed, quote, on the very day the law was passed, end quote. On December 25, 1861, Lieutenant Isaac N. Brown, Confederate States Navy, a gallant and competent officer, well and favorably known in his subsequent service as commander of the Ram Arkansas, was sent to Nashville. Information had been received that four river boats were there, and for sale, which were suited for river defense. Lieutenant Brown was instructed to purchase such as should be adaptable to the required service, quote, and to proceed forthwith with the necessary alteration and armament, end quote. In the latter part of 1861, it having been found impossible with the means in Richmond and Norfolk to answer the requisitions for ordnance and ordnance stores required for the naval defenses of the Mississippi, a laboratory was established in New Orleans, and authority given for the casting of heavy cannon, construction of gun carriages, and the manufacture of projectiles and ordnance equipments of all kinds. On December 12, 1861, the Secretary of the Navy submitted an estimate for an appropriation to meet the expenses incurred, quote, for ordnance and ordnance stores for the defense of the Mississippi River, end quote. Secretary Mallory, in answer to inquiries of a joint committee of Congress in 1863, replied that he had sent a telegram to Captain Whittle, April 17, 1862, as follows, quote, Is the boom or raft below the forts in order to resist the enemy, or has any part of it given way? State condition, end quote. On the next day, the following answer was sent, quote, I hear the raft below the forts is not in best condition. They are strengthening it by additional lines. I have furnished anchors, end quote. To further inquiry about the raft by the committee, the secretary answered, quote, The commanding general at New Orleans had exclusive charge of the construction of the raft, or obstruction in question, 
and his correspondence with the War Department induced confidence in the security of New Orleans from the enemy. I was aware that this raft had been injured, but did not doubt that the commanding general would renew it and place an effectual barrier across the river, and I was anxious that the Navy should afford all possible aid. A large number of anchors were sent to New Orleans from Norfolk for the raft. End quote. Though much more might be added, it is hoped that what has been given above will sufficiently attest the zeal and capacity of the Secretary of the Navy, and his anxiety in particular, to protect the city of New Orleans, whether assailed by fleets descending or ascending the river. Having thus reviewed at length the events, immediate and remote, which were connected with the great catastrophe, the fall of our chief commercial city, and the destruction of the naval vessels on which our hopes most rested for the protection of the lower Mississippi and the harbors of the Gulf, the narrative is resumed of affairs at the city of New Orleans. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 29. Naval Affairs Continued. Farragut Demands the Surrender of New Orleans. Reply of the Mayor. United States flag hoisted. Advent of General Butler. Barbarities. Antecedents of the people. Galveston. Its surrender demanded. The reply. Another visit of the enemy's fleet. The port occupied. Appointment of General Magruder. Recapture of the port. Capture of the Harriet Lane. Report of General Magruder. Position and importance of Sabine Pass fleet of the enemy repulsed by 44 irishmen vessels captured naval destitution of the confederacy at first terror of gunboats on the western rivers their capture the most illustrious example the indianola her capture the ram arkansas descent of the yazoo river report of her commander runs through the enemy's fleet description of the vessel Attack on Baton Rouge. Address of General Breckinridge. Burning of the Arkansas. Sad though the memory of the fall of New Orleans must be, the heroism, the fortitude, and the patriotic self-sacrifice exhibited in the eventful struggle at the forts must ever remain the source of pride and of such consolation as misfortune gathers from the remembrance of duties well performed. After the troops had been withdrawn, and the city restored to the administration of the civil authorities, Commodore Farragut, on April 26, 1862, addressed the mayor, repeating his demand for the surrender of the city. In his letter, he said, It is not within the province of a naval officer to assume the duties of a military commandant, and added, The rights of persons and property shall be secured. He proceeded then to demand that the emblem of sovereignty of the United States be hoisted over the city hall, Mint and Custom House by Meridian this day. All flags and other emblems of sovereignty other than those of the United States must be removed from all the public buildings by that hour. To this the mayor replied, and the following extracts convey the general purport of his letter. Quote, the city is without the means of defense, and is utterly destitute of the force and material that might enable it to resist an overpowering armament displayed in sight of it to surrender such a place were an idle and unmeaning ceremony. As to hoisting any flag other than the flag of our own adoption and allegiance, let me say to you that the man lives not in our midst whose hand and heart would not be paralyzed at the mere thought of such an act. Nor could I find in my entire constituency so wretched and desperate a renegade as would dare to profane with his hand the sacred emblem of our aspirations. Peace and order may be preserved, without resort to measures which I could not at this moment prevent. Your occupying the city does not transfer allegiance from the government of their choice to one which they have deliberately repudiated, and they yield the obedience which the conqueror is entitled to extort from the conquered. Respectfully, John T. Monroe, Mayor. End quote. 
On the 29th of April, Admiral Farragut adopted the alternative presented by the answer of the mayor and sent a detachment of Marines to hoist the United States flag over the Custom House and to pull down the Confederate flag from the staff on the City Hall. An officer and some Marines remained at the Custom House to guard the United States flag hoisted over it until the land forces under General Butler arrived. On the 1st of May, General Butler took possession of the defenseless city. Then followed the reign of terror, pillage, and a long train of infamies, too disgraceful to be remembered without a sense of shame by anyone who is proud of the name American. Had the population of New Orleans been vagrant and riotous, the harsh measures adopted might have been excused, though nothing could have justified the barbarities which were practiced. But, notable as the city had always been for freedom from tumult, and occupied as it then was mainly by women and children, nothing can extenuate the wanton insults and outrages heaped upon them. That those not informed of the character of the citizens may the better comprehend it, a brief reference is made to its history. When Canada, then a French colony, was conquered by Great Britain, many of the inhabitants of greatest influence and highest cultivation, in a spirit of loyalty to their flag, migrated to the wilds of Louisiana. Some of them established themselves in and about New Orleans, and their numerous descendants formed, down to a late period, the controlling element in the body politic. Even after they had ceased, because of large immigration, to control in the commercial and political affairs of the city, their social standard was still the rule. No people were more characterized by refinement, courtesy, and chivalry. Of their keen susceptibility, the mayor informed Commodore Farragut in his correspondence with that officer. When the needy barbarians of the upper plains of Asia descended upon the classic fields of Italy, their atrocities were such as shocked the common sense of humanity. But if anyone shall inquire minutely into the conduct of Butler and his followers at New Orleans, he will find there a history yet more revolting. Soon thereafter, on May 17, 1862, Captain Eagle, United States Navy, commanding the naval forces before Galveston, summoned it to surrender, quote, to prevent the effusion of blood and the destruction of property which would result from the bombardment of the town, end quote, adding that the land and naval forces would appear in a few days. The reply was that, quote, when the land and naval forces made their appearance, the demand would be answered, end quote. The harbor and town of Galveston were not prepared to resist a bombardment, and, under the advice of General Herbert, the citizens remained quiet, resolved, when the enemy should attempt to penetrate the interior, to resist his march at every point. This condition remained without any material change until the 8th of the following October, when Commander Renshaw, with a fleet of gunboats, consisting of the Westfield, Harriet Lane, Owasco, Clifton, and some transports, approached so near the city as to command it with his guns. Upon a signal, the mayor, pro tem, came off to the flagship and informed Commander Renshaw that the military and civil authorities had withdrawn from the town, and that he had been appointed by a meeting of citizens to act as mayor, and had come for the purpose of learning the intentions of the naval commander. In reply, he was informed that there was no purpose to interfere with the municipal affairs of the city, that he did not intend to occupy it before the arrival of a military commander, but that he intended to hoist the United States flag upon the public buildings, and claim that it should be respected. The acting mayor informed him that persons over whom he had no control might take down the flag, and he could not guarantee that it should be respected. Commander Renshaw replied that, to avoid any difficulty like that which occurred in New Orleans, he would send with the flag a sufficient force to protect it, and would not keep the flag flying for more than a quarter or half an hour. The vessels of the fleet were assigned to positions commanding the town and the bridge which connected the island with the mainland, and a battalion of Massachusetts volunteers was posted on one of the wharves. Late in 1862, General John B. Magruder, the skillful and knightly soldier, who had, at an earlier period of the year, rendered distinguished service by his defense of the peninsula between the James and York Rivers, Virginia, was assigned to the command of the Department of Texas. On his arrival, he found the enemy in possession of the principal port, Galveston, and other points upon the coast. He promptly collected the scattered arms and field artillery, had a couple of ordinary high-pressure steamboats used in the transportation of cotton on Buffalo Bayou, 
protected with cotton bales piled from the main deck to and above the hurricane roof and these under the command of captain leon smith of the texas navy in cooperation with the volunteers were relied upon to recapture the harbor and island of galveston between night and morning on the first of january eighteen sixty three the land forces entered the town and the steamboats came into the bay manned by texas cavalry and volunteer artillery the field artillery was ran down to the shore and opened fire upon the boats the battalion of the enemy having torn up the plank of the wharf our infantry could only approach them by wading through the water and climbing upon the wharf the two steamboats attacked the harriet lane the gunboat lying farthest up the bay they were both so frail in their construction that their only chance was to close and board one of them was soon disabled by collision with the strong vessel and in a sinking condition ran into shoal water the other closed with the harriet lane boarded and captured the vessel the flagship westfield got aground and could not be got off though assisted by one of the fleet for that purpose general magruder then sent a demand that the enemy's vessels should surrender except one on which the crews of all should leave the harbor giving until ten o'clock for compliance with his demand to enforce which he put a crew on the harriet lane then the most efficient vessel afloat of the enemy's fleet and while waiting for an answer ceased firing this demand was communicated by a boat from the harriet lane to the commander on the clifton who said that he was not the commander of the fleet and would communicate the proposal to the flag officer on the westfield flags of truce were then flying on the enemy's vessels as well as on shore commander renshaw refused to accede to the proposition directing the commander of the clifton to get all the vessels including the corypheus and sachem which had recently joined out of port as soon as possible and that he would blow up the westfield and leave on the transports lying near him with his officers and crew in attempting to execute this purpose commander renshaw and ten or fifteen others perished soon after leaving the ship in consequence of the explosion being premature the general commanding made the following preliminary report Quote, headquarters galveston texas this morning the first january at three o'clock i attacked the enemy's fleet and garrison at this place captured the latter and the steamer harriet lane two barges and a schooner the rest some four or five escaped ignominiously under cover of a flag of truce i have about six hundred prisoners and a large quantity of valuable stores arms etc the harriet lane is very little injured she was carried by boarders from two high-pressure cotton steamers, manned by Texas cavalry and artillery. The line troops were gallantly commanded by Colonel Green, of Sibley's brigade, and the ships and artillery by Major Leon Smith, to whose indomitable energy and heroic daring the country is indebted for the successful execution of a plan which I had considered for the destruction of the enemy's fleet. Colonel Bagby, of Sibley's brigade, also commanded the volunteers from his regiment for the naval expedition in which every officer and every man won for himself imperishable renown j bankhead magruder major general end quote. the conduct of commander renshaw toward the inhabitants of galveston had been marked by moderation and propriety and the closing act of his life was one of manly courage and fidelity to the flag he bore commander wainwright and lieutenant commanding lee who fell valiantly defending their ship, were buried in the cemetery with the honors of war. Thus was evinced that instinctive respect which true warriors always feel for their peers. The surviving officers were paroled. It would be a pleasing task, if space allowed, to notice the many instances of gallantry in this affair, as daring as they were novel. But want of space compels me to refer the reader to the full accounts which have been published of the, quote, cavalry charge upon a naval fleet end quote. the capture of the enemy's fleet in galveston harbor by means so novel as to excite surprise as well as grateful admiration was followed by another victory on the coast of texas under circumstances so remarkable as properly to be considered marvelous to those familiar with the events of that time and section it is hardly necessary to say that i refer to the battle of sabine pass the strategic importance to the enemy of the possession of sabine river caused the organization of a large expedition of land and naval forces to enter and ascend the river 
If successful, it gave the enemy short lines for operation against the interior of Texas, and relieved them of the discomfiture resulting from their expulsion from Galveston Harbor. The fleet of the enemy numbered 23 vessels. The forces were estimated to be 10,000 men. No adequate provision had been made to resist such a force, and, under the circumstances, none might have been promptly made on which reliance could have been reasonably placed. A few miles above the entrance into the Sabine River, a small earthwork had been constructed, garrisoned at the time of the action by 42 men and two lieutenants, with an armament of six guns. The officers and men were all Irishmen, and the company was called the Davis Guards. The captain, F. H. Oldham, was temporarily absent, so that the command devolved upon Lieutenant E. W. Dowling. Wishing to perpetuate the history of an affair, in which I believe the brave garrison did more than an equal force had ever elsewhere performed, I asked General Magruder, when I met him after the war, to write out a full account of the event. He agreed to do so, but died not long after I saw him, and before complying with my request. From the publications of the day, I have obtained the main facts, as they were then printed in the Texas newspapers, and, being unwilling to summarize the reports, give them at length. Captain F. H. Oldham's Official Report Quote, Headquarters, Sabine Pass, September 9, 1863 Captain A. N. Mills, Assistant Adjutant General Sir, I have the honor to report that we had an engagement with the enemy yesterday and gained a handsome victory. We captured two of their gunboats, crippled a third, and drove the rest out of the pass. We took eighteen fine guns, a quantity of smaller arms, ammunition, and stores, killed about fifty, wounded several, and took one hundred and fifty prisoners, without the loss or injury of any one on our side or serious damage to the fort. Your most obedient servant, F. H. Oldham, Captain, Commanding Sabine Pass. End quote. Commodore Leon Smith's official report. Quote, Captain E. P. Turner, Assistant Adjutant General. Sir, after telegraphing the Major General before leaving Beaumont, I took a horse and proceeded with all haste to Sabine Pass, from which direction I could distinctly hear a heavy firing. Arriving at the pass at 3 p.m., I found the enemy off and inside the bar, with nineteen gunboats and steamships and other ships of war, carrying, as well as I could judge, fifteen thousand men. I proceeded with Captain Oldham to the fort, and found Lieutenant Dowling and Lieutenant N. H. Smith, of the Engineer Corps, with forty-two men, defending the fort. Until 3 p.m., our men did not open on the enemy, as the range was too distant. The officers of the fort coolly held their fire until the enemy had approached near enough to reach them. But when the enemy arrived within good range, our batteries were opened, and gallantly replied to a galling and most terrific fire from the enemy. As I entered the fort, the gunboats Clifton, Arizona, Sachem, and Granite State, with several others, came boldly up to within 1,000 yards and opened their batteries, which were gallantly and effectively replied to by the Davis Guards. For one hour and thirty minutes, a most terrific bombardment of grape, canister, and shell was directed against our heroic and devoted little band within the fort. The shot struck in every direction, but thanks be to God, not one of the noble Davis guards was hurt. Too much credit cannot be awarded Lieutenant Dowling, who displayed the utmost heroism in the discharge of the duty assigned him and the defenders of the fort. God bless the Davis guards, one and all. The honor of the country was in their hands, and nobly they sustained it. Every man stood at his post regardless of the murderous fire that was poured upon them from every direction. The result of the battle, which lasted from 3.30 to 5 p.m., was the capturing of the Clifton and Sachem, 18 heavy guns, 150 prisoners, and the killing and wounding of 50 men, and driving outside the bar the enemy's fleet, comprising 23 vessels in all. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, Leon Smith, commanding Marine Department of Texas, end quote. Quote, Headquarters, District of Texas, New Mexico and Arizona, Houston, Texas, September 9, 1863. Special Order. Another glorious victory has been won by the heroism of Texans. The enemy, confident of overpowering the little garrison at Sabine Pass, 
boldly advanced to the work of capture. After a sharp contest, he was entirely defeated, one gunboat hurrying off in a crippled condition, while two others, the Clifton and Sachem, with their armaments and crews, including the commander of the fleet, surrendered to the gallant defenders of the fort. The loss of the enemy has been heavy, while not a man on our side has been killed or wounded. Though the enemy has been repulsed in his naval attacks, his land forces, reported as 10,000 strong, are still off the coast waiting an opportunity to land. The Major General calls on every man able to bear arms, to bring his guns or arms, no matter of what kind, and be prepared to make a sturdy resistance to the foe. Major General J. B. Magruder, Edmund P. Turner, Assistant Adjutant General. End quote. The Daily Post, Houston, Texas, of August 22, 1880, has the following. Quote, a few days after the battle, each man that participated in the fight was presented with a silver medal inscribed as follows. On one side, D.G. for the Davis Guards, and on the reverse side, Sabine Pass, September 8, 1863. Captain Odlum and Lieutenant R.W. Dowling have gone to that bourne whence no traveler returns, and but few members of the heroic band are in the land of the living, and those few reside in the city of Houston, and often meet together and talk about the battle in which they participated on the memorable 8th of September, 1863. The following are the names of the company who manned the guns in Fort Grigsby, and to whom the credit is due for the glorious victory. Lieutenants R. W. Dowling and N. H. Smith, Privates Timothy McDonough, Thomas Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Michael Monahan, John Hassett, John McKeever, Jack W. White, Patrick McDonnell, William Gleason, Michael Carr, Thomas Haggerty, Timothy Huggins, Alexander McCabe, James Fleming, Patrick Fitzgerald, Thomas McKernan, Edward Pritchard, Charles Rhines, Timothy Hurley, John McGrath, Matthew Walsh, Patrick Sullivan, Michael Sullivan, Thomas Sullivan, Patrick Clare, John Hennessy, Hugh Deegan, Maurice Powers, Abner Carter, Daniel McMurray, Patrick Malone, James Corcoran, Patrick Abbott, John McNeilis, Michael Egan, Daniel Donovan, John Wesley, John Anderson, John Flood, Peter O'Hare, Michael Delaney, Terence Mulhern. End quote. The inquiry may naturally arise how this small number of men could take charge of so large a body of prisoners. This required that to their valor they should add stratagem. A few men were placed on the parapet as sentinels. The rest were marched out as a guard to receive the prisoners and their arms. Thus was concealed the fact that the fort was empty. The report of the guns bombarding the fort had been heard, and soon after the close of the battle reinforcements arrived, which relieved the little garrison from its embarrassment. Official reports of officers in the assaulting column, as published in the Rebellion Record, Volume 7, page 425, at Sequins, refer to another fort and steamers in the river, cooperating in the defense of Fort Grigsby. The success of the single company which garrisoned the earthwork is without parallel in ancient or modern war. It was marvelous, but it is incredible, more than marvelous, that another garrison in another fort, with cruising steamers, aided in checking the advance of the enemy, yet silently permitted the forty-two men and two officers of Fort Grigsby to receive all the credit for the victory which was won. If this be supposable, how is it possible that Captain Odlum, Commander Smith, General Magruder, and Lieutenant Dowling, who had been advised to abandon the work, and had consulted their men as to their willingness to defend it, should nowhere have mentioned the putative fort and cooperating steamers? The names of the forty-four must go down to posterity, unshorn of the honor which their contemporaries admiringly accorded. At the commencement of the war, the Confederacy was not only without a navy, all the naval vessels possessed by the states having been, as explained elsewhere, left in the hands of our enemies, but worse than this was the fact that shipbuilding had been almost exclusively done in the northern states, so that we had no means of acquiring equality in naval power. The numerous deep and wide rivers traversing the southern states 
gave a favorable field for the operation of gunboats suited to such circumstances. The enemy rapidly increased their supply of these by building on the western waters, as well as elsewhere, and converting existing vessels into ironclad gunboats. The intrepidity and devotion of our people met the necessity by new expedients and extraordinary daring. This was especially seen in the operations of western Louisiana, where numerous bayous and rivers, with difficult land routes, gave an advantage to the enemy, which might well have paralyzed anything less than the most resolute will. In the earlier period of the war, the gunboats had inspired a terror which their performances never justified. There was a prevailing opinion that they could not be stopped by land batteries, or resisted on water by anything else than vessels of their own class. Against the first opinion, General Richard Taylor, commanding in Louisiana, south of Red River, stoutly contended, and maintained his opinion by the repulse and capture of some of the enemy's vessels by land batteries, having guns of rather light caliber. One by one, successful conflicts between river boats and gunboats impaired the estimate which had been put upon the latter. The most illustrious example of this was the attack and capture of the Indianola, a heavy ironclad, with two 11-inch guns forward and two 9-inch aft, all in iron casemates. She had passed the batteries at Vicksburg and was in the section of the river between Vicksburg and Port Hudson, which, in February 1863, was the only gate of communication which the Confederacy had between the east and west sides of the Mississippi. The importance of keeping open this communication, always great, became vital from the necessity of drawing commissary stores from the Trans-Mississippi. Major Brent, of General Taylor's staff, proposed, with the towboat Webb, which had been furnished as a ram, and the Queen of the West, which had been four or five days before, captured by the land battery at Fort de Russy, to go to the Mississippi and attack the Indianola. On the 19th of February, the expedition started, though mechanics were still working upon the needed repairs of the Queen of the West. The service was so hazardous that volunteers only formed the crews, but of these more offered than were wanted. On the 24th, while ascending the Mississippi, Major Brent learned, when about 60 miles below Vicksburg, that the Indianola was a short distance ahead, with a coal barge lashed on either side. He determined to attack in the night, being assured that, if struck by a shell from one of the 11 or 9-inch guns, either of his boats would be destroyed. At 10 p.m., the Queen, followed by the Webb, was driven at full speed directly upon the Indianola. The momentum of the Queen was so great as to cut through the coal barge and indent the iron plates of the Indianola. As the Queen backed out, the Webb dashed in at full speed and tore away the remaining coal barge. Both the forward guns fired at the Webb, but missed her. Again, the Queen struck the Indianola, abaft the paddle box, crushing her frame and loosening some plates of armor, but received the fire of the guns from the rear casemates. One shot carried away a dozen bales of cotton on the right side. The other, a shell, entered the forward porthole and exploded, killing six men and disabling two field pieces. Again, the Webb followed the Queen, struck near the same spot, pushing aside the iron plates and crushing timbers. Voices from the Indianola announced the surrender, and that she was sinking. The river here sweeps the western shore, and there was deep water up to the bank. General Grant's army was on the west side of the river, and for either or both of these reasons, Major Brent towed the Indianola to the opposite side, where she sank on a bar, her gun deck above water. Both boats were much shattered in the conflict and Major Brent returned to the Red River to repair them. A tender accompanied the Queen and the Webb, and a frail river boat, without protection for her boilers, which was met on the river, turned back and followed them, but, like the tender, could be of no service in the battle. For these particulars, I am indebted to General Richard Taylor's book, Destruction and Reconstruction, pages 123 to 125. The Ram Arkansas, which has been previously noticed as being under construction at Memphis, was removed before she was finished to the Yazoo River, events on the river above having rendered this necessary for her security. After she was supposed to be ready for service, Commander Brown, then as previously in charge of her, went down the Yazoo to enter the Mississippi and proceed to Vicksburg. 
the enemy's fleet of some twelve or thirteen rams, gunboats, and sloops of war, were in the river above Vicksburg, and below the point where the Yazoo enters the Mississippi. Anticipating the descent of the Arkansas, a detachment had been made from this fleet to prevent her exit. The annexed letter of Commander Brown describes what occurred in the Yazoo River. Quote, Steamer Arkansas, July 15, 1862. General. The Benton, or whatever ironclad we disabled, was left with colors down, evidently aground to prevent sinking, about one mile and a half above the mouth of the Yazoo in Old River, on the right-hand bank or bank across from Vicksburg. I wish it to be remembered that we whipped this vessel, made it run out of the fight and haul down colors, with two less guns than they had, and at the same time fought two rams which were firing at us with great guns and small arms. This, too, with our miscellaneous crew, who had never, for the most part, been on board a ship, or at big guns. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, J. N. Brown, Lieutenant Commanding, to Brigadier General M. L. Smith, Commanding Defenses at Vicksburg. End quote. When entering the Mississippi, the fleet of the enemy was found disposed as a phalanx, but the heroic commander of the Arkansas moved directly against it and though in passing through this formidable array he was exposed to the broadsides of the whole fleet, the vessel received no other injury than from one eleven-inch shot, which entered the gun-room, and the perforation in many places of her smokestack. The casualties to the crew were five killed, four wounded. Among the latter was a gallant commander. General Van Dorn, commanding the department, in a dispatch from Vicksburg, July 15th, states the number of the enemy's vessels above Vicksburg, pays a high compliment to the officers and men, and adds, quote, All the enemy's transports and all the vessels of war of the lower fleet, i.e. the fleet just below Vicksburg, except a sloop of war, have got up steam and are off to escape from the Arkansas, end quote. A vessel inspiring such dread is entitled to a special description. She was an ironclad steamer, 100 feet in her length, her armament ten parrot guns, and her crew one hundred men, who had volunteered from the land forces for the desperate service proposed. Her commander had been from his youth in the Navy of the United States, and his capacity was such as could well supplement whatever was wanted of naval knowledge in his crew. The care and skill with which the vessel had been constructed were tested and proved under fire. Had her engines been equal to the hull and armor of the vessel, it is difficult to estimate the value of the service she might have performed. At this period the enemy occupied Baton Rouge, with gunboats lying in front of it to cooperate with the troops in the town. The importance of holding a section of the Mississippi, so as to keep free communication between the eastern and western portions of the Confederacy, has been heretofore noticed. To this end it was deemed needful to recover the possession of Baton Rouge, and it was decided to make a land attack in cooperation with the Arkansas to be sent down against the enemy's fleet. Major General J.C. Breckinridge was assigned to the command of the land forces. This distinguished citizen and a like distinguished soldier, surmounting difficulties which would have discouraged a less resolute spirit, approached Baton Rouge and moved to the attack at the time indicated for the arrival of the Arkansas. In his address to the officers and soldiers of his command, after the battle, viz. on August 6, 1862, he compliments the troops on the fortitude with which they had borne a severe march, on the manner in which they attacked the enemy, superior in numbers, and admirably posted, drove him from his positions, taking his camps, and forcing him to seek protection under cover of the guns of his fleet. Major General Breckinridge attributes his failure to achieve entire success to the inability of the Arkansas to cooperate with his forces, and adds, quote, you have given the enemy a severe and salutary lesson, and now those who so lately were ravaging and plundering this region do not care to extend their pickets beyond the sight of their fleet. End quote. The Arkansas, in descending the river, moved leisurely, having ample time to meet her appointment. But, when about fifteen miles above Baton Rouge, her starboard engine broke down. Repairs were immediately commenced and by 8 a.m. on the 5th of August were partially completed. General Breckinridge had commenced the attack at 4 o'clock, and the Arkansas, though not in condition to engage the enemy, moved on, and, when in sight of Baton Rouge, her starboard engine again broke down. 
and the vessel was run ashore. The work of repair was resumed, and next morning the Federal fleet was seen coming up. The Arkansas was moored head downstream and cleared for action. The Essex approached and opened fire. At that moment the engineers reported the engines able to work half a day. The lines were cut, and the Arkansas started for the Essex, when the other, the larboard engine, suddenly stopped, and the vessel was again secured to the shore stern down. The Essex now valiantly approached, pouring a hot fire into her disabled antagonist. Lieutenant Stevens, then commanding the Arkansas, ordered the crew ashore, fired the vessel, and, with her flag flying, turned her adrift, a sacrificial offering to the cause she had served so valiantly in her brief but brilliant career. Lieutenant Reed, of the Ram Arkansas, in his published account of the affair, states, quote, After all hands were ashore, the Essex fired upon the disabled vessel most furiously. End, quote. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 30. Naval Affairs Continued. Necessity of a Navy. Raphael Semmes. The Sumter. Difficulties in creating a navy. The Sumter at sea. Alarm. Her captures. James D. Bullock. Laird's speech in the House of Commons. The Alabama. Semmes takes command. The vessel and crew. Goes to sea. Banks's expedition. Magruder at Galveston. The steamer Hatteras sunk. The Alabama not a pirate. An Aspinwall steamer ransomed. Other captures. Prizes burned. At Cherbourg. Fight with the Kearsarge. Rescue of the men. Demand of the United States government for the surrender of the drowning men. Reply of the British government. Sailing of the Orito. Detained at Nassau. Captain Maffet. The ship half equipped. Arrives at Mobile. Runs the blockade. Her crews. Capture and crews of the Clarence. The captures of the Florida. Captain C. M. Morris. The Florida at Bahia. Seized by the Wachusett. Brought to Virginia and sunk. Correspondence. The Georgia. Cruises and captures. The Shenandoah. Cruises and captures. The Atlanta. The Tallahassee. The Edith. To maintain the position assumed by the Confederate States as a separate power among the nations, it was obviously necessary to have a navy, not only for the defense of their coast, but also for the protection of their commerce. These states, after their secession from the Union, were in that regard in a destitute condition, similar to that of the United States after their declaration of independence. It has been shown that among the first acts of the Confederate administration, was the effort to buy ships which could be used for naval purposes. The policy of the United States government being to shut up our commerce rather than protect their own, induced the wholesale purchase of the vessels found in the northern ports, not only such as could be made fit for cruisers, but also any which would serve even for blockading purposes. There was little shipping of any kind in the southern ports, and to that scanty supply we were, for the time, restricted. A previous reference has been made to the Sumter, Commander Raphael Semmes, but a more extended notice is considered due. Educated in the naval service of the United States, Raphael Semmes had attained the rank of commander and was distinguished for his studious habits and varied acquirements. When Alabama passed her ordinance of secession, he was on duty at Washington as a member of the Lighthouse Board. He promptly tendered his resignation and, at the organization of the Confederate government, repaired to Montgomery and tendered his services to it. The efforts which had been made to obtain steamers suited to cruising against the enemy's commerce had been quite unsuccessful, none being found which the naval officers charged with their selection regarded fit for the service. 
one of the reports described a small propeller steamer of 500 tons burden, seagoing, low-pressure engine, sound, and capable of being so strengthened as to carry an ordinary battery of four or five guns, speed between nine and ten knots, but the board condemned her because she could carry but five days' fuel and had no accommodations for the crew. The Secretary of the Navy showed this to Commander Semmes, who said, Give me that ship. I think I can make her answer the purpose. She was to be christened the Sumter, in commemoration of our first victory, and had the honor of being the first ship of war commissioned by the Confederate States, and the first to display the stars and bars of the Confederacy on the high seas. The Sumter was at New Orleans, to which place Commander Semmes repaired, and as forcibly presenting the difficulties under which we labored in all attempts to create a navy, I will quote from his memoirs the account of his effort to get the Sumter ready for sea. Quote, I now took my ship actively in hand, and set gangs of mechanics at work to remove her upper cabins and other top hamper, preparatory to making the necessary alterations. These latter were considerable, and I soon found that I had a tedious job on my hands. It was no longer the case, as it had been in former years, when I had had occasion to fit out a ship, that I could go into a navy yard with well-provided workshops and skilled workmen, ready with all the requisite materials at hand to execute my orders. Everything had to be improvised, from the manufacture of a water tank to the kids and cans of the berth-deck messes, and from a gun carriage to a friction primer. Two long, tedious months were consumed in making alterations and additions. My battery was to consist of an eight-inch shell gun to be pivoted amidships and of four light 32-pounders of 1,300 weight each in broadside. End quote. On the 3rd of June, 1861, the Sumter was formally put in commission, and a muster roll of the officers and men transmitted to the Navy Department. On the 18th of June, she left New Orleans and steamed down and anchored near the mouth of the river. While lying at the head of the passes, the commander reported a blockading squadron outside of three ships at Pass Lutra and one at the Southwest Pass. The Brooklyn at Pass Lutra was not only a powerful vessel, but she had greater speed than the Sumter. The Powhatan's heavy armament made it very hazardous to pass her in daylight, and the absence of buoys and lights made it next to impossible to keep the channel in darkness. The Sumter, therefore, had been compelled to lie at the head of the passes and watch for some opportunity in the absence of either the Brooklyn or the Powhatan to get to sea. Fortunately, neither of these vessels came up to the head of the passes, where, there being but a single channel, it would have been easy to prevent the exit of the Sumter. On the 30th of June, one bright morning, a boatman reported that the Brooklyn had gone off in chase of a sail. Immediately the Sumter was got under way when it was soon discovered that the Brooklyn was returning, and that the two vessels were about equally distant from the bar. By steady courage and rare seamanship, the Sumter escaped from her more swift pursuer, and entered on her career of cutting the enemy's sinews of war by destroying his commerce. Numerous armed vessels of the enemy were hovering on our coast, yet this one little cruiser created a general alarm, and, though a regularly commissioned vessel of the Confederacy, was habitually denounced as a pirate, and the many threats to destroy her served only to verify the adage that the threatened live long. During her cruise up to January 17, 1862, she captured three ships, five brigs, six barks, and three schooners, but the property destroyed formed a very small part of the damage done to the enemy's commerce. Her appearance on the seas created such alarm that northern ships were, to a large extent, put under foreign flags, and the carrying trade, in which the United States stood second only to Great Britain, passed rapidly into other hands. The Sumter, while doing all this mischief, was nearly self-sustaining, her running expenses to the Confederate government being but $28,000 when, at the close of 1861, she arrived at Gibraltar. Not being able to obtain coal, she remained there until sold. Captain James D. Bullock, an officer of the Old Navy, of high ability as a seaman, and of an integrity which stood the test under which a less stern character might have given way, was our naval agent at Liverpool. In his office he dispersed millions, and, 
when there was no one to whom he could be required to render an account, paid out the last shilling in his hands, and confronted poverty without prospect of other reward than that which he might find in a clear conscience. He contracted with the Messrs. Laird of Birkenhead to build a strong steam merchant ship, the same which was afterward christened the Alabama, when, in a foreign port, she had received her armament and crew. So much of pure denunciation has been directed against the builder and the ship, which, in the virulent language of the day, our enemies denominated a pirate, that the case claims at my hands a somewhat extended notice. The senior Mr. Laird was a member of the British Parliament, and because of the complaints made by the United States government, and the abuse heaped upon him by the northern newspapers, he made a speech in the House of Commons, in which he stated that, in 1861, he was applied to to build vessels for the northern government, first by personal application, and subsequently by a letter from Washington, asking him, on the part of the United States Navy Department, to give the terms on which he would build an iron-plated ship, to be finished, complete with guns and everything appertaining. Mr. Laird continued, quote, on the 14th of August I received another letter from the same gentleman, from which the following is an extract. I have this morning a note from the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, in which he says, I hope your friends will tender for the two iron-plated steamers. End quote. Mr. Laird then said that, while he would not give the name of his correspondent, who was a gentleman of the highest respectability, he was willing, in confidence, to submit the original letters to the Speaker of the House or the First Minister of the Crown, that, as, quote, the American government is making so much work about other parties whom they charge with violating or evading the law, when in reality they have not done so, I think it only right to state these facts, end quote. Those who have listened with credulity to the abuse of the Confederate government, as well as that of Great Britain, the one for contracting for the building of the Alabama, and the other for permitting her to leave a British port, will thus see how little of sincerity there was in the complaints of the United States government. For more than a generation, the British people have been the great shipbuilders of the world, and it is a matter of surprise that they should have given respectful consideration to charges of a breach of neutrality, because they allowed a merchantman to be built in one of their ports, and to leave it without any armament or crew, which could have enabled it, in that condition, to make war upon a country with which Great Britain was at peace. Referring to the Alabama, as she was when she left the Mersey, Mr. Laird said, quote, If a ship without guns and without arms is a dangerous article, surely rifled guns and ammunition of all sorts are equally and even more dangerous. I have referred to the bills of entry in the custom houses of London and Liverpool, and I find that there have been vast shipments of implements of war to the northern states, through the celebrated houses of Baring and Company, Brown, Shipley and Company, and a variety of other names. I have obtained from the official Custom House returns some details of the sundries exported from the United Kingdom to the northern states of America from the 1st of May, 1861, to the 31st of December, 1862. There were muskets, 41,500, rifles, 341,000, gunflints, 26,500, percussion caps, 49,982,000, and swords, 2,250. The best information I could obtain leads me to believe that one-third to a half may be added to these numbers for items which have been shipped to the northern states as hardware, so that if the southern states have got two ships unarmed, unfit for any purpose of warfare, for they procure their armament somewhere else, the northern states have been well supplied from this country through the agency of some most influential persons. End quote. The speech of Mr. Laird, exposing the hypocrisy of the representations which had been made, as well by commercial bodies as by the highest officers of the United States, called forth repeated cheers from the Parliament. There had been no secrecy about the building of the Alabama. The same authority above quoted states that she was frequently visited while under construction and it is known that the British government was applied to to prevent her from leaving port. It was feared that she might be delayed, but it was not considered possible that British authorities would prevent an unarmed merchant ship from leaving her coast, lest she might elsewhere procure an armament, and, in the service of a recognized belligerent, revive the terror in the other belligerent 
which the little Sumter had recently inspired. When the Alabama was launched and ready for sea, Captain Bullock summoned Captain Semmes, lately commander of the Sumter, to Liverpool, where he spent a few days in financial arrangements and in collecting the old officers of the Sumter. The Alabama, then known as the 290, had proceeded a few days before to her rendezvous, the Portuguese island of Terceira, one of the group of the Azores. The story that the name 290 belonged to the fact that she had been built by 290 Englishmen, sympathizers in our struggle, was a mere fiction. She was built under a contract with the Confederate States, and paid for with Confederate money. She happened to be the 290th ship built by the Lairds, and, not having been christened, was called 290. Captain Semmes followed her, accompanied by Captain Bullock on the steamer Bahama, and found her at the place of rendezvous, also a sailing ship which had been dispatched before the Alabama with her battery and stores. Captain Semmes, with the sailor's enthusiasm, describes his first impression on seeing the ship which was to be his future home. The defects of the Sumter had been avoided, so that he found his new ship, quote, a perfect steamer and a perfect sailing ship at the same time, neither of her two modes of locomotion being at all dependent upon the other. She was about 900 tons burden, 230 feet in length, 32 feet in breadth, 20 feet in depth, and drew, when provisioned and coaled for a cruise, 15 feet of water. Her model was of the most perfect symmetry, and she sat upon the water with the lightness and grace of a swan, end quote. She was yet only a merchant ship, and the men on board of her, as well as those who came out with the captain on the Bahama, were only under articles for the voyage. She therefore had no crew for future service. When her armament and stores had been put on board, she steamed from the harbor out to the open sea, where she was to be christened and put in commission. Captain Bullock went out on her and stood sponsor at the ceremony. He had just cause to be proud of the ship, and we to be thankful to him for the skill and care with which he had designed her and supervised her construction. The scantling of the vessel was comparatively light, having been intended for a scourge to the enemy's commerce rather than for battle, and merely to defend herself if it became necessary. Her masts were proportioned so as to carry large canvas, and her engine was of 300 horsepower, with an apparatus for condensing vapor to supply the crew with all the fresh water requisite. The coal, stores, and armament, having been received from the supply ships, she steamed out to sea on Sunday morning, August 24, 1862. There, more than a marine league from the shore, on the blue water over which man holds no empire, Captain Semmes read the commission of the President of the Confederacy appointing him a captain, and the order of the Secretary of the Navy assigning him to the command of the Alabama. There, where no government held jurisdiction, where the commission of the Confederacy was as valid as that of any power, the Alabama was christened, and was henceforth a ship of war in the Navy of the Confederate States. The men who had come thus far under articles no longer binding were left to their option whether to be paid off with a free passage to Liverpool or to enlist in the crew of the Alabama. Eighty of the men who had come out in the several vessels enrolled themselves in the usual manner. Captain Semmes had a full complement of officers, and with this, though less than the authorized crew, he commenced his long and brilliant cruise. The ship's armament consisted of six 32-pounders in broadsides and two pivot guns amidships, one of them a smooth-bore eight-inch, the other a hundred-pounder rifled Blakely. Captain Semmes, from his varied knowledge of affairs both on sea and land, did not sail by chance in quest of adventure but directed his course to places where the greatest number of the enemy's merchantmen were likely to be found. And to this, the large number of captures he made is in no small degree attributable. On board one of the ships captured, they got New York papers, from which he learned that General Banks, with a large fleet of transports, was to sail on a certain day for Galveston. On this, he decided to go to the rendezvous appointed for his coal ship and make all due preparation for a dash into the fleet when they should arrive at the harbor of Galveston, and therefore directed his course into the Gulf of Mexico. In the meantime, General Magruder had recaptured Galveston, so that on his arrival the lookout informed him that, instead of a fleet, there were five ships of war blockading the harbor 
and throwing shells into the town, from which his keen perception drew the proper conclusion that we had possession of the town, and that he was confronted by ships of war, not transports laden with troops. As each of the five ships observed by the lookout were supposed to be larger than his own, he had, of course, no disposition to run into that fleet. It therefore only remained to tempt one of the ships to follow him beyond supporting distance. The hope was soon realized as a vessel was seen to come out from the fleet. The Alabama was under sail, and Captain Semmes says, quote, To carry out my design of decoying the enemy, I now wore ship as though I were fleeing from his pursuit, and lowered the propeller into the water. When about twenty miles from the fleet, the Alabama was prepared for action, and wheeled to meet her pursuer. To the first hail made, the answer from the Alabama was, This is Her Britannic Majesty's steamer Petrel, and the answer was, This is the United States ship, name not heard. End quote. Captain Semmes then directed the first lieutenant to call out through his trumpet, This is the Confederate States steamer Alabama. A broadside was instantly returned by the enemy. Captain Semmes describes the state of the atmosphere as highly favorable to the conduct of sound and the wind blowing in the direction of the enemy's fleet. The Federal Admiral, as afterward learned, immediately got under way with the Brooklyn and two others of his steamers to go to the rescue. The crews of both ships must have been standing at their guns, as the broadsides so instantly followed each other. In thirteen minutes after firing the first gun, the enemy hoisted a light and fired an off-gun as a signal that he had been beaten. Captain Semmes steamed quite close to the Hatteras and asked if he had surrendered, then if he was in want of assistance. An affirmative answer was given to both questions. The boats of the Alabama were lowered with such promptitude and handled with such care that, though the Hatteras was sunk at night, none of her crew were drowned. When her captain came on board, Captain Semmes learned that he had been engaged with the United States steamer Hatteras, a larger ship than the Alabama by 100 tons, with an equal number of guns, and a crew numbering two less than that of the Alabama. There was a, quote, considerable disparity between the two ships in the weight of their pivot guns, and the Alabama ought to have won the fight, which she did in 13 minutes, end quote. The Alabama had received no appreciable injury, and continuing her cruise to the island of Jamaica, entered the harbor of Port Royal, where, by the permission of the authorities, Captain Semmes landed his prisoners, putting them on parole. As an answer to the stereotyped charges against Captain Semmes as a pirate and robber, I will select from the many unarmed ships captured by him one case. He had gone to the track of the California steamers between Aspinwall and New York in the hope of capturing a vessel homeward bound with government treasure. On the morning before such a vessel was expected, a large steamer, the Ariel, was seen, but unfortunately not going in the right direction. An exciting chase occurred, when she was finally brought to, but, instead of the million dollars in her safe, she was outward bound, with a large number of women and children on board. A boarding officer was sent on her, and returned, giving an account of great alarm, especially among the ladies. Captain Semmes sent a lieutenant on board to assure them that they had fallen into the hands of southern gentlemen, under whose protection they were entirely safe. Among the passengers were a battalion of marines and some army and navy officers. These were all paroled, rank and file numbering 140, and the vessel was released on ransom bond. Captain Semmes states that there were 500 passengers on board. It is fair to presume that each passenger had with him a purse of from three to five hundred dollars. Under the laws of war, all this money would have been good prize, but not one dollar of it was touched or indeed so much as a passenger's baggage examined. The Alabama now proceeded to run down the Spanish main, thence bore eastward into the Indian Ocean, and after a cruise into every sea where a blow at American commerce could be struck, came around the Cape of Good Hope, and, sailing north, ran up to the 30th parallel, where so many captures had been made at a former time. Of the ship at this date, Captain Semmes wrote, quote, the poor old Alabama was not now what she had been then. She was like the wearied foxhound, limping back after a long chase, footsore, and longing for quiet repose. End quote. She had, in her mission to cripple the enemy's commerce and cut his sinews of war, captured sixty-three vessels, 
Among them, one of the enemy's gunboats, the Hatteras, sunk in battle, had released nine under ransom bond, and had paroled all prisoners taken. All neutral ports being closed against her prizes, the rest of the vessels were, of necessity, burned at sea. Much complaint was made on account of the burning of these merchantmen, though very little reflection would have taught the complainants that the interests of the captor would have induced him to save the vessels and send them into the nearest port for condemnation as prizes, and therefore whatever grievance existed was the result of the blockade and of the rule which prevented the captures from being sent into a neutral port to await the decision of a prize court. On the morning of the 11th of June, 1864, the Alabama entered the harbor of Cherbourg. Quote, An officer was sent to call on the port admiral and ask leave to land the prisoners from the last two ships captured. This was readily granted. End quote. The next day, Captain Semmes went on shore to consult the port admiral in relation to docking and repairing the Alabama. As there were only government docks at Cherbourg, the application had to be referred to the emperor. Before an answer was received, the Kearsarge steamed into the harbor, sent a boat ashore, and then ran out and took her station off the breakwater. Captain Semmes learned that the boat from the Kearsarge sent on shore had borne a request that the prisoners discharged from the Alabama might be delivered to the Kearsarge. It will be remembered that the government of the United States, in many harsh and unjust phrases, had refused to recognize the Alabama as a ship of war, and held that the paroles given to her were void. This request was therefore regarded by Captain Semmes as an attempt to recruit for the Kearsarge from the prisoners lately landed by the Alabama, and he so presented the facts to the Port Admiral, who rejected the application from the Kearsarge. Captain Semmes sent notice to Captain Winslow of the Kearsarge, whose presence in the offing was regarded as a challenge, that, if he would wait until the Alabama could receive some coal on board, she would come out and give him battle. As has been shown by extracts previously made, Captain Semmes knew that, after his long cruise, the Alabama needed to go into dock for repairs. It had not been possible for him, on account of the rigid enforcement of neutrality, to replenish his ammunition. Unless the nitre is more thoroughly purified than is usually, if ever, done by those who manufacture for an open market, it is sure to retain nitrate of soda, and the powder, of which it is the important ingredient, to deteriorate by long exposure to a moist atmosphere. The Kearsarge was superior to the Alabama in size, and having in staunchness of construction, her armament was also greater, the latter being measured not by the number of guns, but by the amount of metal she could throw at a broadside. The crew of the Kearsarge, all told, was 162, that of the Alabama, 149. Captain Semmes says, quote, Still the disparity was not so great, but that I might hope to beat my enemy in a fair fight but he did not show me a fair fight. For, as it afterward turned out, his ship was ironclad, end quote. This expression, ironclad, refers to the fact that the Kearsarge had chains on her sides, which Captain Semmes describes as concealed by planking, the forward and after ends of which, so accorded with the lines of the ship, as not to be detected by telescopic observation. Many of that class of critics whose wisdom is only revealed after the event have blamed Captain Semmes for going out under the circumstances. Like most other questions, there are two sides to this. If he had gone into dock for repairs, the time required would have resulted in the dispersion of his crew, and from the known improvidence of sailors, it would have been more than doubtful whether they could have been reassembled. It was, moreover, probable that other vessels would have been sent to aid the Kearsarge in effectually blockading the port, so that, if his crew had returned, the only chance would have been to escape through the guarding fleet. Proud of his ship, and justly confiding in his crew, surely something will be conceded to the Confederate spirit so often exhibited, and so often triumphant, over disparity of force. On the 19th of June, 1864, the Alabama left the harbor of Cherbourg to engage the Kearsarge, which had been lying off and on the port for several days previously. Captain Semmes, in his report of the engagement, writes, quote, After the lapse of about one hour and ten minutes, our ship was ascertained to be in a sinking condition. To reach the French coast, I gave the ship all steam, 
and set such of the fore and aft sails as were available the ship filled so rapidly however that before we had made much progress the fires were extinguished i now hauled down my colors and dispatched a boat to inform the enemy of our condition although we were now but four hundred yards from each other the enemy fired upon me five times after my colors had been struck it is charitable to suppose that a ship of war of a christian nation could not have done this intentionally end quote. captain semmes states that his waste boats having been torn to pieces he sent the wounded and such of the boys of the ship as could not swim in his quarter boats off to the enemy's ship and as there was no appearance of any boat coming from the enemy the crew as previously instructed jumped overboard each to save himself if he could all the wounded twenty-one were saved ten of the crew were ascertained to have been drowned captain semmes stood on the quarter-deck until his ship was settling to go down then threw his sword into the sea there to lie buried with the ship he loved so well and leaped from the deck just in time to avoid being drawn down into the vortex created by her sinking he and many of his crew were picked up by a humane english gentleman in the boats of his yacht the deerhound others were saved by two french pilot boats which were near the scene the remainder it is hoped were picked up by the enemy captain semmes states in his official report two days after the battle that about the time of his rescue by the deerhound the kearsarge sent one and then tardily another boat the reader is invited to compare this with the conduct of captain semmes when he sank the hatteras and when though it was in the night by ranging up close to her and promptly using all his boats he saved her entire crew mention has been made of the defective ammunition of the alabama and in that connection i quote the following passage from captain semmes's book on which i have so frequently and largely drawn for facts in regard to the sumter and the alabama pages 761 and 762 quote, i lodged a rifle percussion shell near to her the kearsarge's stern post where there were no chains which failed to explode because of the defect of the cap if the cap had performed its duty and exploded the shell i should have been called upon to save captain winslow's crew from drowning instead of his being called upon to save mine end quote. as it appears by the same authority that the kearsarge had greater speed than the alabama it followed that though the captain of the kearsarge might have closed with and boarded the alabama the captain of the alabama could not board the kearsarge unless by consent the alabama built like a merchant ship sailed in peaceful garb from british waters on a far distant sea received her crew and armament fitted for operations against the enemy's commerce on blue water she was christened and in the same she was buried she lived the pride of her friends and the terror of her enemies she went out to fight a wooden vessel and was sunk by one clad in secret armor those rescued by the deerhound from the water were landed at southampton england the united states government then through its minister mr charles francis adams made the absurd demand of the english government that they should be delivered up to her as escaped prisoners to this demand lord john russell replied as follows quote, with regard to the demand made by you by instructions from your government that those officers and men should now be delivered up to the government of the united states as being escaped prisoners of war her majesty's government would beg to observe that there is no obligation by international law which can bind the government of a neutral state to deliver up to a belligerent prisoners of war who may have escaped from the power of such belligerent and may have taken refuge within the territory of such neutral therefore even if her majesty's government had any power by law to comply with the above-mentioned demand her majesty's government could not do so without being guilty of a violation of the duties of hospitality in point of fact however her majesty's government have no lawful power to arrest and deliver up the persons in question they have been guilty of no offence against the laws of england and they have committed no act which would bring them within the provisions of a treaty between great britain and the united states for the surrender of the offenders and her majesty's government are therefore entirely without any legal means by which even if they wished to do so they could comply with your above-mentioned demand end quote it will be observed that her majesty's minister mercifully forbore to expose the pretensions that 
the persons in question had been prisoners and confined his answer to the case as it would have been had that allegation been true there are other points in this transaction which will be elsewhere presented the arito which sailed from liverpool about the twenty third of march eighteen sixty two was while under construction at liverpool the subject of diplomatic correspondence and close scrutiny by the customs officers after her arrival off nassau upon representations by the united states consul at that port she was detained and again examined and it being found that she had none of the character of a vessel of war she was released captain maffet who had gone out with a cargo of cotton here received a letter which authorized him to take charge of the orito and get her promptly to sea she was a steamer of two hundred and fifty horsepower tonnage five hundred and sixty bark rigged speed under steam eight to nine knots with sail in a fresh breeze fourteen knots crew twenty-two all told the united states minister mr adams had made a report to the british government which it was apprehended would cause her seizure at once this was soon done and with great difficulty the vessel was saved to the confederacy by her commander she arrived at nassau on the twenty eighth of april and was detained until the session of the admiralty court in august as soon as discharged by the proceedings therein she sailed for the uninhabited island green cay ninety miles to the southward of providence island with a tender in tow having equipments provided by a confederate merchant where she anchored the next day and proceeded to take on board her military armament set out on the tender she now became a ship of the confederate navy and was christened florida her long detention in nassau had caused the ship to be infected with yellow fever and as she had no surgeon on board the vessel was directed to the island of cuba and ran into the harbor of cardenas for aid the crew was reduced to one fireman and two seamen and eventually the captain was prostrated by the fever the governor of cardenas under his view of the neutrality proclaimed by his government refused to send a physician aboard and warned the steamer that she must leave in twenty-four hours lieutenant stribling executive officer of the ship had been sent to havana to report her condition to the captain-general marshal serrano that chivalrous gentleman soldier and statesman at once invited the ship to the hospitalities of the harbor of havana whither she repaired and received the kindness which her forlorn situation required on the first of september eighteen sixty two the vessel left havana to obtain a crew and to complete her equipment which was so imperfect that her guns could not all be used the vessel was directed to the harbor of mobile on approaching that harbor she found several blockading vessels on the station and boldly ran through them escaping with considerable injury to her masts and rigging to the friendly shelter of fort morgan where while in quarantine lieutenant stribling was attacked with fever and died he was an officer of great merit and his loss was much regretted not only by his many personal friends but by all who foresaw the useful service he could render to his country if his life were prolonged under the disadvantages of being an infected ship and remote from the workshops repairs were commenced and the equipment of the ship completed in the meantime the blockading squadron had been increased with the boastful announcement that the cruiser should be hermetically sealed in the harbor of mobile some impatience was manifested after the vessel was ready for sea that she did not immediately go out but captain maffet with sound judgment and nautical skill decided to wait for a winter storm and a dark night before attempting to pass through the close investment when the opportunity offered he steamed out into a rough sea and a fierce north wind as he passed the blockading squadron he was for the first time discovered when a number of vessels gave chase and continued the pursuit throughout the night and the next day in the next evening all except the two fastest had hauled off and as night again closed in the smoke and canvas of the florida furnished their only guide captain maffet thus describes the ruse by which he finally escaped Quote, the canvas was secured in long neat bunts to the yards and the engines were stopped between high toppling seas clear daylight was necessary to enable them to distinguish our low hull in eager pursuit the federals swiftly passed us and we jubilantly bade the enemy good night and steer to the northward End quote. she was now fairly on the high seas 
and after long and vexatious delays entered on her mission to cruise against the enemy's commerce she commenced her captures in the gulf of mexico then progressed through the gulf of florida to the latitude of new york and thence to the equator continuing to twelve degrees south and returned again within thirty miles of new york when near cape st roque captain maffitt captured a baltimore brig the clarence and fitted her out as a tender he placed on her lieutenant c w reed commander fourteen men armed with muskets pistols and a twelve-pound howitzer the instructions were to proceed to the coast of america to cruise against the enemy's commerce under these orders he destroyed many federal vessels of him captain maffitt wrote quote, daring even beyond the point of martial prudence he entered the harbor of portland at midnight and captured the revenue cutter caleb cushing but instead of instantly burning her ran her out of the harbor being thus delayed he was soon captured by a federal expedition sent out against him end quote. while under the command of captain maffitt the florida with her tenders captured some fifty-five vessels many of which were of great value the florida being built of light timbers her very active cruising had so deranged her machinery that it was necessary to go into some friendly harbor for repairs captain maffitt says quote, i selected brest and the government courteously consenting to the florida having the facilities of the navy yard she was promptly docked end quote. the effects of the yellow fever from which he had suffered and the fatigue attending his subsequent service had so exhausted his strength that he asked to be relieved from command of the ship in compliance with this request captain c m morris was ordered to relieve him after completing all needful repairs captain morris proceeded to sea and sighted the coast of virginia where he made a number of important captures turning from that locality he crossed the equator destroying the commerce of the northern states on his route to bahia here he obtained coal and also had some repairs done to the engines when the united states steamship wachusett entered the harbor not knowing what act of treachery might be attempted by her commander on the first night after his arrival the florida was kept in a watchful condition for battle this belligerent demonstration in the peaceful harbor of a neutral power alarmed both the governor and the admiral who demanded assurances that the sovereignty of brazil and its neutrality should be strictly observed by both parties the pledge was given in the evening with the chivalric belief in the honor of the united states commander captain morris unfortunately permitted a majority of his officers to accompany him to the opera and also allowed two-thirds of the crew to visit the shore on leave about one o'clock in the morning the wachusett was surreptitiously got under way and her commander with utter abnegation of his word of honor ran into the florida discharging his battery and boarding her the few officers on board and small number of men were unable to resist this unexpected attack and the florida fell an easy prey to this covert and dishonorable assault she was towed to sea amid the execrations of the brazilian forces army and navy who completely taken by surprise fired a few ineffectual shots at the infringer upon the neutrality of the hospitable port of bahia the confederate was taken to hampton roads brazil instantly demanded her restoration intact to her late anchorage in bahia mr lincoln was confronted by a protest from the different representatives of the courts of europe denouncing this extraordinary breach of national neutrality which placed the government of the united states in a most unenviable position mr seward with his usual diplomatic insincerity and machiavellianism characteristically prevaricated while he plotted with the distinguished admiral as to the most adroit method of disposing of the elephant the result of these plottings was that an engineer was placed in charge of the stolen steamer with positive orders to quote, open her seacock at midnight and not to leave the engine room until the water was up to his chin as at sunrise the florida must be at the bottom end quote. the following note was sent to the brazilian charge d'affaires by mr seward quote, while awaiting the representations of the brazilian government on the twenty eighth of november she the florida sank owing to a leak which could not be seasonably stopped the leak was at first represented to have been caused or at least increased by a collision with a war transport orders were immediately given to ascertain the manner and circumstances of the occurrence 
it seemed to affect the army and navy a naval court of inquiry and also a military court of inquiry were charged with the investigation the naval court has submitted its report and a copy thereof is herewith communicated the military court is yet engaged so soon as its labors shall have ended the result will be made known to your government in the meantime it is assumed that the loss of the florida was in consequence of some unforeseen accident which casts no responsibility on the government of the united states Quote. The restitution of the ship having thus become impossible, the President expressed his regret that quote, the sovereignty of Brazil had been violated, dismissed the consul at Bahia who had advised the offense, and sent the commander of the Wachusett before a court martial. The commander of the Wachusett experienced no annoyance and was soon made an admiral. The Georgia was the next Confederate cruiser that Captain Bullock succeeded in sending forth. She was of 560 tons and fitted out on the coast of France. Her commander, W. L. Maury, Confederate States Navy, cruised in the North and South Atlantic with partial success. The capacity of the vessel in speed and other essentials was entirely inadequate to the service for which she was designed. She proceeded as far as the Cape of Good Hope and returned, after having captured seven ships and two barks. Then she was laid up and sold. The Shenandoah, once the Sea King, was purchased by Captain Bullock and placed under the command of Lieutenant Commanding J. J. Waddell, who fitted her for service under many difficulties at the barren island of Porto Santo near Madeira. After experiencing great annoyances through the activity of the American consul at Melbourne, Australia, Captain Waddell finally departed and commenced an active and effective cruise against American shipping in the Okhotak Sea and Arctic Ocean. In August 1865, hearing of the close of the war, he ceased his pursuit of United States commerce, sailed for Liverpool, England, and surrendered his ship to the English government, which transferred it to the government of the United States. The Shenandoah was a full-rigged ship of 800 tons, very fast under canvas. Her steam power was merely auxiliary. This was the last but not the first appearance of the Confederate flag in Great Britain. The first vessel of the Confederate government which unfurled it there was the swift light steamer Nashville, E.B. Pegram commander. Having been constructed as a passenger vessel and mainly with reference to speed and the light draft suited to the navigation of the southern harbors, she was quite too frail for war purposes and too slightly armed for combat. On her passage to Europe and back, she, nevertheless, destroyed two merchantmen. Nearing the harbor on her return voyage, she found it blockaded and a heavy vessel lying close on her track. Her daring commander headed directly for the vessel and ran so close under her guns that she was not suspected in her approach and had passed so far before the guns could be depressed to bear upon her that none of the shots took effect. Being little more than a shell, a single shot would have sunk her, and she was indebted to the address of her commander and the speed of his vessel for her escape. Wholly unsuited for naval warfare, this voyage terminated her career. A different class of vessels than those adapted to the open sea was employed for coastwise cruising. In the month of July 1864, a swift, twin-screw propeller called the Atlanta, of 600 tons burden, was purchased by the Secretary of the Navy and fitted out in the harbor of Wilmington, North Carolina, for a cruise against the commerce of the northern states. Commander J. Taylor Wood, an officer of extraordinary ability and enterprise, was ordered to command her, and her name was changed to the Tallahassee. This extemporaneous man-of-war ran safely through the blockade and soon lit up the New England coast with her captures, which consisted of two ships, four brigs, four barks, and twenty schooners. Great was the consternation among northern merchants. The construction of the Tallahassee exclusively for steam made her dependent on coal, her cruise was, of course, brief, but brilliant while it lasted. About the same time, another fast double-screw propeller of 585 tons, called the Edith, ran into Wilmington, North Carolina, and the Navy Department, requiring her services, bought her and gave to her the name of Chickamauga. A suitable battery was placed on board with officers and crew, and Commander John Wilkinson, a gentleman of consummate naval ability, was ordered to command her. When ready for sea, he ran the blockade under the bright rays of a full moon. 
strange to say, the usually alert sentinels neither hailed nor halted her. Like the Tallahassee, though partially rigged for sailing, she was exclusively dependent upon steam in the chase, escape, and in all important evolutions. She captured seven vessels, despite the above noticed defects. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 31. Naval Affairs Concluded. Excitement in the Northern States on the appearance of our cruisers. Failure of the enemy to protect their commerce. Appeal to Europe not to help the so-called pirates. Seeks iron-plated vessels in England. Statement of Lord Russell. What is the duty of neutrals? Position taken by President Washington. Letter of Mr. Jefferson. Contracts sought by United States government. Our cruisers went to sea unarmed. Mr. Adams asserts that British neutrality was violated. Reply of Lord Russell. Rejoinder of Mr. Seward. Duty of neutrals relative to warlike stores. Views of Wheaton. Of Kent. Charge of the Lord Chief Baron in the Alexandra case. Action of the Confederate government sustained. Antecedents of the United States government. The colonial commissions. Build and equip ships in Europe. Captain Conigam's captures, made prisoner, retaliation, numbers of captures, recognition of Greece, recognition of South American cruisers, chief act of hostility charged on Great Britain by the United States government, the Queen's proclamation, its effect, cause of the United States charges, never called us belligerents, why not, adopts a fiction, the reason, why denounce our cruisers as pirates? Opinion of Justice Greer. Burning of prizes. Laws of maritime war. Cause of the Geneva Conference. Statement of American claims. Allowance. Indirect damages of our cruisers. Ships transferred to British registers. Decline of American tonnage. Decline of export of breadstuffs. Advance of insurance. The excitement produced in the northern states by the effective operations of our cruisers upon their commerce was such as to receive the attention of the United States government. Reasonably, it might have been expected that they would send their ships of war out on the high seas to protect their commerce by capturing or driving off our light cruisers. But, instead of this, their fleets were employed in blockading the Confederate ports, or watching those in the West Indies from which blockade runners were expected to sail, and, by capturing which, either on the high seas or at the entrance of a confederate port a harvest of prizes might be secured for this dereliction of duty in the failure to protect commerce no better reason offers itself than greed and malignity there was however in this connection a more humiliating feature in the conduct of the united states government while from its state department the confederacy was denounced as an insurrection soon to be suppressed and the cruisers regularly commissioned by the confederate states were called pirates diplomatic demands were made upon great britain to prevent the so-called pirates from violating international law as if it applied to pirates appeals to that government were also made to prevent the sale of the materials of war to the confederacy and thus indirectly to aid the united states in performing what according to the representation was a police duty to suppress a combination of some evil disposed persons gallantly claiming that they, armed cap a pie, should meet their adversary in the list, he to be without helmet, shield, or lance. To one who, from youth to age, had seen, with exultant pride, the flag of his country as it unfolded, disclosing to view the stripes recordant of the original size of the family of states, and the constellation which told of that family's growth, it could but be deeply mortifying to witness such paltry exhibition of deception and unmanliness in the representatives of a government around which fond memories still linger, despite the perversion of which it was the subject. 
if this attempt on the part of the united states to deny the existence of war after having by proclamation of blockade compelled all nations to take notice that war did exist and to claim that munitions should not be sold to a country because there were some disorderly people in it had been all the attempt would have been ludicrously absurd and the contradiction too bald to require refutation but this would have been but half of the story subsequently the united states government claimed reclamation from great britain for damage inflicted by vessels which had been built in her ports and which had elsewhere been armed and equipped for purposes of war international law recognizes the right of a neutral to sell an unarmed vessel without reference to the use to which the purchaser might subsequently apply it the united states government had certainly not practiced under a different rule but had gone even further than this so much further as to transgress the prohibition against armed vessels it has already been stated that the government of the united states at the commencement of the war sought to contract for the construction of iron-plated vessels in the ports of england which were to be delivered fully armed and equipped to her to this it may be added that her armies were recruited from almost all the countries of europe down almost to the last month of the war a portion of their arms were of foreign manufacture as well as the munitions of war a large number of the sailors of her fleets came from the seaports of great britain and germany in a word whatever could be of service to her in the conflict was unhesitatingly sought among neutrals regardless of the law of nations at the same time an effort was made on her part to make great britain responsible for the damage done by our cruisers and for the warlike stores sold to our government some statements of lord russell on this point in a letter to minister adams dated december nineteenth eighteen sixty two deserve notice he says quote, it is right however to observe that the party which has profited by far the most by these unjustifiable practices has been the government of the united states because that government having a superiority of force by sea and having blockaded most of the confederate ports has been able on the one hand safely to receive all the warlike supplies which it has induced british manufacturers and merchants to send to the united states ports in violation of the queen's proclamation and on the other hand to intercept and capture a great part of the supplies of the same kind which were destined from this country to the confederate states if it be sought to make her majesty's government responsible to that of the united states because arms and munitions of war have left this country on account of the confederate government the confederate government as the other belligerent may very well maintain that it has a just cause of complaint against the british government because the united states arsenals have been replenished from british sources nor would it be possible to deny that in defiance of the queen's proclamation many subjects of her majesty owing allegiance to her crown have enlisted in the armies of the united states of this fact you cannot be ignorant her majesty's government therefore has just ground for complaint against both of the belligerent parties but most especially against the government of the united states for having systemically and in disregard of the comity of nations which it was their duty to observe induced subjects of her majesty to violate those orders which in conformity with her neutral position she has enjoined all her subjects to obey end quote. perhaps it may be well to inquire what is under international law the duty of neutral nations with regard to the construction and equipment of cruisers for either belligerent and the supply of warlike stores thus the groundlessness of the claims put forth by the government of the united states for damages to be paid by great britain will be more manifest and the lawfulness of the acts of the confederate government demonstrated after the outbreak of the french revolution in seventeen eighty nine the government of france owing to the temporary inferiority of her naval force openly and deliberately equipped privateers in our ports these privateers captured british vessels in united states waters and brought them as prizes into united states ports these facts formed the basis of demands made upon the united states by the british plenipotentiary the demands had reference not to the accidental evasion of a municipal law of the united states by a particular ship but to a systematic disregard of international law upon some of the most important points of neutral obligation to these demands mr jefferson then secretary of state under president washington thus replied on september third seventeen ninety three 
we are bound by our treaties with three of the belligerent nations by all the means in our power to protect and defend their vessels and effects in our ports or waters or on the seas near our shores and to recover and restore the same to the right owners when taken from them if all the means in our power are used and fail in this effort we are not bound by our treaties with those nations to make compensation though we have no similar treaty with great britain it was the opinion of the president that we should use toward that nation the same rule which under this article was to govern us with other nations and even to extend it to the captures made on the high seas and brought into our ports if done by vessels which had been armed within them end quote. It will be observed that the justice of restitution or compensation for captures made on the high seas and brought into our ports is only admitted by President Washington upon one condition, which is expressed in these words, if done by vessels which had been armed within them. The terms of the contract, which the government of the United States endeavored to make at the shipyards of England, were for the delivery of the ship or ships of war to be finished complete with guns and everything appertaining. The contract was not taken, as too little time was allowed for its execution. But if entered into and executed, it would have been a direct violation of international law. In the instance of our cruisers built in the ports of England, it will be observed that they went to sea without arms or warlike stores. And, at other ports than those of Great Britain, they were converted into ships of war and put into commission by the authority of the Confederate government. The government of the United States asserted that they were built in the ports of Great Britain, and thereby her duty of neutrality was violated, and the government made responsible for the damages sustained by private citizens of the United States in consequence of her captures on the seas. To this declaration of Mr. Adams, Earl Russell, he had been made an earl, replied on September 14, 1863, thus, quote, when the United States government assumes to hold the government of Great Britain responsible for the captures made by vessels which may be fitted out as vessels of war in a foreign port, because such vessels were originally built in a British port, I have to observe that such pretensions are entirely at variance with the principles of international law and with the decisions of American courts of the highest authority. And I have only, in conclusion, to express my hope that you may not be instructed again to put forward claims which Her Majesty's Government cannot admit to be founded on any grounds of law or justice. End quote. On October the 6th, 1863, Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State of the United States Government, replied to this declaration of Earl Russell, saying, quote, The United States do insist, and must continue to insist, that the British government is justly responsible for the damages which the peaceful, law-abiding citizens of the United States sustain by the depredations of the Alabama. End quote. Earl Russell answered on October 26, 1863, thus, quote, I must request you to believe that the principle contended for by Her Majesty's government is not that of commissioning, equipping, and manning vessels in our ports to cruise against either of the belligerent parties a principle which was so justly and unequivocally condemned by the President of the United States in 1793. But the British government must decline to be responsible for the acts of parties who fit out a seeming merchant ship, send her to a port or to waters far from the jurisdiction of British courts, and there commission, equip, and man her as a vessel of war. End quote. The duty of neutral nations relative to the supply of warlike stores is expressed in these words. Quote, it is not the practice of nations to undertake to prohibit their own subjects by previous laws from trafficking in articles contraband of war. Such trade is carried on at the risk of those engaged in it under the liabilities and penalties prescribed by the law of nations or particular treaties. End quote. We now quote from the great American commentator on the Constitution of the United States and on the law of nations. Quote, it is a general understanding that the powers at war may seize and confiscate all contraband goods without any complaint on the part of the neutral merchant and without any imputation of a breach of neutrality in the neutral sovereign himself. It was contended on the part of the French nation in 1796 that neutral governments were bound to restrain their subjects from selling or exporting articles contraband of war to the belligerent powers but it was successfully shown on the part of the United States that neutrals may lawfully sell at home to a belligerent power, or carry themselves to the belligerent powers contraband articles, 
subject to the right of seizure in transitu. This right has been explicitly declared by the judicial authorities of this country, United States. The right of the neutral to transport and of the hostile power to seize are conflicting rights, and neither party can charge the other with a criminal act. End quote. In accordance with these principles, President Pierce's message of December 31, 1855, contains the following passage. Quote, in pursuance of this policy, the laws of the United States do not forbid their citizens to sell to either of the belligerent powers articles contraband of war, to take munitions of war or soldiers on board their private ships for transportation, and, although in so doing, the individual citizen exposes his property or person to some of the hazards of war, his acts do not involve any breach of international neutrality, nor of themselves implicate the government. End quote. Perhaps it may not be out of place here to notice the charge of the Lord Chief Baron of the Exchequer to the jury in the case of the Alexandra, a vessel of 120 tons, under construction at Liverpool for our government. The case came on for trial on June 22, 1863, in the Court of Exchequer, sitting at Nisai Prize, before the Lord Chief Baron and a special jury. After it had been summed up, the Lord Chief Baron said, quote, this is an information on the part of the Crown for the seizure and confiscation of a vessel that was in the course of preparation but had not been completed. It is admitted that it was not armed, and the question is whether the preparation of the vessel in its then condition was a violation of the Foreign Enlistment Act. The main question you will have to decide is this, whether, under the seventh section of the Act of Parliament, the vessel, as then prepared at the time of seizure, was liable to seizure. The statute was passed in 1819, and upon it no question has ever arisen in our courts of justice. But there have been expositions of a similar statute which exists in the United States. I will now read to you the opinions of some American lawyers who have contributed so greatly to make law a science. His lordship then read a passage from Story and others. These gentlemen are authorities which show that, when two belligerents are carrying on a war, a neutral power may supply without any breach of international law, and without a breach of the Foreign Enlistment Act, munitions of war, gunpowder, every description of arms, in fact, that can be used for the destruction of human beings. Why should ships be an exception? I am of opinion, in point of law, they are not. The Foreign Enlistment Act was an act to prevent the enlistment or engagement of His Majesty's subjects to serve in foreign armies, and to prevent the fitting out and equipping in His Majesty's dominions vessels for warlike purposes without his majesty's license the title of an act is not at all times an exact indication or explanation of the act because it is generally attached after the act is passed but in averting to the preamble of the act i find that provision is made against the equipping fitting out furnishing and arming of vessels because it may be prejudicial to the peace of his majesty's dominions the question i shall put to you is whether you think that vessel was merely in a course of building to be delivered in pursuance of a contract that was perfectly lawful, or whether there was any intention in the port of Liverpool, or any other English port, that the vessel should be fitted out, equipped, furnished, and armed for purposes of aggression. Now surely if Birmingham, or any other town, may supply any quantity of munitions of war of various kinds for the destruction of life, why object to ships? why should ships alone be in themselves contraband i asked the attorney general if a man could not make a vessel intending to sell it to either of the belligerent powers that required it and which would give the largest price for it would not that be lawful to my surprise the learned attorney general declined to give an answer to the question which i think a grave and pertinent one but you gentlemen i think are lawyers enough to know that a man may make a vessel and offer it for sale if a man may build a vessel for the purpose of offering it for sale to either belligerent party, may he not execute an order for it? That appears to be a matter of course. The statute is not made to provide means of protection for belligerent powers, otherwise it would have said, You shall not sell powder or guns, and you shall not sell arms, and, if it had done so, all Birmingham would have been in arms against it. The object of the statute was this that we should not have our ports in this country made the ground of hostile movements between the vessels of two belligerent powers, which might be fitted out, furnished, and armed in these ports. 
the alexandra was clearly nothing more than in the course of building it appears to me that if true that the alabama sailed from liverpool without any arms at all as a mere ship in ballast and that her armament was put on board at tercera which is not in her majesty's dominions then the foreign enlistment act was not violated at all end quote. after reading some of the evidence his lordship said quote, if you think that the object was to furnish fit out equip and arm that vessel at liverpool that is a different matter but if you think the object really was to build a ship in obedience to an order in compliance with a contract leaving those who bought it to make what use they thought fit of it then it appears to me that the foreign enlistment act has not been broken end quote. the jury immediately returned a verdict for the defendants an appeal was made but the full bench decided that there was no jurisdiction against this decision an appeal was taken to the house of lords and there dismissed on some technical ground sufficient has been said to show that the action of the confederate government relative to these cruisers is sustained and justified by international law the complaints made by the government of the united states against the government of great britain for acts involving a breach of neutrality find no support in the letter of the law or in its principles and were conclusively answered by the interpretations of american jurists at the same time they are condemned by the antecedent acts of the united states government some of these will be presented in the war of the american revolution dr franklin and silas dean were sent to france as commissioners to look after the interests of the colonies in the years seventeen seventy six and seventeen seventy seven they became extensively connected with naval movements they built and purchased and equipped and commissioned ships all in neutral territory even filling up blank commissions sent out to them by the congress for the purpose among expeditions fitted out by them was one under captain wicks to intercept a convoy of linen ships from ireland he went first into the bay of biscay and afterward entirely around ireland sweeping the sea before him of everything that was not of force to render the attack hopeless mr dean observes to robert morris that it quote, effectually alarmed england prevented the great fair at chester occasioned insurance to rise and even deterred the english merchants from shipping in english bottoms at any rate so that in a few weeks forty sail of french ships were loading in the thames on freight an instance never before known in the spring of seventeen seventy seven the commissioner sent an agent to dover who purchased a fine fast-sailing english-built cutter which was taken across to dunkirk there she was privately equipped as a cruiser and put in command of captain gustavus cunningham who was appointed by filling up a blank commission from john hancock the president of congress this commission bore date march first seventeen seventy seven and fully entitled mr cunningham to the rank of captain in the navy his vessel although built in england like many of our cruisers was not armed or equipped there nor was his crew enlisted there but in the port of a neutral this vessel was finally seized under some treaty obligations between france and england the commissioners immediately fitted out another cruiser and still another it was also affirmed that the money advanced to mr john adams for travelling expenses when he arrived in spain a year or two later was derived from the prizes of these vessels which had been sent into the ports of spain captain cunningham was a very successful commander but he was made a prisoner in seventeen seventy nine the matter was brought before Congress in July of the same year, and a committee reported that this, quote, late commander of an armed vessel in the service of the States, and taken on board of a private armed cutter, had been treated in a manner contrary to the dictates of humanity, and the practice of Christian civilized nations, end quote. Whereupon it was resolved to demand of the British Admiral in New York that good and sufficient reason be given for this conduct, or that he be immediately released from his rigorous and ignominious confinement if a satisfactory answer was not received by august first so many persons as were deemed proper were ordered to be confined in safe and close custody to abide the fate of the said gustavus cunningham no answer having been received one christopher hale was thus confined in december he petitioned congress for an exchange and that he might procure a person in his room Congress replied that his petition could not be granted until Captain Cunningham was released, as it had been determined that he must abide the fate of that officer. Cunningham was subsequently released. The whole number of captures made by the United States in this contest is not known, 
but six hundred and fifty prizes are said to have been brought into port. Many others were ransomed, and some were burned at sea. Prescribed limits will not permit me to follow out in detail the past history of the United States as a neutral power. It must suffice to recall the memory of readers to a few significant facts in our more recent history. The recognition of the independence of Greece in her struggle with Turkey, and the voluntary contributions of money and men sent to her. The recognition of the independence of the Spanish provinces of South America, and the war vessels equipped and sent from the ports of the United States to Brazil during the struggle with Spain for independence the ships sold to russia during her war with england france and turkey the arms and munitions of war manufactured at new haven connecticut and providence rhode island sold and shipped to turkey to aid her in her late struggle with russia the reader will observe the promptitude with which the governments of the united states not only accorded belligerent rights but even more recognized the independence of nations struggling for deliverance from oppressive rulers the instances of Greece and the South American republics are well known, and that of Texas must be familiar to everyone. One could scarcely believe, therefore, that the chief act of hostility, or rather the great crime of the government of Great Britain, in the eyes of the government of the United States, was the recognition by the latter of the Confederate States as a belligerent power, and that a state of war existed between them and the United States. This was the constantly repeated charge against the British government in the dispatches of the United States government from the commencement of the war down nearly to the session of the Geneva Conference in 1872. In the correspondence of the Secretary in 1867, he says, quote, What is alleged on the part of the United States is that the Queen's proclamation, which, by conceding belligerent rights to the insurgents, lifted them up for the purpose of insurrection to an equality with the nation which they were attempting to overthrow was premature because it was unnecessary and that it was in its operation unfriendly because it was premature End quote. again he says and if sincerely shows himself to be utterly ignorant of the real condition of our affairs quote, before the queen's proclamation of neutrality the disturbance in the united states was merely a local insurrection it wanted the name of war to enable it to be a civil war and to live, endowed as such, with maritime and other belligerent rights. Without the authorized name, it might die, and was expected not to live and be a flagrant civil war, but to perish a mere insurrection. End quote. The first extract in itself contains a fiction. If the Queen's proclamation possessed such force as to raise the Confederate States to an equality with the United States as a belligerent, Perhaps another proclamation of the Queen might have possessed such force, if it had been issued, as to have lifted the Confederate States from the state of equality to one of independence. This is a novel virtue to be ascribed to a Queen's proclamation. This idea must have been borrowed from our neighbors of Mexico, where a pronunciamento dissolves one and establishes a rival administration. How much more rational it would have been to say that the resources and the military power of the Confederate States place them, at the outset, on the footing of a belligerent, and the Queen's proclamation only declared a fact which the announcement of a blockade of the southern ports by the government of the United States had made manifest, blockade being a means only applicable as against a foreign foe. Nevertheless, the government of the United States, although refusing to concede belligerent rights to the Confederate States, was very ready to take advantage of such concession by other nations, whenever an opportunity offered. The voluminous correspondence of the Secretary of State of the United States Government relative to the Confederate cruisers and their so-called depredations was filled with charges of violations of international law, which could be committed only by a belligerent, and which, it was alleged, had been allowed to be done in the ports of Great Britain. On this foundation was based the subsequent claim for damages advanced by the Government of the United States against that of Great Britain, and for the pretended lack of due diligence in watching the actions of this confederate belligerent in her ports she was mulcted in a heavy sum by the geneva conference and paid it to the government of the united states it is a remarkable fact that the government of the united states in no one instance from the opening to the close of the war formally spoke of the confederate government or states as belligerents although on many occasions it acted with the latter as a belligerent yet no official designations were ever given to them or their citizens but those of insurgents or insurrectionists. Perhaps there may be something in the signification of the words which, 
combined with existing circumstances, would express a state of affairs that the authorities of the government of the United States were in no degree willing to admit, and vainly sought to prevent from becoming manifest to the world. The party or individuality against which the government of the United States was conducting hostilities consisted of the people within the limits of the Confederate States. Was it against them as individuals in an unorganized condition or as organized political communities? In the former condition, they might be a mob. In the latter condition, they formed a state. By the actions of unorganized masses may arise insurrections, and by the actions of organized people or states arise wars. The government of the United States adopted a fiction when it declared that the execution of the laws in certain states was impeded by insurrection. The persons whom it designated as insurrectionists were the organized people of the states. The ballot boxes used at the elections were state boxes. The judges who presided at the elections were state functionaries. The returns of the elections were made to the state officers. The oaths of office of those elected were administered by state authority. They assembled in the legislative chambers of the states. The results of their deliberations were directory to the state, judicial, and executive officers, and by them put in operation. Is it not evident that, only by a fiction of speech, such proceedings can be called an insurrection? Why, then, did an intelligent and powerful government, like that of the United States, so outrage the understanding of mankind as to adopt a fiction on which to base the authority and justification of its hostile action. The United States government is the result of a compact between the states, a written constitution. It owes its existence simply to a delegation of certain powers by the respective states, which it is authorized to exercise for their common welfare. One of these powers is to suppress insurrections. But there is no power delegated to subjugate states, the authors of its existence, or to make war on any of the states. If, then, without any delegated power or lawful authority for its proceedings, the government of the United States commenced a war upon some of the states of the Union, how could it expect to be justified before the world? It became the aggressor, the Attila of the American continent. Its action inflicted a wound on the principles of constitutional liberty, a crushing blow to the hopes that men had begun to repose in this latest effort for self-government which its friends should never forgive nor ever forget. To palliate the enormity of such an offense, its authors resorted to a vehement denial that their hostile action was a war upon the states, and persistently asserted the fiction that their immense armies and fleets were merely a police authority to put down insurrection. They hoped to conceal from the observation of the American people that the contest on the part of the central government was for empire, for its absolute supremacy over the state governments that the Constitution was roiled up and laid away among the old archives, and that the conditions of their liberty in the future were to be decided by the sword or by national control of the ballot box. With like disregard for truth, our cruisers were denounced as pirates by the government of the United States. A pirate or armed piratical vessel is by the law of nations the enemy of mankind and can be destroyed by the ships of any nation. The distinction between a lawful cruiser and a pirate is that the former has behind it a government which is recognized by civilized nations as entitled to the rights of war, and from which the commander of the cruiser receives his commission or authority. But the pirate recognizes no government, and is not recognized by any one. As the Attorney General of Great Britain said in the Alexandra case, quote, Although a recognition of the Confederates as an independent power was out of the question, yet it was right they should be admitted by other nations within the circle of lawful belligerents, that is to say, that their forces should not be treated as pirates, nor their flag as a piratical flag. Therefore, as far as the two belligerents were concerned, on the part of this and other governments, they were so far put on a level that each was to be considered as entitled to the right of belligerents, the southern states as much as the other." End quote. The government of the United States well knew that, after the issue of the Queen's proclamation recognizing our government, the application of the word pirate to our cruisers was simply an exhibition of vindictive passion on its part. A de facto government, by its commission, legalizes among nations a cruiser. That there was such a government, even its own courts also decided. In a prize case, to Black 635, 
Justice Greer delivered the opinion of the Supreme Court, saying, quote, It, the war, is not less a civil war, with belligerent parties in hostile array, because it may be called an insurrection by one side, and the insurgents be considered as rebels and traitors. It is not necessary that the independence of the revolted province or state be acknowledged in order to constitute it a party belligerent in a war, according to the laws of nations. Foreign nations acknowledge it a war by a declaration of neutrality. The condition of neutrality cannot exist unless there be two belligerent parties. End quote. In the case of Santissima Trinidad, 7 Wheaton, 337, the United States Supreme Court says, quote, The government of the United States has recognized the existence of a civil war between Spain and her colonies, and has avowed her determination to remain neutral between the parties. Each party is therefore deemed by us a belligerent, having, so far as concerns us, the sovereign rights of war. End quote. The belligerent character of the Confederate States was thus fully acknowledged by the highest judicial tribunal of the United States. This involved an acknowledgment of the Confederate government as a government de facto having the sovereign rights of war, yet the executive department of the United States government, with reckless malignity, denounced our cruisers as pirates our citizens as insurgents and traitors, and the action of our government as an insurrection. It has been stated that during the war of the colonies with Great Britain, many of the prizes of the colonial cruisers were destroyed. This was done by Paul Jones and other commanders, although during the entire period of the war some of the colonial ports were open, into which prizes could be taken. In that war Great Britain did not attempt to blockade all the ports of the colonies. Sailing vessels only were then known, and with these a stringent blockade at all seasons could not have been maintained. But, at the later day of our war, the powerful steamship had appeared, and revolutionized the commerce and the navies of the world. During the first months of the war, all the principal ports of the Confederacy were blockaded, and finally every inlet was either in possession of the enemy or had one or more vessels watching it. The steamers were independent of wind and weather and could hold their positions before a port day and night. At the same time, the ports of neutrals had been closed against the prizes of our cruisers by proclamations and orders in council. Says Admiral Semmes, quote, During my whole career upon the sea, I had not so much as a single port open to me into which I could send a prize. End quote. Our prizes had been sent into ports of Cuba and Venezuela under the hope that they might gain admittance but they were either handed over to the enemy under some fraudulent pretext, or expelled. Thus, by the action of the different nations, and by the blockade with steamers, no course was left to us but to destroy the prizes, as was done in many instances under the government of the United States Confederation. The laws of maritime war are well known. The enemy's vessel, when captured, becomes the property of the captor, which he may immediately destroy. Or he may take the vessel into port, have it adjudicated by an admiralty court as a lawful prize, and sold. That adjudication is the basis of title to the purchaser against all former owners. In these cases, the captor sends his prizes to a port of his own country, or to a friendly port for adjudication. But if the ports of his own country are under blockade by his enemy, and the recapture of the prizes, if sent there, most probable, and if, at the same time, all friendly ports are closed against the entrance of his prizes, then there remains no alternative but to destroy the prizes by sinking or burning. Courts of admiralty are established for neutrals, not for the enemy, who has no right of appearance before them. If, therefore, any neutral suffer during our war for want of adjudication, the fault is with their own government, and not with our cruisers. Many other objections were advanced by the United States government as evidence that we committed a breach of international law with our cruisers, but their principles are embraced in the preceding remarks, or they were too frivolous to deserve notice. Suffice it to say that, if the Confederate government had been successful in taking to sea every vessel which it built, it would have swept from the oceans the commerce of the United States, would have raised the blockade of at least some of our ports, and, if by such aid our independence had been secured, there is little probability that such complaints as have been noticed would have received attention, if, indeed, they would have been uttered. In January 1871, 
the British government proposed to the government of the United States that a joint commission should be convened to adjust certain differences between the two nations relative to the fisheries, the Canadian boundary, etc. To this proposition, the latter acceded, on condition that the so-called Alabama claims should also be considered. To this condition, Great Britain assented. In the convention, the American commissioners proposed an arbitration of these claims. The British commissioners replied that Her Majesty's government could not admit that Great Britain had failed to discharge toward the United States the duties imposed on her by the rules of international law, or that she was justly liable to make good to the United States the losses occasioned by the acts of the cruisers to which the American commissioners referred. Without following the details, it may be summarily stated that the Geneva Conference ensued. That decided that, quote, England should have fulfilled her duties as a neutral by the exercise of a diligence equal to the gravity of the danger, and that the circumstances were of a nature to call for the exercise, on the part of Her Britannic Majesty's Government, of all possible solicitude for the observance of the rights and duties involved in the proclamation of neutrality issued by Her Majesty on May 18, 1861. End quote. The conference also added, quote, It cannot be denied that there were moments when its watchfulness seemed to fail and when feebleness in certain branches of the public service resulted in great detriment to the United States. End quote. The claims presented to the conference for damages done by our several cruisers were as follows. The Alabama, $7,050,293.76. The Boston, $400. The Chickamauga, $183,070.73. The Florida, four million fifty seven thousand nine hundred thirty four dollars sixty nine cents the clarence tender of the florida sixty six thousand seven hundred thirty six dollars ten cents the tacony tender of the florida one hundred sixty nine thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars eighty one cents the georgia four hundred thirty one thousand one hundred sixty dollars seventy two cents the jefferson davis seven thousand seven hundred fifty two dollars the Nashville, $108,433.95. The Retribution, $29,018.53. The Sally, $5,540. The Shenandoah, $6,656,838.81. The Sumter, $179,697.67. The Tallahassee, eight hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred forty one dollars eighty three cents total nineteen million seven hundred eighty two thousand nine hundred seventeen dollars sixty cents miscellaneous four hundred seventy nine thousand thirty three dollars increased insurance six million one hundred forty six thousand two hundred nineteen dollars seventy one cents aggregate twenty six million four hundred eight thousand one hundred seventy dollars thirty one cents the conference rejected the claims against the Boston, the Jefferson Davis, and the Sally, and awarded to the United States government $15,500,000 in gold. But the indirect damages upon the commerce of the United States produced by these cruisers were far beyond the amount of the claims presented to the Geneva Conference. The number of ships owned in the United States at the commencement of the war, which were subsequently transferred to foreign owners by a British register, was 715 and the amount of their tonnage was 480,882 tons. Such are the laws of the United States that not one of them has been allowed to resume an American register. In the year 1860, nearly 70% of the foreign commerce of the country was carried on in American ships, but, in consequence of the danger of capture by our cruisers to which these ships were exposed, the amount of this commerce carried by them had dwindled down in 1864. To 46 percent. It continued to decline after the war, and in 1872 it had fallen to 28 and a half percent. Before the war, the amount of American tonnage was second only to that of Great Britain, and we were competing with her for the first place. At that time, the tonnage of the coasting trade, which had grown from insignificance, was 1,735,863 tons. Three years later, in 1864, it had declined to about 867,931 tons. The damage to the articles of export is illustrated by the decline in breadstuffs exported from the northern states. In the last four months of each of the following years, 
the value of this export was as follows. 1861, forty two million five hundred thousand dollars. 1862, twenty seven million eight hundred forty two thousand ninety dollars. 1863, eight million nine hundred nine thousand forty three dollars. 1864, one million eight hundred fifty thousand eight hundred nineteen dollars. Some of this decline resulted from good crops in England, but, in other respects, it was a consequence of causes growing out of the war. The increase in the rates of marine insurance, in consequence of the danger of capture by the cruisers, was variable, but the gross amount so paid was presented as a claim to the conference, as given above. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 32. Attempts of the United States Government to Overthrow States. Military Governor of Tennessee appointed. Object. Arrests and imprisonments. Measures attempted. Oath required of voters. A convention to amend the state constitution. Results. Attempt in Louisiana. Martial law. Barbarities inflicted. Invitation of plantations. Order of General Butler, number 28. Execution of Mumford. Judicial system set up. Civil affairs to be administered by military authority. Order of President Lincoln for a provisional court. A military court sustained by the army. Words of the Constitution. Necessity, the reason given for the power to create the court. This doctrine fatal to the Constitution involves its subversion. Cause of our withdrawal from the Union. Fundamental principles unchanged by force. The contest is not over. The strife not ended. When the war closed, who were the victors? Let the verdict of mankind decide. On the capture of Nashville on February 25, 1862, Andrew Johnson was made military governor of Tennessee with the rank of brigadier general and immediately entered on the duties of his office. This step was taken by the President of the United States under the pretense of executing that provision of the Constitution, which is in these words, quote, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. End quote. The administration was conducted according to the will and pleasure of the governor, which was the supreme law. Public officers were required to take an oath of allegiance to the United States government, and upon refusal were expelled from office. Newspaper offices were closed and their publication suppressed. Subsequently, the offices were sold out under the provisions of the Confiscation Act. All persons using treasonable and seditious language were arrested and required to take the oath of allegiance to the government of the United States and give bonds for the future or to go into exile. Clergymen, upon their refusal to take the oath, were confined in the prisons until they could be sent away. School teachers and editors and finally large numbers of private citizens were arrested and held until they took the oath. Conflicts became frequent in the adjacent country murders and the violent destruction of property ensued on october twenty first eighteen sixty two an order for an election of members of the united states congress in the ninth and tenth state districts was issued every voter was required to give satisfactory evidence of loyalty to the northern government two persons were chosen and admitted to seats in that body that portion of the state in the possession of the forces of the united states continued without change under the authority of the military governor until the beginning of 1864. Measures were then commenced by the governor for an organization of a state government in sympathy with the government of the United States. These measures were subsequently known as the Process for State Reconstruction. The governor issued his proclamation for an election of county officers on March 5th, to be held in the various counties of the state whenever it was practicable. It is not expected, says the governor, that the enemies of the United States will propose to vote nor is it intended that they be permitted to vote or hold office. In addition to the possession of the usual qualifications, the voter was required to take the following oath. Quote, 
I solemnly swear that I will henceforth support the Constitution of the United States and defend it against the assaults of all its enemies, that I will hereafter be, and conduct myself as, a true and faithful citizen of the United States, freely and voluntarily claiming to be subject to all the duties and obligations, and entitled to all the rights and privileges of such citizenship, that I ardently desire the suppression of the present insurrection and rebellion against the government of the United States, the success of its armies, and the defeat of all those who oppose them, and that the Constitution of the United States, and all laws and proclamations made in pursuance thereof, may be speedily and permanently established and enforced over all the people, states, and territories thereof, and, further, that I will hereafter aid and assist all loyal people in the accomplishment of these results. Thus to invoke the Constitution was like Satan quoting Scripture. The election was a failure, and all further efforts at Reconstruction were for a time suspended. An attempt was made at the end of 1864 to obtain a so-called convention to amend the state constitution, and a body was assembled which, without any regular authority, adopted amendments. These were submitted to the voters on February 22, 1865, and declared to be ratified by a vote of 25,000 in a state where the vote, in 1860, was 145,000. Slavery was abolished, other changes made, so-called state officers elected, and this body of voters was proclaimed as a reconstructed state of Tennessee, and one of the United States. Such was the method adopted in Tennessee to execute the provision of the Constitution, which says, quote, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government, end quote. The next attempt to guarantee a republican form of government to a state was commenced in Louisiana by the military occupation of New Orleans on May 1, 1862. The United States forces were under the command of Major General Benjamin F. Butler. Martial law was declared, and Brigadier General George F. Shepley was appointed military governor of the state. It is unnecessary to relate in detail the hostile actions which were committed, as they had no resemblance to such warfare as is alone permissible by the rules of international law or the usages of civilization. Some examples taken from contemporaneous publications of temperate tone will suffice. Peaceful and aged citizens, unresisting captives, and noncombatants were confined at hard labor with chains attached to their limbs and held in dungeons and fortresses. Others were subjected to a like degrading punishment for selling medicine to the sick soldiers of the Confederacy. The soldiers of the invading force were incited and encouraged by general orders to insult and outrage the wives and mothers and sisters of the citizens, and helpless women were torn from their homes and subjected to solitary confinement, some in fortresses and prisons, and one especially on an island of barren sand under a tropical sun, and were fed with loathsome rations and exposed to vile insults. Prisoners of war, who surrendered to the naval forces of the United States on the agreement that they should be released on parole, were seized and kept in close confinement. Repeated pretexts were sought or invented for plundering the inhabitants of the captured city, by fines levied and collected under threat of imprisonment at hard labor with ball and chain. The entire population were forced to elect between starvation by the confiscation of all their property and taking an oath against their conscience to bear allegiance to the invader. Egress from the city was refused to those whose fortitude stood the test, and even to lone and aged women, and to helpless children, and after being ejected from their houses and robbed of their property, they were left to starve in the streets or subsist on charity. The slaves were driven from the plantations in the neighborhood of New Orleans, until their owners consented to share their crops with the commanding general, his brother, and other officers. When such consent had been extorted, the slaves were restored to the plantations and compelled to work under the bayonets of a guard of United States soldiers. Where that partnership was refused, armed expeditions were sent to the plantations to rob them of everything that could be removed. And even slaves too aged and infirm for work were, in spite of their entreaties, forced from the homes provided by their owners and driven to wander helpless on the highway. By an order, number 91, the entire property in that part of Louisiana west of the Mississippi River was sequestrated for confiscation, 
and officers were assigned to the duty with orders to gather up and collect the personal property and turn over to the proper officers upon their receipts such of it as might be required for the use of the united states army and to bring the remainder to new orleans and cause it to be sold at public auction to the highest bidders this was an order which if it had been executed would have condemned to punishment by starvation at least a quarter of a million of persons of all ages sexes and conditions the african slaves also were not only incited to insurrection by every license and encouragement but numbers of them were armed for a servile war which in its nature as exemplified in other lands far exceeds the horrors and merciless atrocities of savages in many instances the officers were active and zealous agents in the commission of these crimes and no instance was known of the refusal of any one of them to participate in the outrages the order of major general butler to which reference is made above was as follows quote, headquarters department of the gulf new orleans as officers and soldiers of the united states have been subject to repeated insults from women calling themselves ladies of new orleans in return for the most scrupulous non-interference and courtesy on our part it is ordered hereafter when any female shall by mere gesture or movement insult or show contempt for any officers or soldiers of the united states she shall be regarded and held liable to be treated as a woman about town plying her vocation by command of major general butler end quote. this order was issued on may fifteenth eighteen sixty two and known as general order number twenty eight another example was the cold-blooded execution of william b mumford on june seventh he was an unresisting and non-combatant captive and there was no offence ever alleged to have been committed by him subsequent to the date of the capture of the city he was charged with aiding and abetting certain persons in hauling down a united states flag hoisted on the mint which was left there by a boat's crew on the morning of april twenty sixth and five days before the military occupation of the city he was tried before a military commission sentenced and afterward hanged on december fifteenth eighteen sixty two major general n p banks took command of the military forces and major general butler retired the military governor early in august had attempted to set on foot a judicial system for the city and state for this purpose he appointed judges to two of the district courts of which the judges were absent and authorized a third who held a commission dated anterior to eighteen sixty one to resume the sessions this was an establishment of three new courts with the jurisdiction and powers pertaining to the courts that previously bore their names by a military officer representing the executive of the united states these were the only courts within the territory of the state held by the united states forces which claimed to have civil jurisdiction but this jurisdiction was limited to citizens of the parish of orleans as against defendants residing in the state as to other residents of the state outside the parish of orleans there was no court in which they could be sued in this condition several parishes were held by the united states forces it was therefore necessary to take another step in order to enable the military power to administer civil affairs this involved as every reader must perceive a complete subversion of the fundamental principles of social organization according to this advanced step the military power instituted by an organization of its own creates for itself a new nature fixes at will its rules and modes of action and determines the limits of its power it absorbs by force the civil functions with absolute disregard of the fundamental principle that the military shall be subject to the civil authority this attempt to administer civil affairs on the basis of military authority involved as has been said the subversion of fundamental principles the military power may remove obstacles to the exercise of the civil authority but when these are removed it cannot enter the forum put on the toga and sit in judgment upon civil affairs any more than the hawk becomes the dove by assuming her plumage however the next step was taken it consisted in the publication of the following order by the president of the united states quote, executive mansion washington october twentieth eighteen sixty two the insurrection which has for some time prevailed in several of the states of this union including louisiana having temporarily subverted and swept away the civil institutions of that state 
including the judiciary and the judicial authorities of the Union, so that it has become necessary to hold the state in military occupation, and it being indispensably necessary that there shall be some judicial tribunal existing there capable of administering justice, I have therefore thought it proper to appoint, and I do hereby constitute, a provisional court, which shall be a court of record for the state of Louisiana, and I do hereby appoint Charles A. Peabody of New York to be a provisional judge to hold said court, with authority to hear, try, and determine all causes civil and criminal, including causes in law, equity, revenue, and admiralty, and particularly with all such powers and jurisdiction as belong to the district and circuit courts of the United States, conforming his proceedings, so far as possible, to the course of proceedings and practice which has been customary in the courts of the United States and Louisiana, his judgment to be final and conclusive. And I do hereby authorize and empower the said judge to make and establish such rules and regulations as may be necessary for the exercise of his jurisdiction, and to appoint a prosecuting attorney, marshal, and clerk of the said court, who shall perform the functions of attorney, marshal, and clerk, according to such proceedings and practice as before mentioned, and such rules and regulations as may be made and established by said judge. These appointments are to continue during the pleasure of the President, not extending beyond the military occupation of the city of New Orleans, or the restoration of the civil authority in that city and in the state of Louisiana. These officers shall be paid out of the contingent fund of the War Department, and compensation shall be as follows. By the President, Abraham Lincoln. W. H. Seward, Secretary of State. End quote. This so-called court, as its judge said, quote, was always governed by the rules and principles of law, adhering to all the rules and forms of civil tribunals, and avoiding everything like a military administration of justice. In criminal matters it summoned a grand jury, and submitted to it all charges for examination. End quote. Yet when its judgments and mandates were to be executed, that execution could come only from the same power by which the court was constituted, and that was the military power of the United States, holding the country in military occupation. Therefore, to this end, the military and naval forces were pledged. Hence it was the military power, as has been said, administering civil affairs. The Constitution of the United States says, quote, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one supreme court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. End quote. This provisional court was neither ordained nor established by Congress. It had not, therefore, vested in it any of the judicial power of the United States. Neither does the Constitution give to Congress any power by which it can constitute an independent state court within the limits of any state in the Union, as Louisiana was said to be. This provisional court, therefore, was a mere instrument of martial law, constituted by the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Forces, not for the usual purposes which justified the establishment of such courts, but to enter the domain of civil affairs and administer justice between man and man in the ordinary transactions of peaceful life. The ministers of martial law are the only representatives of the conqueror, and they sit in his seat of authority to relieve him from the burden of excessive duties and to administer justice to offenders against his authority and the social welfare during his presence. On such grounds, the existence of such courts is justified, but for the establishment of a court like this provisional one, no legitimate authority is to be found either in the Constitution of the United States or outside of it. Inter arma silent leges is a maxim nearly 2,000 years old. It means that, under the exercise of military power, the civil administration ceases. When called upon to state any just grounds for such a measure, the invader has usually replied that he had ex necessitata rei, the right to establish such a tribunal. Thus said the Commander-in-Chief of the United States, and Congress acquiesced. Indeed, leading the way, it had urged the same plea to justify the passage of its Confiscation Act. The judiciary has observed the silence of acquiescence. Thus, the doctrine of necessity, the rule that, in the administration of affairs, both military and civil, 
the necessity of the case may and does afford ample authority and power to subvert or to suspend the provisions of the constitution and to exercise powers and do acts unwarranted by the grants of that instrument has apparently become incorporated as an unwritten clause of the constitution of the united states what then is this necessity its definition would require an explanation from the persons who act under it of the objects for which in every instance they act suffice it to say that the political wisdom of mankind has consecrated this truth as a fundamental maxim that no man can be trusted with the exercise of power and be at the same time the final judge of the limits within which that power may be exercised it has fortified this with other maxims such as necessity is the plea of despotism necessity knows no law the fathers of the constitution of the united states sought to limit every grant of power so exactly that it should observe its bounds as invariably as a planetary body does its orbit yet within the first hundred years of its existence all these limits have been disregarded and the people have silently accepted the plea of necessity it must be manifest to every one that there has been a fatal subversion of the constitution of the united states in estimating the results of the war this is one of the most deplorable because it is self-evident that when a constitutional government once oversteps the limits fixed for the exercise of its powers there is nothing beyond to check its further aggression no place where it will voluntarily halt until it reaches the subjugation of all who resist the usurpation this was the sole issue involved in the conflict of the united states government with the confederate states and every other issue whether pretended or real partook of its nature and was subordinate to this one let us repeat an illustration in strict observance of their inalienable rights in abundant caution reserved when they formed the compact or constitution whichever the reader pleases to call it of the united states the confederate states sought to withdraw from the union they had assisted to create and to form a new and independent one among themselves then the government of the united states broke through all the limits fixed for the exercise of the powers with which it had been endowed and to accomplish its own will assumed under the plea of necessity powers unwritten and unknown in the constitution that it might thereby proceed to the extremity of subjugation thus it will be perceived that the question still lives although the confederate armies may have left the field although the citizen soldiers may have retired to the pursuits of peaceful life although the confederate states may have renounced their new union they have proved their indestructibility by resuming their former places in the old one where by the organic law they could only be admitted as republican equal and sovereign states of the union and although the confederacy as an organization may have ceased to exist as unquestionably as though it had never been formed the fundamental principles the eternal truths uttered when our colonies in seventeen seventy six declared their independence on which the confederation of seventeen eighty one and the union of seventeen eighty eight were formed and which animated and guided in the organization of the confederacy of eighteen sixty one yet live and will survive however crushed they may be by despotic force however deep they may be buried under the debris of crumbling states however they may be disavowed by the time-serving and the faint-hearted yet i believe they have the eternity of truth and that in god's appointed time and place they will prevail the contest is not over the strife is not ended it has only entered on a new and enlarged arena the champions of constitutional liberty must spring to the struggle like the armed men from the seminated dragon's teeth until the government of the united states is brought back to its constitutional limits and the tyrant's plea of necessity is bound in chains strong as adamant quote, for freedom's battle once begun bequeathed by bleeding sire to son though baffled oft it ever won End quote. when the war closed who were the victors perhaps it is too soon to answer that question nevertheless every day as time rolls on we look with increasing pride upon the struggle our people made for constitutional liberty the war was one in which fundamental principles were involved and as force decides no truth 
Hence the issue is still undetermined, as has been already shown. We have laid aside our swords. We have ceased our hostility. We have conceded the physical strength of the northern states. But the question still lives, and all nations and peoples that adopt a confederated agent of government will become champions of our cause. While contemplating the northern states, with their federal constitution gone, ruthlessly destroyed under the tyrant's plea of necessity, their state sovereignty made a byword, and their people absorbed in an aggregated mass, no longer, as their fathers left them, protected by reserved rights against usurpation, the question naturally arises, on which side was the victory? Let the verdict of mankind decide. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Foster. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2 by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 33. Further Attempts of the United States Government to Overthrow States. Election of members of Congress under the military governor of Louisiana. The voters required to take an oath to support the United States government. The state law violated. Proposition to hold a state convention postponed. The president's plan for making a union state out of a fragment of a confederate state. His proclamation. The oath required. Message. The war power our main reliance. Not a feature of the Republican government in the plan. What are the true principles? The Declaration of Independence asserts them. Who had a right to institute a government for Louisiana? Its people only. Under what principles could the government of the United States do it? As an invader to subjugate. Effrontery and wickedness of the administration. It enforces a fiction. Attempt to make falsehood as good as truth. Proclamation for an election of state officers. Proclamation for a state convention. The monster crime against the liberties of mankind. Proceedings in Arkansas. Novel method adopted to amend the state constitution. Perversion of Republican principles in Virginia. Proceedings to create the state of West Virginia. A falsehood by act of Congress. Proceedings considered under fundamental principles. These acts sustained by the United States government. Assertion of Thaddeus Stevens. East Virginia government. Such acts caused entire subversion of states. Mere fictions thus constituted. But to resume our narration. On December 3rd, in compliance with an order of the military governor Shepley, a so-called election was held for members of the United States Congress in the first and second state districts, each composed of about half the city of New Orleans and portions of the surrounding parishes. Those who had taken the oath of allegiance were allowed to vote. In the first district, Benjamin F. Flanders received 2,370 votes and all others 273. In the 2nd District, Michael Hahn received 2,799 votes, and all others 2,318. These persons presented themselves at Washington, and resolutions to admit them to seats were reported by the Committee on Elections in the House of Representatives. It was urged that the military governor had conformed in every particular to the Constitution and laws of Louisiana, so that the election had every essential of a regular election in a time of most profound peace with the exception of the fact that the proclamation for the election was issued by the military instead of the civil governor of the state. The law required the proclamation to be issued by the civil governor, so that if these persons were admitted to seats after an election called by a military governor, Congress thereby recognized as valid a military order of a so-called executive that unceremoniously set aside a provision of the state civil law, and was anti-republican and a positive usurpation. Again, all the departments of the United States government had acted on the theory that the Confederate states were in a state of insurrection, and that the Union was unbroken. Under this theory, they could come back to the Union only with all the laws unimpaired which they themselves had made for their own government. Congress was as much bound to uphold the laws of Louisiana in all their extent and in all their parts as it was to uphold the laws of New York or any other state whose civil policy had not been disturbed. Both these persons, however, were admitted to seats, yeas 92, Nays 44. The work of constituting the state of Louisiana out of the small portion of her population and of her territory held by the forces of the United States still went on. 
The proposition now was to hold a so-called state convention and frame a new constitution, but its advocates were so few that nothing was accomplished during the year 1863. The object of the military power was to secure such civil authority as to enforce the abolition of slavery, and until the way was clear to that result, every method of organization was held in abeyance. Meanwhile, on December 8, 1863, the President of the United States issued a proclamation which contained his plan for making a Union state out of a fragment of a Confederate state, and also granting an amnesty to the general mass of the people on taking an oath of allegiance. His plan was in these words. And I do further proclaim, declare, and make known that, whenever, in any of the states of Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and North Carolina, a number of persons, not less than one-tenth in number of the votes cast in such state, at the presidential election of 1860, each having taken the following oath, and not having since violated it, and being a qualified voter by the election laws of the state existing, immediately before the so-called Act of Secession, and excluding all others, shall re-establish a state government which shall be republican, and in no wise contravening said oath, such shall be recognized as the true government of the state, and the state shall receive thereunder the benefits of the constitutional provision which declares that the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government, and shall protect each of them against invasion, and on application of the legislature or the executive, when the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence. The oath required to be taken was as follows. I, blank, do solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will henceforth support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Union of the States thereunder, and that I will in like manner abide by and faithfully support all acts of Congress passed during the existing rebellion with reference to slaves so long and so far as not repealed, modified, or held void by Congress, or by decision of the Supreme Court, and that I will in like manner abide by and faithfully support all proclamations of the President made during the existing rebellion having reference to slaves so long and so far as not modified or declared void by decision of the Supreme Court, so help me God. In a message to Congress of the same date with the preceding proclamation, the President of the United States, after explaining the objects of the proclamation, says, in the midst of other cares, however important, we must not lose sight of the fact that the war power is still our main reliance. To that power alone can we look for a time to give confidence to the people in the contested regions that the insurgent power will not again overrun them. The intelligent reader will observe that this plan of the President of the United States to restore states to the Union, to occupy the places of those which he had been attempting to destroy, does not contain a single feature to secure a Republican form of government, nor a single provision authorized by the Constitution of the United States. With his usurped war power to sustain him in the work of destruction, he found it easy to destroy, but he was powerless to create or to restore. In the former case, he had gone imperiously forward, trampling underfoot every American political principle and breaking through every constitutional limitation. In the latter case, he could not advance one step without recognizing sound political principles and complying with their dictates. On each foundation he must construct, or his work would be like the house founded on the sand. It will now be shown what the true principles are, and then that the President of the United States perverted them, misstated them, and sought to reach his ends by groundless fabrications as if he would enforce a fiction, or establish a fallacy, to be as good as truth. It might still be farther shown, if it had not already become self-evident, that this method was pursued with such a perversity and wickedness as to render it a characteristic feature of that war administration on whose skirts is the blood of more than a million of human beings. The whole science of a republican government is to be found in this sentence of the Declaration of Independence made by the representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled on July 4, 1776. It says, That to secure these rights, certain unalienable rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Thus it will be seen that civil and political sovereignty was held to be implanted by our Creator in the individual, 
and no human government has any original inherent just sovereignty whatever, and no acquired sovereignty either, beyond that which may be granted to it by the individuals as most likely to affect their safety and happiness, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, says the Declaration of Independence. All other powers than those thus derived are not just powers. Any government exercising powers not just has no right to survive. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, says the Declaration of Independence, and to institute a new government. Who, then, had a right to institute a Republican government for Louisiana? No human beings whatever but the people of Louisiana, not the strangers, not the slaves, but the manhood that knew its rights and dared to maintain them. Under what principles, then, could a citizen of Massachusetts, whether clothed in regimentals or a civilian's dress, come into Louisiana and attempt to set up a state government? Under no principles, but only by the power of the invader and the usurper. If the true principles of a Republican government had prevailed and could have been enforced when Major General Butler appeared at New Orleans, he would have been hanged on the first lamppost, and his successor, Major General Banks, would have been hanged on the second. Under what principles, then, could the government of the United States appear in Louisiana and attempt to institute a state government? As has been said above, it was the act of an invader and a usurper, yet it proposed to institute a Republican state government. The absurdity of such intention is too manifest to need argument. How could an invader attempt to institute a Republican state government, an act which can be done only by the free and unconstrained action of the people themselves? It has been charged that this and every similar act of the President of the United States was in violation of his duty to maintain and observe the requirements and restrictions of the Constitution, and to uphold in each state a Republican form of government. To specify, the following is offered as an example. He did proclaim, declare, and make known that whenever any number of persons, not less than one-tenth of the number of voters at the last presidential election, shall re-establish a state government which shall be Republican, and in no wise contravening said oath, such shall be recognized as the true government of the state. One-tenth of the voters cannot establish a Republican state government which requires the consent of the people of the state to make its powers just as has been shown above. Therefore, such a government had not one element of republicanism in it. But what is astonishingly remarkable is the stultification of requiring one-tenth of the people to re-establish a state government which shall be republican and in no wise contravening said oath. Either he did not know how a republican state government was instituted, or if he knew, then he was a participant in that perversity and wickedness which was above charged to be the characteristic of his war administration. It will now be shown how he sought to enforce a fiction or establish a fallacy to be as good as truth. Of the government thus established by one-tenth of the voters, he says, Such shall be recognized as the true government of the state, and the state shall receive thereunder the benefits of the constitutional provision which declares that the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. It is proper here to inquire who and what was the tenth to whom this power to rule the state was to be given. It will be seen by reference to the proclamation that each voter of the one-tenth in order to be qualified is required to take an oath with certain promises in it which are prescribed by an outside or foreign authority. This condition of itself is fatal to a republican state government that derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Free consent, not cheerful consent, but unconstrained and unconditioned consent, is required that just powers may be derived from it. In this instance, the invader prescribes the requisite qualifications of the voter, and makes it a condition that the government established shall, in no wise contravene, certain stipulations expressed in the oath taken to give the qualification. A state government thus formed derives its powers from the consent of the invader, and not from the consent of the governed. It has no just powers whatever. It is a groundless fabrication. Yet the President of the United States declared, The state shall receive thereunder the benefits of the constitutional provision which declares that the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Is not this an attempt, while pretending to establish, to destroy, true republicanism? Now, let the reader bear in mind that these remarks relate to Louisiana alone of which more remains to be told, 
and that there were eleven states that withdrew from the Union, whose restoration was to be effected on this rotten system, in addition to several constitutional amendments, the adoption of which was to be effected and secured by the votes of these groundless fabrications, in which a fiction was to be considered as good as the truth. Having attained all these facts which are yet to be stated, he may begin to form some estimate of the remnants of the Constitution, and of the probable existence of any true union of the states. To proceed with the narration. Under the above-mentioned proclamation of the President of the United States, Major General Banks issued at New Orleans on January 11, 1864, a proclamation for an election of state officers, and for members of a state constitutional convention. The state officers, when elected, were to constitute, as the proclamation said, the civil government of the state under the Constitution and laws of Louisiana, except so much of the said Constitution and laws as recognize, regulate, or relate to slavery, which, being inconsistent with the present condition of public affairs, and plainly inapplicable to any class of persons now existing within its limits, must be suspended. The number of votes given for state officers was 10,270. The population of the state in 1860 was 708,902. The so-called government was inaugurated on March 4th, and on March 11th he was invested with the powers hitherto exercised by the military governor for the President of the United States. On the same day, Major General Banks issued an order relative to the election of delegates to a so-called state convention. The most important provisions of it defined the qualifications of voters. The delegates were elected entirely within the army lines of the forces of the United States. The so-called convention assembled and adopted a so-called constitution, declaring instantaneous, universal, uncompensated, unconditional emancipation of slaves. The meager vote on the Constitution was, for its adoption, 6,836, for its rejection, 1,566. The vote of New Orleans was, yeas, 4,664, nays, 789. This state of affairs continued after the close of the war. Violent disputes arose as to the validity of the so-called Constitution. The so-called legislature elected under it adopted Article 13 as an amendment to the Constitution of the United States, prohibiting the existence of slavery in the United States. It will be seen from these facts that the state of Louisiana was not a republican state instituted by the consent of the governed, that its legislature was an unconstitutional body without any just powers, and that the vote which it gave for the amendment of the Constitution of the United States was no vote at all for it was given by a body that had no authority to give it, because it had no just powers whatever. Yet this vote was counted among those necessary to secure the passage of the constitutional amendment. Was this an attempt to enforce a fiction, or to establish the truth? Such are the deeds which go to make up the record of crime against the liberties of mankind. The proceedings in Arkansas to institute a Republican state government were inaugurated by an order from the President of the United States to Major General Steele, commanding the United States forces in Arkansas. At this time, the regular government of the state, established by the consent of the people, was in full operation outside the lines of the United States Army. The military order of the President, dated January 20, 1864, said, Sundry citizens of the state of Arkansas petitioned me that an election may be held in that state, in which to elect a governor, that it be assumed at that election, and thenceforward, that the Constitution and laws of the state, as before the rebellion, are in full force, except that the Constitution is so modified as to declare that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, etc. The order then directs the election to be held for state officers, prescribes the qualifications of voters and the oath to be taken, and directs the general to administer to the officers thus chosen an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the modified Constitution of the State of Arkansas, when they shall be declared qualified and empowered immediately to enter upon the duties of their offices. The reader can scarcely fail to notice the novel method here adopted to modify or amend the state constitution. It should be called the process by assumption, that is, assume it to be modified, and it is so modified. Then the President orders the officers elect to be required to swear on their oath to support the modified Constitution of the State of Arkansas. Now, unless the Constitution was thus modified by assuming it to be modified, these state officers were required by oath to support that which did not exist. But it was not so modified. No constitution or other instrument in the world containing a grant of powers can be modified by assumption, 
unless it be the Constitution of the United States, as shown by recent experience. Yet the chief object for which these officers were elected and qualified was to carry out these so-called modifications of the state constitution. This adds another to the deeds of darkness done in the name of republicanism. Meantime, some persons in the northern part of Arkansas, acting under the proclamation of December 8, 1863, got together a so-called state convention on January 8, 1864, and adopted a revised constitution, containing the slavery prohibition, etc. This was ordered to be submitted to a popular vote, and at the same time state officers were to be elected. President Lincoln acceded to these proceedings after they had been placed under the direction of the military commander, General Steele. The election was held, the Constitution received 12,000 votes, and the state officers were declared to be elected. Then Arkansas came forth a so-called Republican state, instituted by military authority, and of course received the benefit of the constitutional provision which declares that the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. It should be added that Arkansas, thus instituted a state, was regarded by the government of the United States as competent to give as valid a vote as New York, Massachusetts, or any other northern state for the ratification of Article 13 as an amendment to the Constitution of the United States, prohibiting the existence of slavery in the United States. The vote was thus given. It was counted and served to make up the exact number deemed by the managers to be necessary. Thus was fraud and falsehood triumphant over popular rights and fundamental law. The perversion of true Republican principles was greater in Virginia than in any other state, through the cooperation of the government of the United States. In the winter of 1860-61, a special session of the legislature of the state convened at Richmond and passed an act directing the people to elect delegates to a state convention to be held on February 14, 1861. The convention assembled and was occupied with the subject of federal relations and the adjustment of difficulties until the call for troops by President Lincoln was made, when an ordinance of secession was passed. The contiguity of the northwestern counties of the state of Ohio and Pennsylvania led to the manifestation of much opposition to the withdrawal of the state from the Union, and the determination to reorganize that portion into a separate state. This resulted in the assembling of a so-called Convention of Delegates at Wheeling on June 11th. One of its first acts was to provide for a reorganization of the state government of Virginia by declaring its offices vacant and the appointment of new officers throughout. This new organization assumed to be the true representative of the state of Virginia, and after various fortunes was recognized as such by President Lincoln, as will be presently seen. The next act of the convention was to provide for the formation of a new state out of a portion of the territory of this state. Under this act, delegates were elected to a so-called constitutional convention, which framed a so-called constitution for the new state of West Virginia, which was submitted to a vote of the people in April 1862 and carried by a large majority of that section. Meantime, the governor of the reorganized government of Virginia, above mentioned, issued his proclamation calling for an election of members and the assembling of an extra session of this so-called legislature. This body assembled on May 6, 1862, and, adopting the new federal process of assumption, it assumed to be the legislature of the state of Virginia. This body, or legislature, so called, immediately passed an act giving its consent to the formation of a new state out of the territory of Virginia. The formal act of consent and the draft of the new Constitution of West Virginia above mentioned were ordered by this so-called legislature to be sent to the Congress of the United States, then in session, with the request that the said new state be admitted into the Union. On December 31, 1862, the President of the United States approved an act of Congress entitled, An Act for the Admission of the State of West Virginia into the Union, etc. The act recited as follows. Whereas, the legislature of Virginia, by an act passed May 13, 1862, did give its consent to the formation of a new state within the jurisdiction of the said state of Virginia to be known by the name of West Virginia, etc. Again, it recites. And whereas both the convention and the legislature aforesaid have requested that the new state should be admitted into the Union, and the Constitution aforesaid being Republican in form, Congress doth hereby consent that the said 48 counties may be formed into a separate and independent state. It were well to pause for a moment and consider these proceedings in the light of fundamental Republican principles. The state of Virginia was not a confederation, but a republic, or nation. Its government was instituted with the consent of the governed, and its powers, therefore, were just powers. 
When the state convention at Richmond passed an ordinance of secession, which was subsequently ratified by 6,000 majority, it was as valid an act for the people of Virginia as was ever passed by a representative body. The legally expressed decision of the majority was the true voice of the state. When, therefore, disorderly persons in the northwestern counties of the state assembled and declared the ordinance of secession to be null and void, they rose up against the authority of the state. When they proceeded to elect delegates to a convention to resist the act of the state, and that convention assembled and organized and proceeded to action, an insurrection against the government of Virginia was begun. When the convention next declared the state offices to be vacant and proceeded to fill them by the choice of Francis H. Pierpont for governor and other state officers, assuming itself to be the true state convention of Virginia, it not only declared what notoriously did not exist, but it committed an act of revolution. And when the so-called state officers elected by it entered upon their duties, they inaugurated a revolution. The subsequent organization of the state of West Virginia and its separation from the state of Virginia were acts of secession. Thus we have, in these movements, insurrection, revolution, and secession. The reader, in his simplicity, may naturally expect to find the government of the United States arrayed with all its military forces against these illegitimate proceedings. Oh no! It made all the difference in the world with the ministers of that government, whose ox it was that was gored by the bull. She was the nursing mother to the whole thing, and to ensure its vitality fed it not like the fabled bird with her own blood, but by the butchery of the mother of states. The words of the Constitution of the United States applicable to this case are these. No new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned, as well as of the Congress. Will any intelligent person assert that the consent of the state of Virginia was given to the formation of this new state, or that the government of Francis H. Pierpont held the true and lawful jurisdiction of the state of Virginia? Yet the Congress of the United States asserted in the act above quoted that the legislature of Virginia did give its consent to the formation of a new state within the jurisdiction of the state of Virginia. This was not true, but was an attempt by an act of Congress to aid a fraud and perpetuate a monstrous usurpation. For there is no grant of power to Congress in the Constitution, nor in the American theory of government to justify it. If it is said that the government of Francis H. Pierpont was the only one recognized by Congress as the government of the state of Virginia, that does not alter the fact. The recognition of Congress cannot make a state of an organization which is not a state. There is no grant of power to Congress in the Constitution for that purpose. If it is said that the government of Francis H. Pierpont was established by the only qualified voters in the state of Virginia, that is as equally unfounded as the other assertions. Neither the Congress of the United States nor the government of the United States can determine the qualifications of voters at an election for delegates to a state constitutional convention, or for the choice of state officers. There was no grant of power either to the President or to Congress for that purpose. All these efforts were usurpations, by which it was sought through groundless fabrications to reach certain ends, and they add to the multitude of deeds which constitute the crime committed against states and the liberties of the people. When the question of the admission of West Virginia was before the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, Mr. Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania declared with expiatory frankness that he would not stultify himself by claiming the act to be constitutional. He said, We know that it is not constitutional, but it is necessity. It now became necessary for the government of Virginia, represented by Francis H. Pierpont, to emigrate, for the new state of West Virginia embraced the territory in which he was located. He therefore departed with his carpet bag and located at Alexandria on the Potomac, which became the seat of government of so-called East Virginia. On February 13, 1864, a convention consisting of a representative from each of the ten counties in part or wholly under the control of the United States forces assembled at Alexandria to amend the Constitution of the State of Virginia. Some sections providing for the abolition of slavery were declared to be added to the Constitution and the so-called convention adjourned. Nothing of importance occurred until after the occupation of Richmond by the United States forces. On May 9, 1865, President Johnson issued an executive order to reestablish the authority of the United States and execute the laws within the geographical limits known as the State of Virginia. The order closed in these words. 
that to carry into effect the guarantee of the federal constitution of a republican form of state government and afford the advantage of the security of domestic laws as well as to complete the re-establishment of the authority of the laws of the united states and the full and complete restoration of peace within the limits aforesaid francis h pierpont governor of the state of virginia will be aided by the federal government so far as may be necessary in the lawful measures which he may take for the extension and administration of the state government throughout the geographical limits of said state. This order recognized the factitious organization which was begun in West Virginia and then transplanted to Alexandria as the true government of the state of Virginia, and by the aid of the United States government was now removed to Richmond and set up there. No person was allowed to take any part in this government or to vote under it unless he had previously taken the purgatorial oath above mentioned and had not held office under the Confederate or any state government. Thus the taking of this oath, which was prescribed by the President of the United States, became the most important of the qualifications of a voter. Here was a condition prescribed by a foreign authority as necessary to be fulfilled before the first act could be done by a citizen relative to his state government. Such a government was not republican, for its powers were not derived from the consent of the governed. Its powers were derived from voters who had, under oath, said, I will abide by and faithfully support all acts of Congress, passed during the existing rebellion with reference to slaves, so long and so far as not repealed, modified, or held void by Congress, or by decision of the Supreme Court. And that I will in like manner abide by and faithfully support all proclamations of the President made during the existing rebellion, having reference to slaves, so long and so far as not modified or declared void by decision of the Supreme Court. Such a state government was not in the interest of the people, but in the interest of the United States government. The true Republican organization which had been instituted by the free consent of the governed to effect their safety and happiness had been repudiated by the government of the United States as in rebellion to it. And this fiction had been set up not by the free consent of the people which alone could give to it any just powers not to effect their safety and happiness for which alone a republican state government can be instituted but solely to secure the safety and supremacy of the government of the united states the qualification of the voter was prescribed by the united states government and the oath required him to recognize allegiance to the union as supreme over that to the state of which he was a citizen thus the voters under the state government of virginia were required first to protect the government of the united states and then they were at liberty to look after their own interests through the state government now it is charged that such acts on the part of the united states government were not only entirely unconstitutional but they caused the complete subversion of the states the constitution of the united states knows states in the union only as they are republican states the government of the United States was conscious of this fact and publicly recognized it when it promised to guarantee a republican form of government to each one that it sought to reconstruct. But it violated the Constitution when it sought to place in the Union mere fictions which had not the first element of a republic, which were groundless fabrications of its own minions that could not have existed a day without the military support which they received. Further, it is to be remembered that it does not come within the grants of the Constitution, consequently not within the powers of the government of the United States, to institute a republican form of government at any time or in any place. Such an act is neither contemplated nor known in the Constitution, as such a government can be instituted only by the free consent of those who are to be governed by it. Any interference on the part of the United States to limit, modify, or control this consent goes directly to the nature and objects of the state government, and it ceases to be republican. To admit a state under such a government is entirely unauthorized, revolutionary, subversive of the Constitution, and destructive of the Union of States. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Foster. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2 by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 34. Address to the Army of Eastern Virginia by the President. Army of General Pope. Position of McClellan. Advance of General Jackson. Atrocious orders of General Pope. 
Letter of McClellan on the Conduct of War. Letter of the President to General Lee. Battle of Cedar Run. Results of the Engagement. Reinforcements to the Enemy. Second Battle of Manassas. Capture of Manassas Junction. Captured Stores. The Old Battlefield. Advance of General Longstreet. Attack on him. Attack on General Jackson. Darkness of the Night. Battle at Ox Hill. Losses of the Enemy. This defeat of McClellan's army led me to issue the following address. Richmond, July 5th, 1862. To the Army of Eastern Virginia. Soldiers, I congratulate you on the series of brilliant victories which, under the favor of divine providence, you have lately won, and, as the President of the Confederate States, do heartily tender to you the thanks of the country, whose just cause you have so skillfully and heroically served. Ten days ago an invading army, vastly superior to you in numbers and the materials of war, closely beleaguered your capital and vauntingly proclaimed its speedy conquest. You marched to attack the enemy in his entrenchments. With well-directed movements and death-defying valor, you charged upon him in his strong positions, drove him from field to field over a distance of more than thirty-five miles, and despite his reinforcements, compelled him to seek safety under the cover of his gunboats, where he now lies cowering before the army so lately derided and threatened with entire subjugation. The fortitude with which you have borne toil and privation, the gallantry with which you have entered into each successive battle, must have been witnessed to be fully appreciated. But a grateful people will not fail to recognize you, and to bear you in loved remembrance. Well may it be said of you that you have done enough for glory, but duty to a suffering country and to the cause of constitutional liberty claims from you yet further effort. Let it be your pride to relax in nothing which can promote your future efficiency. Your one great object being to drive the invader from your soil, and, carrying your standards beyond the other boundaries of the Confederacy, to wring from an unscrupulous foe the recognition of your birthright, community independence. Jefferson Davis After the retreat of General McClellan to Westover, his army remained inactive about a month. His front was closely watched by a brigade of cavalry, and preparations made to resist a renewal of his attempt upon Richmond from his new base. The main body of our army awaited the development of his intentions, and no important event took place. Meantime, another army of the enemy, under Major General Pope, advanced southward from Washington, and crossed the Rappahannock as if to seize Gordonsville, and moved thence upon Richmond. Contemporaneously, the enemy appeared in force at Fredericksburg, and threatened the railroad from Gordonsville to Richmond, apparently for the purpose of cooperating with the movements of General Pope. To meet the advance of the latter, and restrain, as far as possible, the atrocities which he threatened to perpetrate upon our defenseless citizens, General Jackson, with his own and Ewell's division, was ordered to proceed on July 13th toward Gordonsville. The nature of the atrocities here alluded to may be inferred from the orders of Major General Pope, which were as follows. Headquarters of the Army of Virginia, Washington, July 18th, 1862. General Orders, Number 5. Hereafter, as far as practicable, the troops of this command will subsist upon the country in which their operations are carried on. In all cases, supplies for this purpose will be taken by the officers to whose department they properly belong, under the orders of the commanding officer of the troops for whose use they are intended. Vouchers will be given to the owners, stating on their face that they will be payable at the close of the war upon sufficient testimony being furnished that such owners have been loyal citizens of the United States since the date of the vouchers. By command of Major General Pope, George D. Ruggles, Colonel, Assistant Adjutant General, and Chief of Staff. Headquarters of the Army of Virginia, July 18, 1862. General Orders No. 6. Hereafter, in any operations of the cavalry forces in this command, no supply or baggage trains of any description will be used, unless so stated especially in the order for the movement. Two days' cooked rations will be carried on the persons of the men, and all villages and neighborhoods through which they pass will be laid under contribution in the manner specified by General Orders No. 5 Current Series from these headquarters for the subsistence of men and horses. By command of Major General Pope, George D. Ruggles, Colonel, Assistant Adjutant General, and Chief of Staff. Headquarters, Army of Virginia, Washington, July 18, 1862. General Orders No. 7. 
The people of the Valley of the Shenandoah and throughout the region of operations of this army, living along the lines of railroad and telegraph and along routes of travel in the rear of United States forces, are notified that they will be held responsible for any injury done the track, line, or road, or for any attacks upon the trains or straggling soldiers, by bands of guerrillas in their neighborhood. Evil disposed persons in the rear of our armies, who do not themselves engage directly in these lawless acts, encouraged by refusing to interfere, or give any information by which such acts can be prevented, or the perpetrators punished. Safety of the life and property of all persons living in the rear of our advancing army depends upon the maintenance of peace and quiet among themselves, and upon the unmolested movements through their midst of all pertaining to the military service. They are to understand distinctly that the security of travel is their only warrant of personal safety. If a soldier or legitimate follower of the army be fired upon from any house, the house shall be razed to the ground, and the inhabitants sent prisoners to the headquarters of this army. If such an outrage occur at any place distant from settlements, the people within five miles around shall be held accountable, and made to pay an indemnity sufficient for the case. And any person detected in such outrages, either during the act or at any time afterward, shall be shot without waiting civil process. By command of Major General Pope, George D. Ruggles, Colonel. Headquarters, Army of Virginia, Washington, July 23, 1862. General Orders No. 11. Commanders of Army Corps, Divisions, Brigades, and Detached Commands will proceed immediately to arrest all disloyal male citizens within their lines or within their reach in the rear of their respective stations. Such as are willing to take the oath of allegiance to the United States and will furnish sufficient security for its observance shall be permitted to remain at their homes and pursue in good faith their accustomed avocations. Those who refuse shall be conducted south beyond the extreme pickets of the army and be notified that, if found again anywhere within our lines or at any point in the rear, they will be considered spies and subjected to the extreme rigor of the military law. By command of Major General Pope, George D. Ruggles, Colonel, Assistant Adjutant General, and Chief of Staff. Thus was announced a policy of pillage, outrage upon unarmed, peaceable people, arson, and ruthless insult to the defenseless. Had the vigor of the campaign been equal to the bombastic manifesto of this disgrace to the profession of arms, the injuries inflicted would have been more permanent. The conduct could scarcely have been more brutal. In recurring to the letter of General George B. McClellan, written at Camp Near Harrison's Landing, Virginia, July 7, 1862, to the President of the United States, one must be struck with the strong contrast between the suggestions of General McClellan and the orders of General Pope. The inquiry naturally arises. Was it because of this difference that Pope had been assigned to the command of the Army of Virginia? McClellan wrote, this rebellion has assumed the character of a war, as such it should be regarded, and it should be conducted upon the highest principles known to Christian civilization. It should not be a war looking to the subjugation of the people of any state in any event. It should not be at all a war upon population, but against armed forces and political organizations. Neither confiscation of property, political executions of persons, territorial organizations of states, or forcible abolition of slavery should be contemplated for a moment. In prosecuting the war, all private property and unarmed persons should be strictly protected, subject only to the necessity of military operations. All private property taken for military use should be paid or receipted for. Pillage and waste should be treated as high crimes. All unnecessary trespass sternly prohibited. And offensive demeanor by the military towards citizens promptly rebuked. Military arrests should not be tolerated except in places where active hostilities exist and oaths not required by enactments constitutionally should be neither demanded nor received. Had these views been accepted and the conduct of the government of the United States been in accordance with them, the most shameful chapters in American history could not have been written, and some of the more respectable newspapers of the North would not have had the apprehensions they expressed of the evils which would befall the country when an army habituated to thieving should be disbanded. On the reception of copies of the orders issued by General Pope, inserted above, I address to General Lee, commanding our army in Virginia, the following letter. Richmond, Virginia, July 31, 1862. Sir, on the 23rd of this month, a cartel for a general exchange of prisoners of war was signed between Major General D. H. Hill in behalf of the Confederate States and Major General John A. Dix in behalf of the United States. By the terms of that cartel, it is stipulated that all prisoners of war hereafter taken shall be discharged on parole until exchanged. 
Scarcely had that cartel been signed when the military authorities of the United States commenced a practice changing the character of the war from such as becomes civilized nations into a campaign of indiscriminate robbery and murder. The general order issued by the Secretary of War of the United States in the city of Washington on the very day that the cartel was signed in Virginia directs the military commanders of the United States to take the private property of our people for the convenience and use of their armies without compensation. The general order issued by Major General Pope on the 23rd of July, the day after the signing of the cartel, directs the murder of our peaceful inhabitants as spies if found quietly tilling their farms in his rear, even outside of his lines and one of his brigadier generals, Steinware, has seized upon innocent and peaceful inhabitants to be held as hostages, to the end that they may be murdered in cold blood if any of his soldiers are killed by some unknown persons whom he designates as bushwhackers. Under this state of facts, this government has issued the enclosed general order recognizing General Pope and his commissioned officers to be in the position which they have chosen for themselves, that of robbers and murderers, and not that of public enemies, entitled, if captured, to be considered as prisoners of war. We find ourselves driven by our enemies in their steady progress toward a practice which we abhor, and which we are vainly struggling to avoid. Some of the military authorities of the United States seem to suppose that better success will attend a savage war in which no quarter is to be given, and no sex to be spared, than has hitherto been secured by such hostilities as are alone recognized to be lawful by civilized men in modern times. For the present we renounce our right of retaliation on the innocent, and shall continue to treat the private enlisted soldiers of General Pope's army as prisoners of war. But if, after notice to the government at Washington of our confining repressive measures to the punishment only of commissioned officers, who are willing participants in these crimes, these savage practices are continued, we shall reluctantly be forced to the last resort of accepting the war on the terms chosen by our foes, until the outraged voice of a common humanity forces a respect for the recognized rules of war. While these facts would justify our refusal to execute the generous cartel, by which we have consented to liberate an excess of thousands of prisoners held by us, beyond the number held by the enemy, a sacred regard to plighted faith, shrinking from the mere semblance of breaking a promise, prevents our resort to this extremity. Nor do we desire to extend to any other forces of the enemy the punishment merited alone by General Pope and such commissioned officers as choose to participate in the execution of his infamous orders. You are therefore instructed to communicate to the Commander-in-Chief of the Armies of the United States the contents of this letter and a copy of the enclosed general order, to the end that he may be notified of our intention not to consider any officers hereafter captured from General Pope's army as prisoners of war. Very respectfully yours, etc. Jefferson Davis when General Jackson arrived near Gordonsville on July 19, 1862, he was at his request reinforced by Major General A.P. Hill. Receiving information that only a part of General Pope's army was at Culpeper Courthouse, General Jackson, hoping to defeat it before reinforcements should arrive, moved in that direction the divisions of Ewell, Hill, and Jackson on August 7th from their encampments near Gordonsville. As the enemy's cavalry displayed unusual activity and the train of Jackson's division was seriously endangered, General Lawton with his brigade was ordered to guard it. On August 9th, Jackson arrived within eight miles of Culpeper Courthouse and found the foe in his front near Cedar Run and a short distance west and north of Slaughter Mountain. When first seen, the cavalry in large force occupied a ridge to the right of the road. A battery opened upon it and soon forced it to retire. Our fire was responded to by some guns beyond the ridge from which the advance had just been driven. Soon after, the cavalry returned to the position where it was first seen, and General Early was ordered forward, keeping near the Culpeper Road, while General Ewell, with his two remaining brigades, diverged from the road to the right, advancing along the western slope of Slaughter Mountain. General Early, forming his brigade in line of battle, moved into the open field, and passing a short distance to the right of the road but parallel to it, pushed forward, driving the opposing cavalry before him to the crest of a hill which overlooked the ground between his troops and the opposite hill, along which the enemy's batteries were posted, and opened upon him as soon as he reached the eminence. Early retired his troops under the protection of the hill, and a small battery of ours, in advance of his right, opened. Meantime, General Vinder, with Jackson's brigade, was placed on the left of the road, Campbell's brigade, Lieutenant Colonel Garnett commanding, being on the left, Taliaferro's parallel to the road, supporting the batteries, and Vinder's own brigade under Colonel Rowland in reserve. The battle opened with a fierce fire of artillery, which continued about two hours, during which Brigadier General Charles S. Vinder, while directing the positions of his batteries, received a wound, from the effects of which he expired in a few hours. General Jackson thus spoke of him in his report. 
It is difficult, within the proper reserve of an official report, to do justice to the merits of this accomplished officer. Urged by the medical director to take no part in the movements of the day, because of the then enfeebled state of his health, his ardent patriotism and military pride could bear no restraint. Richly endowed with those qualities of mind and person which fit an officer for command, and which attract the admiration and excite the enthusiasm of troops, he was rapidly rising to the front rank of his profession. His loss has been severely felt. Charles Vinder had attracted my special notice when I was Secretary of War of the United States by an act of heroism and devotion to duty which it gives me pleasure to record. A regiment of artillery, in which he was a second lieutenant, being under orders for California, embarked on the steamer San Francisco, and in a storm became disabled. Drifting helplessly at sea, she was approached by a bark, which, to give succor, hove to. Not being able to receive all the passengers, the commissioned officers left, as the colonel naively reported, in the order of their rank. Vinder alone remained with the troops, in great discomfort, and by strenuous exertion the wreck was kept afloat until a vessel bound for Liverpool came to the relief of the sufferers. Arriving at Liverpool, Vinder left the soldiers there, went to the American consul in London, got means to provide for their needs, and returned with them. Soon afterward, four regiments were added to the army, and for his good conduct, so full of promise, he was nominated to be a captain of infantry, and, notwithstanding his youth, was confirmed and commissioned accordingly. He died manifesting the same spirit as on the wreck, that which holds life light when weighed against honor. The enemy's infantry advanced about 5 p.m. and attacked General Early in front, while another body, concealed by the inequality of the ground, moved upon his right. Thomas's brigade of A.P. Hill's division, which had now arrived, was sent to his support, and the contest soon became animated. In the meantime, the main body of the opposing army, under cover of a wood and the undulations of the field, gained the left of Jackson's division, now commanded by Brigadier General Taliaferro, and poured a destructive fire into its flank and rear. Campbell's brigade fell back in confusion, exposing the flank of Taliaferro's, which also gave way, as did the left of Early's. The rest of his brigade, however, firmly held its ground. Vinder's brigade, with branches of A.P. Hill's division on its right, advanced promptly to the support of Jackson's division, and after a sanguinary struggle the assailants were repulsed with loss. Pender's and Archer's brigades, also of Hill's division, came up on the left of Vinder's, and by a general charge the foe was driven back in confusion, leaving the ground covered with his dead and wounded. General Ewell, with the two brigades on the extreme right, had been prevented from advancing by the fire of our own artillery, which swept his approach to the enemy's left. The obstacle being now removed, he pressed forward under a hot fire, and came gallantly into action. Repulsed and vigorously followed on our left and center, and now hotly pressed on our right, the whole line of the enemy gave way and was soon in full retreat. Night had now set in, but General Jackson, desiring to enter Culpeper Courthouse before morning, determined to pursue. Hill's division led the advance, but, owing to the darkness, it was compelled to move slowly and with caution. The enemy was found about a mile and a half in the rear of the field of battle, and information was received that reinforcements had arrived. General Jackson thereupon halted for the night, and the next day, becoming satisfied that the enemy's force had been so largely increased as to render a further advance on his part imprudent, he sent his wounded to the rear, and proceeded to bury the dead and collect the arms from the battlefield. On the 11th, the enemy asked and received permission to bury those of his dead not already interred. General Jackson remained in position during the day, and at night returned to the vicinity of Gordonsville. In this engagement, 400 prisoners, including a brigadier general, were captured, and 5,300 stand of small arms, one piece of artillery, several caissons, and three colors fell into our hands. Our killed were 229, wounded 1,047, total 1,276. The loss on the other side exceeded 1,500, of whom nearly 300 were taken prisoners. The victory of Cedar Run effectually checked the invader for a time, but it soon became apparent that his army was receiving a large increase. The corps of Major General Burnside from North Carolina, which had reached Fredericksburg, was reported to have moved up the Rappahannock a few days after the battle to unite with General Pope, and a part of General McClellan's army had left Westover for the same purpose. It therefore seemed that active operations on the James were no longer contemplated, and that the most effectual way to relieve Richmond from any danger of an attack would be to reinforce General Jackson and advance upon General Pope. Accordingly, on August 13th, Longstreet, Anderson, and Stuart were ordered to proceed to Gordonsville. 
On the 16th, the troops began to move from the vicinity of Gordonsville toward the Rapidan, on the north side of which, extending along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad in the direction of Culpeper Courthouse, the army of invasion lay in great force. It was determined with the cavalry to destroy the railroad bridge over the Rappahannock in rear of the enemy, while Jackson and Longstreet crossed the Rapidan and attacked his left flank. But the enemy, becoming apprised of our design, hastily retreated beyond the Rappahannock. On the 21st, our forces moved toward that river, and some sharp skirmishing ensued with our cavalry that had crossed at Beverly's Ford. As it had been determined in the meantime not to attempt the passage of the river at that point with the army, the cavalry withdrew to the south side. Soon afterward, the enemy appeared in great strength on the opposite bank, and an act of fire was kept up during the rest of the day between his artillery and the batteries attached to Jackson's leading division under Brigadier General Taliaferro. But as our positions on the south bank of the Rappahannock were commanded by those on the north bank, and which served to guard all the fords, General Lee determined to seek a more favorable place to cross higher up the river, and thus gain his adversary's right. Accordingly, General Longstreet was directed to leave Kelly's Ford on the 21st, and take the position in the vicinity of Beverly's Ford and the Orange and Alexandria Railroad Bridge, then held by Jackson, in order to mask the movement of the latter, who was instructed to ascend the river. On the 22nd, Jackson proceeded up the Rappahannock, leaving Trimble's brigade near Freeman's Ford to protect his train. In the afternoon, Longstreet sent General Hood with his own and Whiting's brigade to relieve Trimble. Hood had just reached the position when he and Trimble were attacked by a considerable force which had crossed at Freeman's Ford. After a short but spirited engagement, the enemy was driven precipitately over the river with heavy loss. General Jackson attempted to cross at Warrenton Springs Ford, but was interrupted by a heavy rain, which caused the river to rise so rapidly as to be impassable for infantry and artillery, and he withdrew the troops that had reached the opposite side. General Stewart, who had been directed to cut the railroad in rear of General Pope's army, crossed the Rappahannock on the morning of the 22nd, about six miles above the springs, with parts of Lee's and Robertson's brigades. He reached Catlett Station that night, but was prevented destroying the railroad bridge there by the same storm that arrested Jackson's movements. He captured more than 300 prisoners, including a number of officers. Apprehensive of the effect of the rain upon the streams, he recrossed the Rappahannock at Warrenton Springs. The rise of the river, rendering the lower fords impassable, enabled the enemy to concentrate his main body opposite General Jackson, and on the 24th Longstreet was ordered by General Lee to proceed to his support. Although retarded by the swollen condition of Hazel River and other tributaries of the Rappahannock, he reached Jeffersonton in the afternoon. General Jackson's command lay between that place and the Springs Ford, and a warm cannonade was progressing between the batteries of General A.P. Hill's division and those in his front. The enemy was massed between Warrenton and the Springs, and guarded the fords of the Rappahannock as far above as Waterloo. The army of General McClellan had left Westover, and part had marched to join General Pope. It was reported that the rest would soon follow. The greater part of the army of General Cox had also been withdrawn from the Kanawha Valley from the same purpose. Two brigades of D. H. Hill's division under General Ripley had already been ordered from Richmond, and the remainder were to follow. Also, McLaws's division, two brigades under General Walker, and Hampton's cavalry brigade. In pursuance of the plan of operations now determined upon, Jackson was directed, on the 25th, to cross above Waterloo and move around the enemy's right, so as to strike the Orange and Alexandria Railroad in his rear. Longstreet, in the meantime, was to divert his attention by threatening him in front, and to follow Jackson as soon as the latter should be sufficiently advanced. General Jackson crossed the Rappahannock on the 25th about four miles above Waterloo, and after sunset on the 26th reached the railroad at Bristow Station. At Gainesville he was joined by General Stewart with the brigades of Robertson and Fitzhugh Lee, who continued with him during his operations, and effectually guarded both his flanks. General Jackson was now between the large army of General Pope and Washington City, without having encountered any considerable force. At Bristow, two trains of cars were captured and a few prisoners taken, determining, notwithstanding the darkness of the night and the long and arduous march of the day, to capture the depot of the enemy at Manassas Junction, about seven miles distant. General Trimble volunteered to proceed at once to that place with the 21st North Carolina and the 21st Georgia regiments. The offer was accepted, and to render success more certain, General Stuart was directed to accompany the expedition with part of his cavalry. About midnight the place was taken with little difficulty. Eight pieces of artillery with their horses, ammunition, and equipments were captured. More than 300 prisoners, 175 horses, besides those belonging to the artillery, 200 new tents, and immense quantities of commissary and quartermaster stores fell into our hands. 
Ewell's division, with the 5th Virginia Cavalry under Colonel Bosser, were left at Bristow Station, and the rest of the command arrived at the junction early on the 27th. Soon a considerable force of the enemy under Brigadier General Taylor of New Jersey approached from the direction of Alexandria and pushed forward boldly to recover the stores. After a sharp engagement, he was routed and driven back, leaving his killed and wounded on the field. The troops remained at Manassas Junction during the day and supplied themselves with everything they required. In the afternoon, two brigades advanced against General Ewell at Bristow from the direction of Warrenton Junction, but were broken and repulsed. Their place was soon supplied with fresh troops, but it was apparent that the commander had now become aware of the situation of affairs and had turned upon General Jackson with his whole force. General Ewell, perceiving the strength of the column, withdrew and rejoined General Jackson, having first destroyed the railroad bridge over Broad Run. The enemy halted at Bristow. General Jackson, having a much inferior force to General Pope, retired from Manassas Junction and took a position west of the Turnpike Road from Warrenton to Alexandria, where he could more readily unite with the approaching column of Longstreet. Having supplied the wants of his troops, he was compelled, through lack of transportation, to destroy the rest of the captured property. Many thousand pounds of bacon, a thousand barrels of corned beef, two thousand barrels of salt pork, and two thousand barrels of flour, besides other property of great value, were burned. During the night of the 27th of August, Taliaferro's division crossed the turnpike near Groveton and halted on the west side near the battlefield of July 21st, 1861, where it was joined on the 28th by the divisions of Hill and Ewell. During the afternoon, the enemy, approaching from the direction of Warrenton down the turnpike toward Alexandria, exposed his left flank, and General Jackson determined to attack him. A fierce and sanguinary conflict ensued, which continued until about 9 p.m., when he slowly fell back and left us in possession of the field. The loss on both sides was heavy. On the next morning, the 29th, the enemy had taken a position to interpose his army between General Jackson and Alexandria, and about 10 a.m. opened with artillery upon the right of Jackson's line. The troops of the latter were disposed in rear of Groveton, along the line of the unfinished branch of the Manassas Gap Railroad, and extending from a point a short distance west of the turnpike towards Sudley Mill, Jackson's division under Brigadier General Stark being on the right, Swells under General Lawton in the center, and A.P. Hill on the left. The attacking columns were evidently concentrating on Jackson with the design of overwhelming him before the arrival of Longstreet. This latter officer left his position opposite Warrenton Springs on the 26th and marched to join Jackson. On the 28th, arriving at Thoroughfare Gap, he found the enemy prepared to dispute his progress. Holding the eastern extremity of the pass with a large force, the enemy directed a heavy fire of artillery upon the road leading to it and upon the sides of the mountain. An attempt was made to turn his right, but before our troops reached artillery upon the road leading to it and upon the sides of the mountain, holding the eastern extremity of the pass with a large force, the enemy directed a heavy fire of artillery upon the road leading to it and upon the sides of the mountain. An attempt was made to turn his right, but before our troops reached their destination, he advanced to the attack, and, being vigorously repulsed, withdrew to his position at the eastern end of the gap, keeping up an active fire of artillery until dark. He then retreated. On the morning of the 29th, Longstreet's command resumed its march, the sound of cannon at Manassas announcing that Jackson was already engaged. The head of the column came upon the field in rear of the enemy's left, which had already opened with artillery upon Jackson's right, as above stated. Longstreet immediately placed some of his batteries in position, but before he could complete his dispositions to attack the force before him, it withdrew to another part of the field. He then took position on the right of Jackson. Hood's two brigades, supported by Evans, being deployed across the turnpike and at right angles to it. These troops were supported on the left by three brigades under General Wilcox and by a like force on the right under General Kemper. D.B. Jones's division formed the extreme right of the line resting on the Manassas Gap Railroad. The cavalry guarded our right and left flanks, that on the right being under General Stewart in person. After the arrival of Longstreet, the enemy changed his position and began to concentrate opposite Jackson's left, opening a brisk artillery fire, which was responded to by some of A.P. Hill's batteries. Soon after, General Stewart reported the approach of a large force from the direction of Bristow Station, threatening Longstreet's right, but no serious attack was made, and after firing a few shots, that force withdrew. Meanwhile, a large column advanced to assail the left of Jackson's position, occupied by the division of General A.P. Hill. The attack was received by his troops with their accustomed steadiness, and the battle raged with great fury. The enemy was repeatedly repulsed, but again pressed on the attack with fresh troops. 
Once he succeeded in penetrating an interval between General Gregg's brigade on the extreme left and that of General Thomas, but was quickly driven back with great slaughter by the 14th South Carolina Regiment, then in reserve, and the 49th Georgia of Thomas's brigade. The contest was close and obstinate. The combatants sometimes delivered their fire at a few paces. General Gregg, who was most exposed, was reinforced by Hayes's brigade under Colonel Forno. Gregg had successfully and most gallantly resisted the attack until the ammunition of his brigade was exhausted, and all his field officers but two killed or wounded. The reinforcement was of like high-tempered steel, and together in hand-to-hand -hand fight they held their post until they were relieved, after several hours of severe fighting, by Early's brigade and the 8th Louisiana Regiment. General Early drove the enemy back with heavy loss, and pursued about 200 yards beyond the line of battle when he was recalled to the position on the railroad, where Thomas, Pender, and Archer had firmly held their ground against every attack. While the battle was raging on Jackson's left, Hood and Evans were ordered by Longstreet to advance, but before the order could be obeyed, Hood was himself attacked, and his command became at once warmly engaged. The enemy was repulsed by Hood after a severe contest, and fell back, closely followed by our troops. The battle continued until 9 p.m., the foe retreating until he reached a strong position, which he held with a large force. Our troops remained in their advanced position until early next morning, when they were withdrawn to their first line. One piece of artillery, several stands of colors, and a number of prisoners were captured. Our loss was severe. On the morning of the 30th, the enemy again advanced, and skirmishing began along the line. The troops of Jackson and Longstreet maintained their position of the previous day. At noon, the firing of the batteries ceased, and all was quiet for some hours. About 3 p.m., the enemy, having massed his troops in front of General Jackson, advanced against his position in strong force. His front line pushed forward until it was engaged at close quarters by Jackson's troops, when its progress was cheeked, and a fierce and bloody struggle ensued. A second and third line of great strength moved up to support the first, but in doing so came within easy range of a position a little in advance of Longstreet's left. He immediately ordered up two batteries, and, two others being thrown forward about the same time by Colonel S. D. Lee, the supporting lines were broken, and fell back in confusion under their well-directed and destructive fire. Their repeated efforts to rally were unavailing, and Jackson's troops, being thus relieved from the pressure of overwhelming numbers, began to press steadily forward, driving everything before them. The enemy retreated in confusion, suffering severely from our artillery, which advanced as he retired. General Longstreet, anticipating the order for a general advance, now threw his whole command against the center and left. The whole line swept steadily on, driving the opponents with great carnage from each successive position until 10 p.m. when darkness put an end to the battle and the pursuit. The obscurity of the night and the uncertainty of the fords of Bull Run rendered it necessary to suspend operations until morning, when the cavalry, being pushed forward, discovered that the retreat had continued to the strong position of Centerville, about four miles beyond Bull Run. The prevalence of a heavy rain, which began during the night, threatened to render Bull Run impassable, and to impede our movements. Longstreet remained on the battlefield to engage attention and to protect parties for the burial of the dead and the removal of the wounded, while Jackson proceeded by Sudley's Ford to the Little River Turnpike to turn the enemy's right and intercept his retreat to Washington. Jackson's progress was retarded by the inclemency of the weather and the fatigue of his troops. He reached the turnpike in the evening, and the next day, September 1st, advanced by that road toward Fairfax Courthouse. The enemy, in the meantime, was falling back rapidly toward Washington, and had thrown a strong force to Germantown on the Little River Turnpike to cover his line of retreat from Centerville. The advance of Jackson encountered him at Ox Hill, near Germantown, about 5 p.m. Line of battle was at once formed, and two brigades were thrown forward to attack and ascertain the strength of the position. A cold and drenching rainstorm drove in the faces of our troops as they advanced and gallantly engaged. They were subsequently supported, and the conflict was obstinately maintained until dark, when the enemy retreated, having lost two general officers, one of whom, Major General Kearney, was left dead on the field. Longstreet's command arrived after the action was over, and the next morning it was found that the retreat had been so rapid that the attempt to intercept was abandoned. The proximity of the fortifications around Alexandria and Washington was enough to prevent further pursuit. Our army rested during the second near Chantilly the retreating foe being followed only by our cavalry, who continued to harass him until he reached the shelter of his entrenchments. In the series of engagements on the plains of Manassas, more than 7,000 prisoners were taken, in addition to about 2,000 wounded left in our hands. 
thirty pieces of artillery, upward of twenty thousand stand of small arms, numerous colors, and a large amount of stores, besides those taken by General Jackson at Manassas Junction, were captured. Major General Pope, in his report, says, The whole force that I had at Centerville, as reported to me by the Corps commanders, on the morning of the 1st of September, was as follows. McDowell's Corps, 10,000 men. Siegel's Corps, about 7,000. Heinzelman's Corps, about 6,000. Reno's, 6,000. Banks's, 5,000. Sumner's, 11,000. Porter's, 10,000. Franklin's, 8,000. In all, 63,000 men. The small fraction of 20,500 men was all of the 91,000 veteran troops from Harrison's Landing which ever drew trigger under my command. Our losses in the engagement at Manassas Plains were considerable. The number killed was 1,090, wounded 6,154, total 7,244. The loss of the enemy in killed, wounded, and missing was estimated between 15,000 and 20,000. The strength of our army in July and September is stated on a preceding page. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucas Chang. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2 by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 35. Return of the Enemy to Washington. War transferred to the frontier. Condition of Maryland. Crossing the Potomac. Evacuation of Martinsburg. Advance into Maryland. Large force of the enemy. Resistance at Boonesboro. Surrender of Harper's Ferry. Our forces reach Sharpsburg. Letter of the President to General Lee. Address of General Lee to the people. Position of our forces at Sharpsburg. Battle of Sharpsburg. Our strength. Forces withdrawn. Casualties. The enemy having retired to the protection of the fortifications around Washington and Alexandria, Lee's army marched on September 3rd toward Leesburg. The armies of Generals McClellan and Pope had now been brought back to the point from which they set out on the campaign of the spring and summer. The objects of these campaigns had been frustrated and the hostile designs against the coast of North Carolina and in western Virginia, thwarted by the withdrawal of the main body of the forces from those regions. Northeastern Virginia was freed from the presence of the invader. His forces had withdrawn to the entrenchments of Washington. Soon after the arrival of our army at Leesburg, information was received that the hostile troops which had occupied Winchester had retired to Harper's Ferry. The war was thus transferred from the interior to the frontier, and the supplies of rich and productive districts were made accessible to our army. To prolong a state of affairs in every way desirable, and not to permit the season for active operations to pass without endeavoring to impose further check on our assailant, the best course appeared to be the transfer of our army into Maryland. Although not properly equipped for invasion, lacking much of the material of war, and deficient in transportation, the troops poorly provided with clothing, and thousands of them without shoes, it was yet believed to be strong enough to detain the opposing army upon the northern frontier until the approach of winter should render its advance into Virginia difficult, if not impracticable. The condition of Maryland encouraged the belief that the presence of our army, though numerically inferior to that of the North, would induce the Washington government to retain all its available force to provide against contingencies which its conduct toward the people of that state gave reason to apprehend. At the same time, it was hoped that military success might afford us an opportunity to aid the citizens of Maryland in any efforts they should be disposed to make to recover their liberty. The difficulties that surrounded them were fully appreciated, 
and we expected to derive more assistance in the attainment of our object from the just fears of the Washington government than from any active demonstration on the part of the people of Maryland, unless success should enable us to give them assurance of continued protection. Influenced by these considerations, the army was put in motion. It was decided to cross the Potomac east of the Blue Ridge in order, by threatening Washington and Baltimore, to cause the enemy to withdraw from the South Bank, where his presence endangered our communications and the safety of those engaged in the removal of our wounded and the captured property from the late battlefield. Having accomplished this result, it was proposed to move the army into western Maryland, establish our communication with Richmond through the valley of the Shenandoah, and, by threatening Pennsylvania, induce the enemy to withdraw from our territory for the protection of his own. General D. H. Hill's division, being in advance, crossed the Potomac between September 4th and 7th at the ford near Leesburg, and encamped in the vicinity of Frederick. It had been supposed that this advance would lead to the evacuation of Martinsburg and Harper's Ferry, thus opening the line of communication through the Shenandoah Valley. This not having occurred, it became necessary to dislodge the garrisons from those positions before concentrating the army west of the mountains. For this purpose, General Jackson marched very rapidly, crossed the Potomac near Williamsport on the 11th, sent Hill's division directly to Martinsburg, and disposed of the rest of the command so as to cut off retreat to the westward. The enemy evacuated Martinsburg and retired to Harper's Ferry on the night of the 11th, and Jackson entered the former on the 12th. Meanwhile, General McLaws had been ordered to seize Maryland Heights on the north side of the Potomac, opposite Harper's Ferry, and General Walker took possession of Loudoun Heights on the east side of the Shenandoah, where it unites with the Potomac and was in readiness to open fire upon Harper's Ferry. But McLaws found the heights in possession of the foe, with infantry and artillery, protected by entrenchments. On the 13th, he assailed the works, and after a spirited contest, they were carried. The troops made good their retreat to Harper's Ferry, and on the next day, its investment was complete. At the same time that the march of these troops upon Harper's Ferry began, the remainder of General Longstreet's command and the division of D.H. Hill crossed the South Mountain and moved toward Boonesboro. General Stuart, with the cavalry, remained east of the mountains to observe the enemy and retard his advance. Longstreet continued his march to Hagerstown, and Hill halted near Boonesboro to support the cavalry and to prevent the force invested at Harper's Ferry from escaping through Pleasant Valley. The advance of the hostile army was then so slow as to justify the belief that the reduction of Harper's Ferry would be accomplished, and our troops concentrated before they would be called upon to meet the foe. In that event, it had not been intended to oppose his passage through South Mountain, as it was desired to engage him as far as possible from his base. But a copy of Lee's order directing the movement of the army from Frederick happening to fall into the hands of McClellan, disclosed to him the disposition of our forces. He immediately began to push forward rapidly, and on the afternoon of the 13th was reported as approaching the pass in South Mountain on the Boonesboro and Frederick Road. General Stewart's cavalry impeded his progress, and time was thus gained for preparations to oppose his advance. In Taylor's Four Years with General Lee, some facts relative to this lost order are stated. An order of battle was issued, stating in detail the position and duly assigned to each command of the army. Quote, it was the custom to send copies of such orders, marked confidential, to the commanders of separate corps or divisions only, and to place the address of such separate commander in the bottom left-hand corner of the sheet containing the order. General D. H. Hill was in command of a division which had not been attached to, nor incorporated with, either of the two wings of the Army of Northern Virginia. A copy of the order was, therefore, in the usual course sent to him. After the evacuation of Frederick City by our forces, a copy of General Lee's order was found in a deserted camp by a soldier, and was soon in the hands of General McClellan. The copy of the order, it was stated at the time, was addressed to General D. H. Hill, commanding division. General Hill has assured me that it could not have been his copy, 
because he still has the original order received by him in his possession. End quote. Footnote. To these remarks, Colonel W. H. Taylor adds the following note. Quote, Colonel Venable, one of my associates on the staff of General Lee, says in regard to this matter. This is very easily explained. One copy was sent directly to Hill from headquarters. General Jackson sent him a copy as he regarded Hill in his command. It is Jackson's copy in his own handwriting which General Hill has. The other was undoubtedly left carelessly by someone at Hill's quarters. Says General McClellan, Upon learning the contents of this order, I at once gave orders for a vigorous pursuit. End quote. General McClellan's Testimony, Report on the Conduct of the War, Part 1, page 440. End quote. End of footnote. General D. H. Hill guarded the Boonesboro Gap and Longstreet was ordered to support him in order to prevent a force from penetrating the mountains at this point, in the rear of McLaws, so as to relieve the garrison at Harper's Ferry. Early on the 14th, a large body of the enemy attempted to force its way to the rear of the position held by Hill, by a road south of the Boonesboro and Frederick Turnpike. The small command of Hill, with Garland's brigade, repelled the repeated assaults of the army, and held it in check for five hours. Longstreet, leaving a brigade at Hagerstown, hurried to the assistance of Hill, and reached the scene of action between 3 and 4 p.m. The battle continued with great animation until night. On the south of the turnpike, the assailant was driven back some distance, and his attack on the center repulsed with loss. Darkness put an end to the contest. The effort to force the pass of the mountain had failed, but it was manifest that without reinforcements, Lee could not hazard a renewal of the engagement, for McClellan, by his great superiority of numbers, could easily turn either flank. Information was also received that another large body of his troops had, during the afternoon, forced its way through Crampton Gap, only five miles in rear of McLaws. Under these circumstances, it was determined to retire to Sharpsburg, where we would be on the flank and rear of the enemy should he move against McLaws, and where we could more readily unite with the rest of our army. This movement, skillfully and efficiently covered by the cavalry brigade of General Fitzhugh Lee, was accomplished without interruption. The advance of McClellan's army did not appear on the west side of the pass at Boonesboro until about 8 a.m. on the following morning. The resistance that our troops had offered there secured sufficient time to enable General Jackson to complete the reduction of Harper's Ferry. The attack on the garrison began at dawn on the 15th. A rapid and vigorous fire was opened by the batteries of General Jackson, in conjunction with those on Maryland and Loudoun Heights. In about two hours, the garrison, consisting of more than 11,000 men, surrendered. 73 pieces of artillery, about 13,000 small arms, and a large quantity of military stores fell into our hands. General A. P. Hill remained formally to receive the surrender of the troops and to secure the captured property. The commands of Longstreet and D. H. Hill reached Sharpsburg on the morning of the 15th. General Jackson arrived early on the 16th, and General J. G. Walker came up in the afternoon. The movements of General McLaws were embarrassed by the presence of the enemy in Crampton Gap. He retained his position until the 14th, when, finding that he was not to be attacked, he gradually withdrew his command toward the Potomac, then crossed at Harper's Ferry and marched by way of Shepherdstown. His progress was slow, and he did not reach the battlefield at Sharpsburg until some time after the engagement of the 17th began. At this time, the letter from which the following extract is made was addressed by me to General R. E. Lee, commanding our forces in Maryland. Quote, Sir, it is deemed proper that you should, in accordance with established usage, announce by proclamation to the people of Maryland the motives and purposes of your presence among them at the head of an invading army and you are instructed in such proclamation to make known, end quote, etc. In obedience to instructions, General Lee issued the following address, quote, 
Headquarters, Army of Northern Virginia, near Frederick, September 8, 1862. To the people of Maryland, it is right that you should know the purpose that has brought the army under my command within the limits of your state, so far as that purpose concerns yourselves. The people of the Confederate States have long watched, with the deepest sympathy, the wrongs and outrages that have been inflicted upon the citizens of a commonwealth allied to the states of the South by the strongest social, political, and commercial ties, and reduced to the condition of a conquered province. Under the pretense of supporting the Constitution, but in violation of its most valuable provisions, your citizens have been arrested and imprisoned upon no charge, and contrary to the forms of law. A faithful and manly protest against this outrage, made by a venerable and illustrious Marylander, to whom in his better days no citizen appealed for right in vain, was treated with scorn and contempt. The government of your chief city has been usurped by armed strangers. Your legislature has been dissolved by the unlawful arrest of its members. Freedom of the press and of speech has been suppressed. Words have been declared offenses by an arbitrary decree of the federal executive and citizens ordered to be tried by military commissions for what they may dare to speak. Believing that the people of Maryland possess a spirit too lofty to submit to such a government, the people of the South have long wished to aid you in throwing off this foreign yoke, to enable you again to enjoy the inalienable rights of freemen, and restore the independence and sovereignty of your state. In obedience to this wish, our army has come among you and is prepared to assist you with the power of its arms in regaining the rights of which you have been so unjustly despoiled. This, citizens of Maryland, is our mission, so far as you are concerned. No restraint upon your free will is intended. No intimidation will be allowed within the limits of this army, at least. Marylanders shall once more enjoy their ancient freedom of thought and speech. We know no enemies among you, and will protect all of you in every opinion. It is for you to decide your destiny, freely and without constraint. This army will respect your choice, whatever it may be, and, while the southern people will rejoice to welcome you to your natural position among them, they will only welcome you when you come of your own free will. R. E. Lee, General Commanding. End quote. The commands of Longstreet and D. H. Hill on their arrival at Sharpsburg, were placed in position along the range of hills between the town and the Antietam, nearly parallel to the course of that stream, Longstreet on the right of the road to Boonesboro, and Hill on the left. The advance of the enemy was delayed by the determined opposition he encountered from Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry, and he did not appear on the opposite side of the Antietam until about 2 p.m. During the afternoon, the batteries on each side were partially engaged. On the 16th, the artillery fire became warm and continued throughout the day. A column crossed the Antietam beyond the reach of our batteries and menaced our left. In anticipation of this movement, Hood's two brigades had been transferred from the right and posted between D.H. Hill and the Hagerstown Road. General Jackson was now directed to take position on Hood's left and formed his line with his right resting on the Hagerstown Road and his left extending toward the Potomac, protected by General Stuart with the cavalry and horse artillery. General Walker, with his two brigades, was stationed on Longstreet's right. As evening approached, the enemy fired more vigorously with his artillery and bore down heavily with his infantry upon Hood, but the attack was gallantly repulsed. At 10 p.m., Hood's troops were relieved by the brigades of Lawton and Trimble, of Ewell's division, commanded by General Lawton. Jackson's own division, under General J. K. Jones, was on Lawton's left, supported by the remaining brigades of Ewell. At early dawn on the 17th, his artillery opened vigorously from both sides of the Antietam, the heaviest fire being directed against our left. Under cover of this fire, a large force of infantry attacked General Jackson's division. They were met by his troops with the utmost resolution, and for several hours the conflict raged with intense fury and alternate success. Our troops advanced with great spirit. The enemy's lines were repeatedly broken and forced to retire. Fresh troops, however, soon replaced those that were beaten, 
and Jackson's men were in turn compelled to fall back. Nearly all the field officers, with a large proportion of the men, were killed or wounded. Our troops slowly yielded to overwhelming numbers and fell back, obstinately disputing every point. General Early, in command of Ewell's division, was ordered with his brigade to take the place of Jackson's division, most of which was withdrawn, its ammunition being nearly exhausted and its numbers much reduced. The battle now raged with great violence the small commands under Hood and Early holding their ground against many times their own infantry force and under a tremendous fire of artillery. Hood was reinforced, then the enemy's lines were broken and driven back, but fresh numbers advanced to their support, and they began to gain ground. The desperate resistance they encountered, however, delayed their progress until the troops of McLaws arrived, and those of General J. G. Walker could be brought from the right. Hood's brigade, though it had suffered extraordinary loss, only withdrew to replenish their ammunition, their supply being entirely exhausted. They were relieved by Walker's command, who immediately attacked vigorously, driving his combatant back with much slaughter. Upon the arrival of the reinforcements under McLaws, General Early attacked resolutely the large force opposed to him. McLaws advanced at the same time, and the forces before them were driven back in confusion closely followed by our troops beyond the position occupied at the beginning of the engagement. The attack on our left was speedily followed by one in heavy force on the center. This was met by part of Walker's division and the brigades of G. B. Anderson and Rhodes of D. H. Hill's command, assisted by a few pieces of artillery. General R. H. Anderson's division came to Hill's support and formed in rear of his line. At this time, by a mistake of orders, Rhodes's brigade was withdrawn from its position. During the absence of that command, a column pressed through the gap thus created, and G.B. Anderson's brigade was broken and retired. The heavy masses moved forward, being opposed only by four pieces of artillery, supported by a few hundred of our men belonging to different brigades, rallied by Hill and other officers, and parts of Walker's and B.H. Anderson's commands. Colonel Cook, with the 27th North Carolina Regiment, stood boldly in line without a cartridge. The firm front presented by this small force and the well-directed fire of the artillery checked the progress of the enemy, and in about an hour and a half he retired. Another attack was made soon afterward a little farther to the right, but was repulsed by Miller's guns of the Washington artillery, which continued to hold the ground until the close of the engagement supported by a part of R. H. Anderson's troops. The corps designated the Washington Artillery was composed of Louisiana batteries, organized at New Orleans in the beginning of the war, under Colonel I. B. Walton. It was distinguished by its services in the First Great Battle of Manassas, and in nearly every important conflict, as well of the Army of Virginia as that of Tennessee, to the close of the war. In the official reports and in the traditions of both armies, the names of the batteries of the Washington Artillery have frequent and honorable mention. While the attack on the center and left was in progress, repeated efforts were made to force the passage of the bridge over the Antietam, opposite the right wing of Longstreet, commanded by Brigadier General D. R. Jones. The bridge was defended by General Toombs with two regiments of his brigade and the batteries of General Jones. This small command repulsed five different assaults made by a greatly superior force. In the afternoon, the enemy, in large numbers, having passed the stream, advanced against General Jones, who held the ridge with less than 2,000 men. After a determined and brave resistance, he was forced to give way, and the summit was gained. General A. P. Hill, having arrived from Harper's Ferry, was now ordered to reinforce General Jones. He moved to his support and attacked the force now flushed with success. Hill's batteries were thrown forward and united their fire with those of Jones, and one of D. H. Hill's also opened with good effect from the left of the Boonesboro Road. The progress of the enemy was immediately arrested, and his line began to waver. At this moment, General Jones ordered Toombs to charge the flank, while Archer, supported by Branch and Gregg, moved on the front of the enemy's line. After a brief resistance, he
he broke and retreated in confusion toward the Antietam, pursued by the troops of Hill and Jones, until he reached the protection of the batteries on the opposite side of the river. It was now nearly dark, and McClellan had massed a number of batteries to sweep the approach to the Antietam, on the opposite side of which the corps of General Porter, which had not been engaged, now appeared to dispute our advance. Our troops were much exhausted and greatly reduced in numbers by fatigue and the casualties of battle. Under these circumstances, it was deemed injudicious to push our advantage further in the face of these fresh troops added to an army previously much exceeding the number of our own. Ours were accordingly recalled, and formed on the line originally held by General Jones. The repulse on the right ended the engagement, a protracted and sanguinary conflict in which every effort to dislodge us from our position had been defeated with severe loss. This great battle was fought by less than 40,000 men on our side, all of whom had undergone the greatest labors and hardships in the field and on the march. Nothing could surpass the determined valor with which they met the large army of the enemy, fully supplied and equipped, and the result reflected the highest credit on the officers and men engaged. On the 18th, our forces occupied the position of the preceding day, except in the center where our line was drawn in about 200 yards. Our ranks were increased by the arrival of a number of troops who had not been engaged the day before, and, though still too weak to assume the offensive, Lee waited without apprehension a renewal of the attack. The day passed without any hostile demonstration. During the night of the 18th, our army was withdrawn to the south side of the Potomac, crossing near Shepherdstown without loss or molestation. The enemy advanced on the next morning, but was held in check by General Fitzhugh Lee with his cavalry. The condition of our troops now demanded repose, and the army marched to the Opecken near Martinsburg, where it remained several days and then moved to the vicinity of Bunker Hill and Winchester. General McClellan seemed to be concentrating in and near Harper's Ferry, but made no forward movement. The contest on our left in this battle was the most violent. This and the deprivation of our men are very forcibly shown in the following account of Major General Hood. Quote, on the morning of the 15th, my forces were again in motion. My troops at this period were sorely in need of shoes, clothing, and food. We had issued to us no meat for several days, and little or no bread. The men had been forced to subsist principally on green corn and green apples. Nevertheless, they were in high spirits and defiant as we contended with the advanced guard of McClellan on the 15th and forenoon of the 16th. During the afternoon of this day, I was ordered, after great fatigue and hunger endured by my soldiers, to take position near the Hagerstown Turnpike, in open field in front of the Dunkard Church. General Hooker's corps crossed the Antietam, swung round with its front on the pike, and about an hour before sunset, encountered my division. I had stationed one or two batteries on a hillock in a meadow, near the edge of a cornfield and just by the pike. The Texas Brigade had been disposed on the left, and that of Law on the right. We opened fire, and a spirited action ensued, which lasted till a late hour in the night. When the firing had, in a great measure, ceased, we were so close to the enemy that we could distinctly hear him massing his heavy bodies in our immediate front. The extreme suffering of my troops for want of food induced me to ride back to General Lee, and request him to send two or more brigades to our relief, at least for the night in order that the soldiers might have a chance to cook their meager rations. He said that he would cheerfully do so, but he knew of no command that could be spared for the purpose. He, however, suggested that I should see General Jackson and endeavor to obtain assistance from him. After riding a long time in search of the latter, I finally discovered him alone, lying upon the ground, asleep by the root of a tree. I aroused him and made known the half-starved condition of my troops. He immediately ordered Lawton's, Trimble's, and Hayes's brigades to our relief. He exacted of me, however, a promise that I would come to the support of these forces the moment I was called upon. I quickly rode off in search of my wagons that the men might prepare and cook their flour, as we were still without meat. Unfortunately, the night was then far advanced, and, although every effort was made in the darkness to get the wagons forward, 
dawn of the morning of the seventeenth broke upon us before many of the men had time to do more than prepare the dough soon thereafter an officer of lawton's staff dashed up to me saying general lawton sends his compliments with the request that you come at once to his support to arms was instantly sounded and quite a large number of my brave soldiers were again obliged to march to the front leaving their uncooked rations in camp not far distant in our front were drawn up in close array heavy columns of federal infantry not less than two corps were in sight to oppose my small command numbering approximately two thousand effectives however with the trusty law on my right in the edge of the wood and the gallant colonel wafford in command of the texas brigade on the left near the pike we moved forward to the assault notwithstanding the overwhelming odds of over ten to one against us we drove the enemy from the wood and cornfield back upon his reserves and forced him to abandon his guns on our left this most deadly combat raged till our last round of ammunition was expended the first texas regiment had lost in the cornfield fully two-thirds of its number and whole ranks of brave men whose deeds were unrecorded save in the hearts of loved ones at home were mowed down in heaps to the right and left never before was i so continually troubled with fear that my horse would further injure some wounded fellow soldier lying helpless upon the ground our right flank during this short but seemingly long space of time was toward the main line of the federals and after several ineffectual efforts to procure reinforcements and our last shot had been fired I ordered my troops back to Dunkard Church for the same reason which had previously compelled Lawton, Hayes, and Trimble to retire, a want of cartridges. Upon the arrival of McLaws's division, we marched to the rear, renewed our supply of ammunition, and returned to our position in the wood near the church, which ground we held till a late hour in the afternoon, when we moved somewhat farther to the right and bivouacked for the night. With the close of this bloody day ceased the hardest-fought battle of the war. End quote. The following account of Colonel Taylor in his Four Years with General Lee is more comprehensive, embracing the other forces besides Hood's brigade. Quote, on the afternoon of the 16th, General McClellan directed an attack by Hooker's Corps on the Confederate left, Hood's two brigades, and during the whole of the 17th the battle was waged with varying intensity along the entire line. When the issue was first joined, on the afternoon of the 16th, General Lee had with him less than 18,000 men, consisting of the commands of Longstreet and D.H. Hill, the two divisions of Jackson, and two brigades under Walker. Couriers were sent to the rear to hurry up the divisions of A.P. Hill, Anderson, and McLaws, hastening from Harper's Ferry, and these several commands, as they reached the front at intervals during the day on the 17th, were immediately deployed and put to work. Every man was engaged. We had no reserve. The fighting was heaviest and most continuous on the Confederate left. It is established by Federal evidence that the three corps of Hooker, Mansfield, and Sumner were completely shattered in the repeated but fruitless efforts to turn this flank and two of these corps were rendered useless for further aggressive movements. The aggregate strength of the attacking column at this point reached 40,000 men, not counting the two divisions of Franklin's corps, sent at a late hour in the day to rescue the Federal right from the impending danger of being itself destroyed, while the Confederates, from first to last, had less than 14,000 men on this flank, consisting of Jackson's two divisions, McLaws's division, and the two small divisions of two brigades each under hood and walker with which to resist their fierce and oft-repeated assaults the disproportion in the center and on our right was as great as or even more decided than on our left End quote. in the report of committee on the conduct of the war part one page 368 general sumner testifies as follows quote, general hooker's corps was dispersed there is no question about that. I sent one of my staff officers to find where they were, and General Ricketts, the only officer he could find, said that he could not raise 300 men of the Corps. There were troops lying down on the left, which I took to belong to Mansfield's command. In the meantime, General Mansfield had been killed, and a portion of his Corps had also been thrown into confusion. End quote. 
The testimony of General McClellan in the same report, Part 1, page 441, is to the same effect. Quote, the next morning, the 18th, I found that our loss had been so great, and there was so much disorganization in name of the commands, that I did not consider it proper to renew the attack that day, especially as I was sure of the arrival that day of two fresh divisions, amounting to about 15,000 men. As an instance of the condition of some of the troops that morning, I happened to recollect the returns of the First Corps. General Hooker's, made on the morning of the 18th, by which there were 3,500 men reported present for duty. Four days after that, the returns of the same corps showed 13,500. End quote. On the night of the 19th, our forces crossed the Potomac, and some brigades of the enemy followed. In the morning, General A. P. Hill, who commanded the rear guard, was ordered to drive them back. Having disposed his forces, an attack was made, and, as the foe massed in front of General Pender's brigade and endeavored to turn his flank, General Hill says, in his report, quote, A simultaneous daring charge was made, and the enemy driven pell-mell into the river. Then commenced the most terrible slaughter that this war has yet witnessed. The broad surface of the Potomac was blue with the floating bodies of our foe, but few escaped to tell the tale. By their own account, they lost 3,000 men killed and drowned from one brigade alone. Some 200 prisoners were taken. End quote. General McClellan states in his official report that he had in this battle, in action, 87,164 men of all arms. The official reports of the commanding officers of our forces made at the time show our total effective infantry to have been 27,255. The estimate made for the cavalry and artillery, which is rather excessive, is 8,000. This would make General Lee's entire strength 35,255. The official return of the Army of Northern Virginia on September 22, 1862, after its return to Virginia and when the stragglers had rejoined their commands, shows present for duty 36,187 infantry and artillery. The cavalry, of which there is no report, would perhaps increase these figures to 40,000 of all arms. The return of the United States Army of the Potomac on September 20, 1862, shows present for duty at that date of the commands that participated in the Battle of Sharpsburg, 85,930 of all arms. The loss of the enemy at Boonesboro and Sharpsburg was 14,794. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 36. Efforts of the Enemy to Obtain Our Cotton. Demands of European Manufacturers. Thousands of operatives resorting to the poor rates. Complaint of Her Majesty's Secretary of State. Letter of Mr. Seward. Promise to open all channels of commerce. Series of measures adopted by the United States. Act of Congress. Its provisions. Its operation. Unconstitutional measures. President Lincoln and accomplice. Not authorized by a state of war. Case before Chief Justice Taney. His decision. Expedition sent by the United States government to seize localities. An act providing for the appointment of special agents to seize abandoned or captured property. The views of General Grant, weakening his strength one-third. Our country divided into districts, and federal agents appointed, continued to the close of the war. A class of measures was adopted by the government of the United States, the object of which was practically and effectively to plunder us of a large portion of our crop of cotton and secure its transportation to the manufacturers of Europe. The foreign necessity for our cotton is represented in these words of Her Majesty's Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs on May 6, 1862, when speaking of the blockade of our ports. Thousands are now obliged to resort to the poor rates for subsistence owing to this blockade. 
Yet Her Majesty's government have not sought to take advantage of the obvious imperfections of this blockade in order to declare it ineffective. They have, to the loss and detriment of the British nation, scrupulously observed the duties of Great Britain to a friendly state. The severity of the distress thus alluded to was such, both in Great Britain and France, as to produce an intervention of the governments of those countries to alleviate it. Instead, however, of adopting those measures required in the exercise of justice to the Confederacy, and which would have been sustained by the law of nations by declaring the blockade ineffective, as it really was, they sought through informal applications to Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State for the United States, to obtain opportunities for an increased exportation of cotton from the Confederacy. This is explained by Mr. Seward in a letter to Mr. Adams, the Minister at London, dated July 28, 1862 in which he writes as follows. The President has given respectful consideration to the desire informally expressed to me by the governments of Great Britain and France for some farther relaxation of the blockade in favor of that trade. They are not rejected, but are yet held under consideration, with a view to ascertain more satisfactorily whether they are really necessary and whether they can be adopted without such serious detriment to our military operations as would render them injurious rather than beneficial to the interest of all concerned. In the same letter, Mr. Seward had previously said, We shall speedily open all the channels of commerce and free them from military embarrassments, and cotton, so much desired by all nations, will flow forth as freely as heretofore. We have ascertained that there are three and a half millions of bales yet remaining in the region where it was produced. The large quantities of it, are yet unginned and otherwise unprepared for market. We have instructed the military authorities to favor, so far as they can consistently, with the public safety, its preparation for and dispatch to the markets where it is so much wanted. It has been stated elsewhere in these pages that it became apparent that by some understanding, express or tacit, Europe had decided to leave the initiative in all actions touching the contest on this continent to the two powers just named, Great Britain and France who were recognized to have the largest interest involved. By the preceding extracts, the demands of the governments of Great Britain and France for increased facilities by which to obtain a greater supply of cotton are evident. At the same time, the determination of the government of the United States to fulfill those demands is apparent, although it placed itself under the necessity of fitting out some military expeditions against those portions of our territory where it was supposed the foraging for cotton would be likely to meet with the greatest success. By reference to the series of measures adopted by the government of the United States to secure possession of our cotton, it will be seen that it was inaugurated as early as July 13, 1861. This was within ten days after the commencement of the first and extra session of Congress under the administration of President Lincoln. It is scarcely credible that that government, at so early a day, foresaw the pressing demand from Europe for cotton which would ensue a year later. Yet it would seem that we must suppose such to have been its foresight, or else conclude that the first of these measures was the inauguration of a grand scheme for the plunder of our cotton crop to enrich whomsoever it might concern. The Act of the United States Congress of July 13, 1861, above mentioned, was entitled An Act to Provide for the Collection of Duties on Imports and for Other Purposes. Under the Other Purposes, the important features of the Act are contained. Section 5 provides that When said insurgents claim to act under the authority of any state or states, and such claim is not disclaimed or repudiated by the persons exercising the functions of government in such state or states, or in part or parts thereof in which said combination exists, or such insurrection suppressed by said state or states, then and in such case it may be and shall be lawful for the President by proclamation, to declare that the inhabitants of any such state, or any section or part thereof, where such insurrection exists, are in a state of insurrection against the United States, and thereupon all commercial intercourse by and between the same and the citizens thereof and the citizens of the rest of the United States shall cease and be unlawful, so long as such condition of hostility shall continue, and all goods and chattels, wares and merchandise, coming from said state or section into the other parts of the United States, and all proceeding to such state or section by land or water, shall together with the vessel or vehicle conveying the same, or conveying persons to or from such state or section, be forfeited to the United States, provided, however, 
that the President may, in his discretion, license and permit commercial intercourse with any such part of said state or section, the inhabitants of which are so declared in a state of insurrection, in such articles and for such time, and by such persons as he, in his discretion, may think most conducive to the public interest, and such intercourse, so far as by him licensed, shall be conducted and carried on only in pursuance of rules and regulations prescribed by the Secretary of the Treasury. And the Secretary of the Treasury may appoint such officers at places where officers of the customs are not now authorized by law, as may be needed to carry into effect such licenses, rules, and regulations. It was provided in Section 9 as follows. Proceedings on seizures for forfeitures under this Act may be pursued in the courts of the United States in any district into which the property so seized may be taken and proceedings instituted. It will be seen by reference to the provisions of this section that the President of the United States was authorized to issue his proclamation declaring the inhabitants of any of our states or of a portion of any one of them to be an insurrection, and thereupon all commercial intercourse became unlawful and was required to cease, and all goods and chattels, wares and merchandise, on the way to or from the state or part of a state, were forfeited to the United States, together with the vessel or vehicle in which they were conveyed. Two effects follow this proclamation. First, the cessation of all commercial intercourse with the citizens of the United States. Second, the forfeiture of all goods in transit to. When this condition has been reached, the Act then authorizes the President, in his discretion, by license, to reopen trade in such articles and for such time, and by such persons, as he may think most conductive to the public interest. The articles of trade were to be chiefly cotton and tobacco. The time during which it might be continued was evidently so long as it could be used for the purpose in view. The persons were those who would most skillfully advance the end to be accomplished, and the public interest was the collection and transportation of the cotton to the European manufacturers. One may search the Constitution of the United States in vain to find any grant of power to Congress by which it could be authorized to pass this Act, much less to find any authority conferred upon the President to approve the Act, or to justify him in a violation of the oath he had taken to support and maintain the provisions of the Constitution. Congress was guilty of a most flagrant usurpation by the passage of this Act, and the President, instead of being a check upon their unconstitutional measures, for which object the veto power was granted to him, became by his approval an accomplice in their usurpation. For nothing is more evident than that it is one of the powers reserved to the states to regulate the commercial intercourse between their citizens, to the extent even of establishment of inspection and quarantine regulations. The former of these is a benefit to commerce, and the latter, in some special cases, only retards it temporarily to secure the health of a community. Neither did a state of war authorize the government of the United States to interfere with the commercial intercourse between the citizens of the states, although under the law of nations it might be so justified with regard to foreign enemies, but this relation it persistently refused to concede to the Confederate states or to their citizens. It consistently asserted that they were its subjects in a state of insurrection, and if so, they were equally entitled to the provisions of the Constitution as for their protection as well as to its penalties. Still less could the government make an absolute forfeiture of the goods seized, as has already been shown when treating of the Confiscation Act. But that a state of war did not enlarge the powers of the government, as was assumed by this Act, was expressly decided by Chief Justice Taney in a case that arose under this Act. The Secretary of the Treasury issued the regulations for trade, as the Act assumed the power to authorize him to do in the section presented on a previous page. One carpenter neglected or refused to obtain the permit required, and his goods were seized. He contested the right of seizure, and the Chief Justice gave a decision at Baltimore in May 1863. He said, If these regulations had been made directly by Congress, they could not be sustained by a court of justice whose duty it is to administer the law according to the Constitution of the United States. For from the commencement of the government to this day, it has been admitted on all hands and repeatedly decided by the Supreme Court that the United States have no right to interfere with the internal and domestic trade of a state. They have no right to compel it to pass through their custom houses nor to tax it. This is so plainly set forth in the Constitution that it has never been supposed to be open to controversy or question. 
Undoubtedly, the United States authorities may take proper measures to prevent trade or intercourse with the enemy, but it does not by any means follow that they disregard the limits of all their own powers as prescribed by the Constitution, or the rights and powers reserved to the states and the people. A civil war, or any other, does not enlarge the powers of the federal government over the states or the people beyond what the compact has given to it in time of war. A state of war does not annul the tenth article of the amendment to the Constitution, which declares that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Nor does the Civil War or any other war absolve the Judicial Department from the duty of maintaining with an even and firm hand the rights and powers of the federal government and of the states and of the citizens as they are written in the Constitution, which every judge is sworn to support. Upon the whole, the court is of opinion that the regulations in question are illegal and void, and that the seizure of the goods of Carpenter, because he refused to comply with them, cannot be sustained. The judgment of the district court must therefore be reversed, and the goods delivered to the claimant, his agent, or proctor. The proclamation of the precedent required by the Act was issued on August 16, 1861, declaring certain states, and parts of certain states, to be in insurrection, etc., under it, some licenses were issued to places in Kentucky and Missouri, where the United States forces were located without any fruitful results. Some strong military and naval expeditions were fitted out to invade us and occupy the ports where cotton and other valuable products were usually shipped. An advance was made up the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers and down the Mississippi, as has been stated elsewhere. The ports of Beaufort, North Carolina, Port Royal, South Carolina, and New Orleans, Louisiana, were declared by proclamation of the President of the United States to be open for trade under the new system. Licenses were granted to foreign vessels by United States consuls and to coasting vessels by the Treasury Department, and the blockade was relaxed so far as related to those ports, except as to persons, property, and information contraband of war. Collectors were appointed at the above-mentioned ports, and a circular was addressed to the foreign ministers at Washington, announcing the reopening of communication with conquered southern localities. Again, on March 3, 1863, an act was passed which authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to appoint special agents to receive and collect all abandoned or captured property in any state or portion of a state designated as in insurrection. Under this act, a paper division of the whole of our territory was made into five special districts, and to each a special agent was appointed with numerous assistants. Abandoned property was defined to be that which had been deserted by the owners, or that which had been voluntarily abandoned by them to the civil or military authorities of the United States. Property which had been seized or taken from hostile possessions by the military or naval forces was also to be turned over to the special agents to be sold. All property not transported in accordance with the Treasury regulations was forfeitable. All expenses incurred in relation to the property were charged upon it. The views of General Grant on the operation of this system of measures as tending to retard the success of subjugation, which was the object of the war, were presented to the Secretary of the United States Treasury in a letter dated at Vicksburg on July 21, 1863. He writes, my experience in West Tennessee has convinced me that any trade whatever with the rebellious states is weakening to us at least 33% of our force. No matter what restrictions are thrown around trade, if any whatever is allowed, it will be made the means of supplying to the enemy what they want. Restrictions, if lived up to, make trade unprofitable, and hence none but dishonest men will go into it. I will venture to say that no honest man has made money in West Tennessee in the last year, while many fortunes have been made there during the time. The people in the Mississippi Valley are now nearly subjugated. Keep trade out for a few months, and I doubt not, but that the work of subjugation will be so complete that trade can be opened freely with the states of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. On September 11, 1863, revised regulations were issued by the Secretary, which divided the country into 13 districts, from Wheeling, West Virginia, to Natchez on the Mississippi, and a complete system of trade and transportation was organized. In December 1864, new regulations were issued which authorized the purchase of our products at certain points from any persons with bonds furnished by the Treasury. The products were sold, transportation was allowed, and the proceeds were made to constitute a fund for further purchases. A vigorous traffic sprang up under these regulations, which were suspended by an order of General Grant issued on March 10, 1865. 
and revoked on April 11th by himself. On April 29, 1865, all restrictions upon internal domestic and coastwise commercial intercourse with all country east of the Mississippi River were discontinued. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 37. The enemy crosses the Potomac and concentrates at Warrenton advances upon fredericksburg its position our forces the enemy crosses the rappahannock attack on general jackson the main attack repulse of the enemy on the right assaults on the left the enemy's columns broke and fled recross the river casualties position during the winter the enemy again crosses the rappahannock also crosses at kelly's ford Converging towards Chancellorville to the rear of our position. Inactivity on our front. Our forces concentrate near Chancellorsville and encounter the enemy. Position of the enemy. Attempt to turn his right. The enemy surprised and driven in the darkness. Jackson fired upon and wounded. Stuart in command. Battle renewed. Fredericksburg reoccupied. Attack on the heights. Repulse of the enemy. The enemy withdraws in the night. Our strength. Losses. Death of General Jackson. Another account. About the middle of October 1862, General McClellan crossed the Potomac east of the Blue Ridge and advanced southward, seizing the passes of the mountains as he progressed. In the latter part of the month, he began to incline eastwardly from the mountains, moving in the direction of Warrenton, about which he finally concentrated, his cavalry being thrown forward beyond the Rappahannock in the direction of Culpeper Courthouse. On November 15th, the enemy was in motion. The indications were that Fredericksburg was again to be occupied. Sumner's Corps had marched in the direction of Falmouth, and gunboats and transports had entered Aquia Creek. McLaws and Ransom's divisions were ordered to proceed to that city, and on the 21st it became apparent that the whole army, under General Burnside, who had succeeded General McClellan, was concentrating on the north side of the Rappahannock. About November 26th, Jackson was directed to advance toward Fredericksburg, and as some of the enemy's gunboats had appeared in the river at Port Royal, and it was possible that an attempt might be made to cross in that vicinity, D. H. Hill's division was stationed near that place and the rest of Jackson's corps so disposed as to support Hill or Longstreet, as occasion might require. The fords of the Rappahannock, above Fredericksburg, were closely guarded by our cavalry, and the brigade of General W. H. F. Lee was stationed near Port Royal to watch the river above and below. The interval before the advance of the foe was employed in strengthening our lines, extending from the river about a mile and a half above Fredericksburg along the range of hills in the rear of the city to the Richmond Railroad. As these hills were commanded by the opposite heights in possession of General Burnside's force, earthworks were constructed on their crest at the most eligible positions for artillery. To prevent gunboats ascending the river, a battery, protected by epaulments, was placed on the bank four miles below the city. The plain of Fredericksburg is so completely commanded by the Stafford Heights that no effectual opposition could be made to the passage of the river without exposing our troops to the destructive fire of the numerous batteries on the opposite heights. At the same time, the narrowness of the Rappahannock and its winding course presented opportunities for laying down pontoon bridges at points secure from the fire of our artillery. Our position was therefore selected with a view to resist and advance after crossing, and the river was guarded by detachments of sharpshooters to impede the laying of pontoons until our army could be prepared for action. Before dawn on December 11th, General Burnside was in motion. About 2 a.m. he commenced preparations to throw two bridges over the Rappahannock opposite Fredericksburg, and one about a mile and a quarter below near the mouth of Deep Run. From daybreak until 4 p.m., the troops, sheltered behind the houses on the river bank, repelled his repeated efforts to lay bridges opposite the town, driving back his working parties and their supports with great slaughter. 
at the lower point where there was no such protection he was successfully resisted until nearly noon when being exposed to the severe fire of the batteries on the opposite heights and a superior force of infantry on the river banks our troops were withdrawn and about one p m the bridge was completed soon afterward one hundred and fifty pieces of artillery opened a furious fire upon the city causing our troops to retire from the river bank about four p m the enemy then crossed in boats and proceeded rapidly to lay down the bridges his advance into the town was bravely contested until dark when our troops were recalled the necessary time for concentration having been gained brigadier general william barksdale who commanded the force placed in fredericksburg to resist the crossing performed that service with his well-known gallantry the enemy was prevented from constructing bridges and his attempts to cross in boats under the cover of artillery and musketry fire were repelled until late in the afternoon when general barksdale was ordered to retire he had directed lieutenant colonel Pfizer, commanding the seventeenth mississippi regiment of barksdale's brigade to select some skillful marksmen and proceed to check the operations of the pioneers who had commenced to lay pontoons above the city colonel Pfizer described to me the novel and bold expedient to which he successfully resorted he said his sharpshooters were placed in rifle pits on the bank opposite to that from which the bridge was started that his men were instructed to aim only at the bridge builders at dawn the workmen came forward to lay the cover on the bridge fire was opened some were killed and the rest of the party driven ashore then the enemy's batteries and riflemen opened a heavy fire on his position when his men would sit down in the rifle pits and remain quiet until the cannonade ceased probably under the supposition that our sharpshooters had been driven off the workmen would return our sharpshooters would arise and repeat the lesson lately given this he said with intervals of about an hour during which a continuous and heavy fire of artillery was kept up occurred nine times with the same result a repulse with severe loss and that for twelve hours every attempt to construct a bridge at that point was defeated then under orders they withdrew during the night and the succeeding day the enemy crossed in large numbers at and below the town secured from material interruption by a dense fog longstreet's corps constituted our left with anderson's division resting on the river and those of McLaws, Pickett, and Hood extending to the right. A. P. Hill of Jackson's Corps was posted between Hood's right and Hamilton's crossing on the railroad. His front line occupied the edge of a wood. Early and Talia Farrow's divisions constituted Jackson's second line. D. H. Hill's division, his reserve. His artillery was distributed along his line in the most eligible position so as to command the open ground in front shortly after nine a m the partial rising of the mist disclosed a large force moving in line of battle against jackson dense masses appeared in front of a p hill stretching far up the river in the direction of fredericksburg as they advanced major pelham of stuart's horse artillery opened a rapid and well-directed enfilade fire which arrested their progress four batteries immediately turned upon him and upon his withdrawal the enemy extended his left down the port royal road and his numerous batteries opened with vigor upon jackson's line eliciting no response his infantry moved forward to seize the position occupied by lieutenant colonel walker the latter reserving the fire of his fourteen pieces until their line had approached within less than eight hundred yards opened upon it with such destructive effect as to cause it to waver and soon retreat in confusion about one p m the main attack on the right began by a furious cannonade under cover of which three compact lines of infantry advanced against hill's front they were received as before and momentarily checked but soon recovering they pressed forward until coming within range of our infantry the contest became fierce and bloody archer and lane who occupied the edge of a wood repulsed those portions of the line immediately in front of them but before the interval between these commands could be closed the assailants pressed through in overwhelming numbers and turned the left of archer and the right of lane attacked in front and flank two regiments of the former and a brigade of the latter after a brave resistance gave way archer held his line until the arrival of reinforcements thomas came to the relief of lane and repulsed the column that had broken his line and drove it back to the railroad in the meantime a large force had penetrated the wood as far as hill's reserve where it was met by a fire for which it was not unprepared general hill says the advancing columns of the enemy encountered an obstacle at the military road which they little expected. Gregg's brigade of South Carolinians stood in the way. The advancing Federals were allowed to approach quite near when that brigade poured a withering fire into the faces of Meade's men, and Early's division from the second line swept forward, and the contest in the woods was short and decisive. 
the enemy was quickly routed and driven out with very heavy loss and though largely reinforced was pressed back and pursued to the shelter of the railroad embankment here he was gallantly charged by the brigades of hoke and atkinson and driven across the plain to his batteries the attack on hill's left was repulsed by the artillery on that part of the line against which a hot fire from twenty-four guns was directed the repulse of the foe on our right was decisive and the attack was not renewed but his batteries kept up an active fire at intervals and sharpshooters skirmished along the front during the afternoon while these events were transpiring on our right the enemy in formidable numbers made repeated and desperate assaults upon the left of our line about eleven a m having massed his troops under cover of the houses of fredericksburg he moved forward in strong columns to seize mary's and willis's hills all his batteries on the stafford heights directed their fire upon the positions occupied by our artillery with a view to silence it and cover the movement of the infantry without replying to this furious cannonade our batteries poured a rapid and destructive fire into the dense lines of the infantry as they advanced to the attack frequently breaking their ranks and forcing them to retreat to the shelter of the houses six times did he notwithstanding the havoc inflicted by our batteries press on with great determination to within one hundred yards of the foot of the hill but here encountering the deadly fire of our infantry his columns were broken and fled in confusion to the town the last assault was made shortly before dark this effort met the fate of those that preceded it and when night closed in his shattered masses had disappeared in the town leaving the field covered with his dead and wounded during the night our lines were strengthened by the construction of earthworks at exposed points and preparations made to receive the enemy on the next day the fourteenth passed however without a renewal of the attack the hostile batteries on both sides of the river played upon our lines at intervals our own firing but little on the fifteenth general burnside still retained his position apparently ready for battle but the day passed as the preceding but on the morning of the sixteenth it was discovered that he had availed himself of the darkness of the night and the prevalence of a violent storm of wind and rain to recross the river the town was immediately reoccupied and our positions on the river bank resumed in the engagement we captured more than nine hundred prisoners and nine thousand stand of arms a large quantity of ammunition was found in fredericksburg on our side 458 were killed and 3,743 wounded, total 4,201. The loss of the enemy was 1,152 killed, 9,101 wounded, and 3,234 missing, total 13,771. General Burnside testified before the Committee on the Conduct of the War that he had about 100,000 men on the south side of the river, and every single man of them was under artillery fire and about half of them were at different times formed in columns of attack. Lee's then 20,000 Confederate troops were actively engaged. This number composed about one-fourth of the army under General Lee. The returns of the Army of Northern Virginia show that on the 10th of December, 1862, General Lee had present for duty 78,228, and on December 20th, 75,524 of all arms upon being asked what causes he assigned for the failure of his attack general burnside replied to the committee on the conduct of the war it was found impossible to get the men up to the works the enemy's fire was too hot for them after the battle of fredericksburg the army of northern virginia remained encamped on the south side of the rappahannock until the latter part of april eighteen sixty three the federal army occupied the north side of the river opposite fredericksburg extending to the potomac two brigades of anderson's division those of mahone and posey were stationed near united states mine or bank mill ford the cavalry was distributed on both flanks fitzhugh lee's brigade picketing the rappahannock above the mouth of the rapidan and w h f lee's near port royal general longstreet with two divisions of his corps was detached for service south of the james river in february and did not rejoin the army until after the battle of chancellorsville Excepting a cavalry engagement near Kelly's Ford on March 17th, nothing of interest transpired during this period of inactivity. On April 14th, 1863, the enemy's cavalry was concentrating on the upper Rappahannock, but his efforts to establish himself on the south side of the river were successfully resisted. About the 21st, small bodies of infantry appeared at Kelly's Ford and the Rappahannock Bridge. At the same time, a demonstration was made opposite Port Royal these movements indicated that the army now commanded by major general hooker was about to resume active operations on the twenty eighth early in the morning the enemy crossed the river in boats near fredericksburg laid a pontoon bridge and built another about a mile below 
a considerable force crossed on these bridges during the day and was massed under the high banks of the river which afforded protection from our artillery while the batteries on the opposite heights completely commanded the wide plain between our lines and the narrow river as in the first battle at fredericksburg our dispositions were made with a view to resist a direct advance against us but the indications were that the principal effort would be made in some other quarter on the twenty ninth it was reported that he had crossed in force near kelly's ford and that a heavy column was moving from kelly's toward germania ford on the rapidan and another toward ely's ford the routes they were pursuing after crossing the rapidan converged near chancellorsville whence several roads led to the rear of our position at fredericksburg general anderson proceeded to cover these roads on the twenty ninth but learning that the enemy had crossed the rapidan and was approaching in strong force he retired early on the next morning to the intersection of the mine and plank roads near tabernacle church and began to entrench himself his rear guard as he left chancellorsville was attacked by cavalry but being vigorously repulsed offered no further opposition to his march the enemy on our front near fredericksburg continued inactive and it was now apparent that the main attack would be made upon our flank and rear it was therefore determined to leave sufficient troops to hold our lines and with the main body of the army to give battle to the approaching column early's division of jackson's corps and barksdale's brigade of mclaw's division with part of the reserve artillery under general pendleton were entrusted with the defense of our position at fredericksburg and at midnight on the thirtieth general mclaws marched with the rest of his command toward chancellorsville general jackson followed at dawn next morning with the remaining divisions of his corps he reached the position occupied by general anderson at eight a m and immediately began to make preparations to advance at eleven a m the troops moved forward on the plank and old turnpike roads the enemy was soon encountered on both roads and heavy skirmishing with infantry and artillery ensued our troops pressing steadily forward a strong attack upon mclaws was repulsed with spirit by semmy's brigade and general wright by direction of general anderson diverging to the left of the plank road marched by way of the unfinished railroad from fredericksburg to gordonsville and turned the federal right his whole line thereupon retreated rapidly vigorously pursued by our troops until they arrived within about one mile of chancellorsville here the enemy had assumed a position of great natural strength surrounded on all sides by a dense forest filled with a tangled undergrowth in the midst of which breastworks of logs had been constructed with trees felled in front so as to form an almost impenetrable abatis his artillery swept the few narrow roads by which his position could be approached from the front and commanded the adjacent woods the left of his line extended from chancellorsville toward the rappahannock covering the bank mill ford where he communicated with the north bank of the river by a pontoon bridge his right stretched westward along the germania ford road more than two miles darkness was approaching before the strength and the extent of his line could be ascertained and as the nature of the country rendered it hazardous to attack by night our troops were halted and formed in line of battle in front of chancellorsville at right angles to the plank road extending on the right to the mine road and to the left in the direction of the furnace it was evident that a direct attack by us would be attended with great difficulty and loss in view of the strength of his position and his superiority of numbers it was therefore resolved to endeavor to turn his right flank and gain his rear leaving a force in front to hold him in check and conceal the movement the execution of this plan was entrusted to lieutenant general jackson with his three divisions the commands of generals mclaws and anderson with the exception of wilcox's brigade which during the night had been ordered back to banks's ford remained in front of the enemy early on the morning of the second general jackson marched by the furnace and brock roads his movement being effectually covered by fitzhugh lee's cavalry under general stuart in person as the rear of his train was passing the furnace a large force of the enemy advanced from chancellorsville and attempted its capture but this advance was arrested after a long and fatiguing march general jackson's leading division under general rhodes reached the old turnpike about three miles in rear of chancellorsville at four p m as the different divisions arrived they were formed at right angles to the road rhodes in front trimbles under brigadier general colston in the second and a p hills in the third line at six p m the advance was ordered the enemy was taken by surprise and fled after a brief resistance general rhodes's men pushed forward with great vigor and enthusiasm followed closely by the second and third lines position after position was carried the guns captured and every effort of the foe to rally defeated by the impetuous rush of our troops in the ardor of pursuit through the thick and tangled woods the first and second lines at last became mingled and moved on together as one the fugitives made a stand at a line of breastworks across the road but the troops of rhodes and colston dashed over the entrenchments together 
and the flight and pursuit were resumed and continued until our advance was arrested by the abatis in front of the line of works near the central position at chancellorsville it was now dark and general jackson ordered the third line under general hill to advance to the front and relieve the troops of rhodes and colston who were completely blended and in such disorder from their advance through intricate woods and over broken ground that it was necessary to reform them as Hill's men moved forward, General Jackson, with his staff and escort, returning from the extreme front, met the skirmishers advancing, and in the obscurity of the night were mistaken for the enemy and fired upon. Captain Boswell, chief engineer of the Corps, and several others were killed and a number wounded, among whom was General Jackson, who was borne from the field. The command devolved under Major General Hill, whose division under General Heath was advanced to the line of entrenchments, which had been reached by Rhodes and Colston a furious fire of artillery was opened upon them under cover of which infantry advanced to the attack but were handsomely repulsed general hill soon afterward disabled and the command was turned over to general stuart he immediately proceeded to reconnoiter the ground and make himself acquainted with the disposition of the troops the darkness of the night and the difficulty of moving through the woods and undergrowth rendered it advisable to defer further operations until morning and the troops rested on their arms in line of battle as soon as the sound of cannon gave notice of jackson's attack on the enemy's right the troops in front began to press strongly on the left to prevent reinforcements being sent to the point of sailed they advanced up to the entrenchments while several batteries played with good effect until prevented by the increasing darkness early in the morning of may third general stuart renewed the attack upon general hooker who had strengthened his right wing during the night with additional breastworks while a large number of guns protected by entrenchments were posted so as to sweep the woods through which our troops had to advance hill's division was in front with colston in the second line and rhodes in the third the second and third lines soon advanced to the support of the first and the whole became hotly engaged the breastworks at which the attack was suspended on the preceding evening were carried by assault under a terrible fire of musketry and artillery in the rear of these breastworks was a barricade from which the enemy was quickly driven the troops on the left of the plank road pressing through the woods attacked and broke the next line while those on the right bravely assailed the extensive earthworks behind which general hooker's artillery was posted three times were these works carried and as often were the brave assailants compelled to abandon them twice by the retirement of the troops on their left who fell back after a gallant struggle with superior numbers and once by a movement of the enemy on their right caused by the advance of general anderson the left, being reinforced, finally succeeded in driving back the enemy, and the artillery under Lieutenant Colonels Carter and Jones, being thrown forward to occupy favorable positions secured by the advance of the infantry, began to play with great precision and effect. Anderson, in the meantime, pressed gallantly forward directly upon Chancellorsville, his right resting upon the plank road and his left extending around the furnace, while McLaws made a strong demonstration to the right of the road as the troops advancing upon the enemy's front and right converged upon his central position anderson effected a junction with jackson's corps and the whole line pressed irresistibly general hooker's army was driven from all its fortified positions with heavy loss in killed wounded and prisoners and retreated toward the rappahannock by ten a m we were in full possession of the field the troops having become somewhat scattered by the difficulties of the ground and the ardor of the contest were immediately reformed preparatory to renewing the attack the enemy had withdrawn to a strong position nearer to the Rappahannock, which he had fortified. His superiority of numbers, the unfavorable nature of the ground, which was densely wooded, and the condition of our troops after the arduous and sanguinary conflict in which they had been engaged, rendered great caution necessary. Our operations were just completed, when further movements were arrested by intelligence received from Fredericksburg. Before dawn, on the morning of the 3rd, it was known that the enemy had occupied Fredericksburg in large force and laid down a bridge at the town. He made a demonstration against the extreme right of the force left to hold our lines, which was easily repulsed by General Early. Soon afterward, a column moved from Fredericksburg along the river banks as if to gain the heights on the extreme left, which commanded those immediately in rear of the town. This attempt was foiled. Very soon, the enemy advanced in large force against Mary's and the hills to the right and left of it two assaults were gallantly repulsed after the second a flag of truce was sent from the town to obtain permission to provide for the wounded three heavy lines advanced immediately upon the return of the flag and renewed the attack they were bravely repulsed on the right and left but the small force at the foot of mary's hill overpowered by more than ten times their numbers was captured after an heroic resistance and the hill carried 
the success of the enemy enabled him to threaten our communications by moving down the telegraph road or to come upon our rear at chancellorsville by the plank road he began to advance on the plank road his progress being gallantly disputed by the brigade of general wilcox who fell back slowly until he reached salem church on the plank road about five miles from fredericksburg in this state of affairs in our rear, General Lee led General McLaws with his three brigades to reinforce General Wilcox. He arrived at Salem Church early in the afternoon, where he found General Wilcox in line of battle with a large force of the enemy, consisting, as it was reported, of one army corps and part of another in his front. The enemy's artillery played vigorously upon our position for some time, when his infantry advanced in three strong lines, the attack being directed mainly against General Wilcox but partially involving the brigades on his left. The assault was met with the utmost firmness, and after a fierce struggle, the first line was repulsed with great slaughter. The second then came forward, but immediately broke under the close and deadly fire which it encountered, and the whole mass fled in confusion to the rear. They were pursued by the brigades of Wilcox and Semes, which advanced nearly a mile, when they were halted to reform in the presence of the hostile reserve, which now appeared in large force. It being quite dark, General Wilcox deemed it imprudent to push the attack with his small numbers, and retired to his original position, the enemy making no attempt to follow. The next morning General Early advanced along the Telegraph Road, and recaptured Mary's and the adjacent hills without difficulty, thus gaining the rear of the enemy's left. In the meantime, General Hooker had so strengthened his position near Chancellorsville that it was deemed inexpedient to assail it with less than our whole force which had been reduced by the detachment led to Fredericksburg to relieve us from the danger that menaced our rear. It has been heretofore stated that General Longstreet had been sent with two divisions of Lee's array to cooperate with General French on the south side of the James River in the capture of Suffolk, the occupation of which by the enemy interrupted our collection of supplies in the eastern counties of North Carolina and Virginia. When the advance of Hooker threatened General Lee's front, instructions were sent to General Longstreet to hasten his return to the army with the large force detached with him. These instructions were repeated with urgent insistence, yet his movements were so delayed that though the Battle of Chancellorsville did not occur until many days after he was expected to join, his force was absent when it occurred. Had he rejoined his command in due time, Lee need not have diminished his force in front of Hooker so as to delay the renewal of the attack and force him to a precipitate retreat involving the loss of his artillery and trains. It was accordingly resolved still further to reinforce the troops in front in order, if possible, to drive Hooker across the Rappahannock. Some delay occurred in getting the troops into position, owing to the broken and irregular nature of the ground, and the difficulty of ascertaining the disposition of the opposing forces. The attack did not begin until 6 p.m., when the enemy's troops were rapidly driven across the plank road in the direction of the Rappahannock. The speedy approach of darkness prevented General McLaws from perceiving the success of the attack until the foe began to recross the river a short distance below Banks's ford, where he had laid one of his pontoon bridges. His right brigades advanced through the woods in the direction of the firing, but the retreat was so rapid that they could only join in the pursuit. A dense fog settled over the field, increasing the obscurity and rendering great caution necessary to avoid collision between our own troops. Their movements were consequently slow. The next morning it was found that the enemy had made good his escape and removed his bridges. Fredericksburg was evacuated, and our rear no longer threatened. But as General Hooker had it in his power to recross, it was deemed best to leave a force to hold our lines as before. McLaws and Anderson being directed to return to Chancellorsville, they reached their destination during the afternoon in the midst of a violent storm, which continued throughout the night and most of the following day. Preparations were made to assail the enemy's works at daylight on the 6th, but, on advancing our skirmishers, it was found that under the cover of the storm and darkness of the night he had retreated over the river. A detachment was left to guard the battlefield, while the wounded were removed and the captured properly collected. The rest of the army returned to its former position. The loss of the enemy, according to his own statement, was 1,512 killed and 9,518 wounded, total 11,030. His dead and a large number of wounded were left on the field. About 5,000 prisoners exclusive of the wounded were taken, and 13 pieces of artillery, 19,500 stand of arms, 17 colors, and a large quantity of ammunition fell into our hands. Our loss was much less in killed and wounded than that of the enemy, but of the number was one, a host in himself, Lieutenant General Jackson, who was wounded and died on May 10th. Of this great captain, General Lee, in his anguish at his death, justly said, I have lost my right arm. 
as an executive officer he had no superior and war has seldom shown an equal too devoted to the cause he served to have any personal motive he shared the toils privations and dangers of his troops when in chief command and in subordinate position his aim was to understand the purpose of his commander and faithfully to promote its success he was the complement of lee united they had achieved such results that the public felt secure under their shield to us his place was never filled the official return of the army of northern virginia on march thirty first eighteen sixty three shows as present for duty fifty seven thousand one hundred twelve of which six thousand five hundred nine were cavalry and one thousand six hundred twenty one reserve artillery on may twentieth two weeks after the battle and when pickett's and hood's divisions had rejoined the army the total infantry force numbered but fifty five thousand two hundred sixty one effective men from which if the strength of hood's and pickett's divisions is deducted there would remain forty one thousand three hundred fifty eight as the strength of the commands that participated in the battles of chancellorsville the army of the potomac numbered one hundred twenty thousand men infantry and artillery with a body of twelve thousand well-equipped cavalry and an artillery force of four hundred guns a brief and forcible account of this battle is given by taylor a formidable force under general sedgwick was thrown across the river below fredericksburg and made demonstrations of an intention to assail the confederate front meanwhile with great celerity and secrecy general hooker with the bulk of his array crossed at the upper fords and in an able manner and wonderfully short time had concentrated four of his seven army corps numbering fifty six thousand men at chancellorsville about ten miles west of fredericksburg his purpose was now fully developed to general lee who instead of awaiting its further prosecution immediately determined on the movement the least expected by his opponent he neither proceeded to make strong his left against an attack from the direction of chancellorsville nor did he move southward so as to put his army between that of general hooker and the confederate capital but leaving general early with about nine thousand men to take care of general sedgwick he moved with the remainder of his army numbering forty eight thousand men toward chancellorsville as soon as the advance of the enemy was encountered it was attacked with vigor and very soon the federal army was on the defensive in its apparently impregnable position it was not the part of wisdom to attempt to storm this stronghold but sedgwick would certainly soon be at work in the rear and early with his inadequate force could not do more than delay and harass him it was therefore imperatively necessary to strike to strike boldly effectively and at once there could be no delay meanwhile two more army corps had joined general hooker who now had about chancellorsville ninety one thousand men six corps except one division of the second corps conks which had been left with sedgwick at fredericksburg it was a critical position for the confederate commander but his confidence in his trusted lieutenant and brave men was such that he did not long hesitate encouraged by the counsel and confidence of general jackson he determined to still further divide his army and while he with the divisions of anderson and mclaws less than fourteen thousand men should hold the enemy in his front he would hurl jackson upon his flank and rear and crush and crumble him as between the upper and nether millstone the very boldness of the movement contributed much to ensure its success the flank movement of jackson's wing was attended with extraordinary success on the afternoon of the second day of may he struck such a blow to the enemy on their extreme right as to cause dismay and demoralization to their entire army this advantage was promptly and vigorously followed up the next day when generals lee and stuart the latter then in command of jackson's wing joined elbows and after most heroic and determined effort their now united forces finally succeeded in storming and capturing the works of the enemy meantime sedgwick had forced early out of the heights at fredericksburg and had advanced toward chancellorsville thus threatening the confederate rear general lee having defeated the greater force and driven it from its stronghold now gathered up a few of the most available of his victorious brigades and turned upon the lesser on may third sedgwick's force was encountered near salem church and its further progress checked by general mclaws with the five brigades detached by general lee for this service including wilcox's which had been stationed at banks's ford on the next day general anderson was sent to reinforce mclaws with three additional brigades meanwhile general early had connected with these troops and in the afternoon so soon as dispositions could be made for attack sedgwick's lines were promptly assailed and broken the main assault being made on the enemy's left by early's troops the situation was now a critical one for the federal lieutenant darkness came to his rescue and on the night of the fourth he crossed to the north side of the river on the fifth general lee concentrated for another assault on the new line taken up by general hooker but on the morning of the sixth it was ascertained that the enemy in general lee's language had sought safety beyond the rappahannock 
and the river flowed again between the hostile hosts. End of section 23《24of the Rise and the Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 38. Relations with Foreign Nations, The Public Questions, Ministers Abroad, Usages of intercourse between nations, our action, mistake of European nations, they follow the example of England and France, different conditions of the belligerents, injury to the Confederacy with a single exception, these agreements remained inoperative, extent of the pretended blockade, remonstrances against its recognition, sinking vessels to block up harbors, every prescription of maritime law violated by the United States government, protest. Addition made to the law by Great Britain. Policy pursued favorable to our enemies. Instances. Mediation proposed by France to Great Britain and Russian letter of French minister. Reply of Great Britain. Reply of Russia. Letter to French minister at Washington. Various offensive actions of the British government. Encouraging to the United States. Hollow profession of neutrality. The public questions arising out of our foreign relations were too important to be overlooked. At the end of the first year of the war, the Confederate States had been recognized by the leading governments of Europe as a belligerent power. This continued unchanged to the close. Mr. Mason became our representative in London, Mr. Slidell in Paris, Mr. Rost in Spain, and Mr. Mann in Belgium. They performed with energy and skill the positions, but were unsuccessful in obtaining our recognition as an independent power. The usages of intercourse between nations require that official communication be made to friendly powers of all organic changes in the Constitution of States. To those who are familiar with the principles upon which the states known as the United States were originally constituted, as well as those upon which the Union was formed, the organic changes made by the succession and confederation of the southern states are very apparent. But to others an explanation may be necessary. Each of the states was originally declared to be sovereign and independent. In this condition, at a former period, all of those then existing were severally recognized by name by the only one of the powers which had denied their right to independence. This gave to each a recognized national sovereignty. Subsequently, they formed a compact of voluntary union, whereby a new organization was constituted, which was made the representative of the individual states in all general intercourse with other nations. So long as the compact continued in force, this agent represented merely the sovereignty of the states, but when a portion of the states withdrew from the compact and formed a new one under the name of the Confederate States, they had made such organic changes in their constitution as to require official notice in compliance with the usages of nations. For this purpose, the provisional government took early measures for sending to Europe commissioners charged with the duty of visiting the capitals of the different powers and making arrangements for the opening of more formal diplomatic intercourse. Prior, however, to the arrival abroad of these commissioners, the Government of the United States had addressed communications to the different cabinets of Europe in which it assumed the attitude of being sovereign over the Confederate States, and alleged that these independent states were in rebellion against the remaining states of the Union, and threatened Europe with manifestations of its displeasure if it should treat the Confederate States as having an independent existence. It soon became known that these pretensions were not considered abroad to be as absurd as they were known to be at home nor had Europe yet learned what reliance was to be placed in the official statements of the cabinet at Washington. The delegation of power granted by the states to the general government to represent them in foreign intercourse had led European nations into the grave error of supposing that their separate sovereignty and independence had been merged into one common sovereignty and had ceased to have a distinct existence. Under the influence of this error, which all appeals to reason and historical fact were vainly used to dispel, our commissioners were met by the declaration that foreign governments could not assume to judge between the conflicting representations of the two parties as to the true nature of their previous relations. The governments of Great Britain and France accordingly signified their determination to confine themselves to recognizing the self-evident fact of the existence of a war and to maintain a strict neutrality during its progress. 
some of the other powers of europe pursued the same course of policy and it became apparent that by some understanding express or tacit europe had decided to leave the initiative in all action touching the contest on this continent to the two powers just named who were recognized to have the largest interests involved both by reason of proximity to and of the extent of intimacy of their commercial relations with the states engaged in war it was manifest that the course of action adopted by europe while based on an apparent refusal to determine the question or to side with either party was in point of fact an actual decision against our rights and in favor of the groundless pretensions of the united states it was a refusal to treat us as an independent government if we were independent states the refusal to entertain with us the same international intercourse which was maintained with our enemy was unjust and was injurious in its effects whatever might have been the motive which prompted it neither was it in accordance with the high moral obligations of that international code whose chief sanction is the conscience of sovereigns and the public opinion of mankind that those eminent powers should have declined the performance of a duty peculiarly incumbent upon them from any apprehension of the consequences to themselves one immediate and necessary result of their declining the responsibility of a decision which must have been adverse to the extravagant pretensions of the united states was the prolongation of hostilities to which our enemies were thereby encouraged and which resulted in scenes of carnage and devastation on this continent and of misery and suffering on the other such as have scarcely a parallel in history had those powers promptly admitted our right to be treated as all other independent nations none can doubt that the moral effect of such action would have been to dispel the pretension under which the united states persisted in their efforts to accomplish our subjugation there were other matters in which less than justice was rendered to the confederacy by neutral europe an undue advantage conferred on the aggressors in a wicked war at the inception of hostilities the inhabitants of the confederate states were almost exclusively agriculturists those of the united states were also to a large extent mechanics merchants and navigators we had no commercial marine while their merchant vessels covered the ocean we were without a navy while they had powerful fleets built by the money we had in full share contributed the power which they possessed for inflicting injury on our coasts and harbors was thus counterbalanced in some measure by the exposure of their commerce to attack by private armed vessels it was known to europe that within a very few years past the united states had peremptorily refused to accede proposals for the abolition of privateering on the ground as alleged by them that nations owning powerful fleets would thereby obtain undue advantage over those possessing inferior naval force yet no sooner was war flagrant between the confederacy and the united states than the maritime powers of europe issued orders prohibiting either party from bringing prizes into their ports this prohibition directed with apparent impartiality against both belligerents was in reality effective against the confederate states only for they alone could find a hostile commerce on the ocean merely nominal against the united states the prohibition operated with intense severity on the confederacy by depriving it of the only means of maintaining its struggle on the ocean against the crashing superiority of the naval force possessed by its enemies the value and efficiency of the weapon which was thus wrested from our grasp by the combined action of neutral european powers in favor of a power which professes openly its intention of ravaging their commerce by privateers in any future war is strikingly illustrated by the terror inspired among commercial classes of the united states by a single cruiser of the confederacy one small steamer commanded by officers and manned by a crew who were debarred by the closure of neutral ports from the opportunity of causing captured vessels to be condemned in their favor as prizes suffice to double the rates of maritime insurance in northern ports and consign to forced inaction numbers of northern vessels in addition to the direct damage inflicted by captures at sea but it was especially in relation to the so-called blockade that the policy of european powers was so shaped as to cause the greatest injury to the confederacy and to confer signal advantages on the united states a few words in explanation may here be necessary prior to the year eighteen fifty six the principles regulating this subject were to be gathered from the writings of eminent publicists the decisions of admiralty courts international treaties and the usages of nations the uncertainty and doubt which prevailed in reference to the true rules of maritime law in time of war resulting from the discordant and often conflicting principles announced from such varied and independent sources had become a grievous evil to mankind whether a blockade was allowable against a port not invested by land as well as by sea whether a blockade was valid by sea if the investing fleet was merely sufficient to render ingress to the blockaded port evidently dangerous or whether it was further required for its legality that it should be sufficient really to prevent access and numerous other similar questions had remained doubtful and undecided 
animated by the highly honorable desire to put an end to differences of opinion between neutrals and belligerents which may occasion serious difficulties and even conflicts such was the official language the five great powers of europe together with sardinia and turkey adopted in eighteen fifty six the following declaration of principles one privateering is and remains abolished two the neutral flag covers enemies goods with the exception of contraband of war three neutral goods with the exception of contraband of war are not liable to capture under enemy's flag four blockades in order to be binding must be effective that is to say maintained by a force sufficient really to prevent access to the coast of the enemy not only did this solemn declaration announce to the world the principles to which the signing powers agreed to conform in future wars but it contained a clause to which these powers gave immediate effect and which provided that the states not parties to the congress of paris should be invited to accede to the declaration under this invitation every independent state in europe yielded its assent at least no instance is known to me of a refusal and the united states while declining to assent to the proposition which prohibited privateering declared that the three remaining principles were in accordance with their own views of international law no instance is known in history of the adoption of rules of public law under circumstances of like solemnity with like unanimity and pledging the faith of nations with a sanctity so peculiar when therefore this confederacy was formed and when neutral powers while deferring action on its demand for admission into the family of nations recognized it as a belligerent power great britain and france made informal proposals about the same time that their own rights as neutrals should be guaranteed by our acceding as belligerents to the declaration of principles made by the congress of paris the request was addressed to our sense of justice and therefore met immediate and favorable response in the resolutions of the provisional congress of the thirteenth of august eighteen sixty one by which all the principles announced by the congress of paris were adopted as the guide of our conduct during the war with the sole exception of that relative to privateering as the right to make use of privateers was one in which neutral nations had as to the then existing war no interest as it was a right which the united states had refused to abandon and which they remained at liberty to employ against us as it was a right of which we were already in actual enjoyment and which we could not be expected to renounce flagrante bello against an adversary possessing an overwhelming superiority of naval forces it was reserved with the entire confidence that neutral nations could not fail to perceive that just reason existed for the reservation nor was this confidence misplaced for the original documents published by the british government contain the expression of that satisfaction of that government with the conduct of officials who conducted successfully the delicate transaction confided to their charge these solemn declarations of principle this implied agreement between the confederacy and the two powers just named were suffered to remain inoperative against the menaces and outrages on neutral rights committed by the united states with unceasing and progressing arrogance during the whole period of the war neutral europe remained passive when the united states with a naval force insufficient to blockade effectively the coast of a single state proclaimed a paper blockade of thousands of miles of coast extending from the capes of the chesapeake to those of florida encircling the gulf of mexico from key west to the mouth of the rio grande compared with this monstrous pretension of the united states the blockades known in history under the names of the berlin and milan decrees and the british orders in council in the years eighteen o six and eighteen o seven sink into insignificance those blockades were justified by the powers that declared them on the sole ground that they were retaliatory that they have since been condemned by the publicists of those very powers as violations of international law it will be remembered that those blockades evoked angry remonstrances from neutral powers among which the united states were the most conspicuous and were in their consequences the chief cause of the war between great britain and the united states in eighteen twelve also that they formed one of the principal motives that led to the declaration of the congress of paris in eighteen fifty six in the fond hope of imposing an enduring check on the very abuse of maritime power which was renewed by the united states in eighteen sixty one and eighteen sixty two under circumstances and with features of aggravated wrong without precedent in history repeated informal remonstrances were made by the confederate government to neutral powers against the recognition of that blockade it was shown by evidence not capable of contradiction and which was furnished in part by the officials of neutral nations that the few ports of the confederacy before which any naval forces at all were stationed were invested so inefficiently that hundreds of entries were effected into them after the declaration of the blockade that our enemies admitted the inefficiency of their blockade in the most forcible manner by repeated official complaints of the sale to us of goods of contraband of war a sale which could not possibly have affected their interests if their pretended blockade had been sufficient really to prevent access to our coasts 
repeated informal remonstrances were made by the confederate government to neutral powers against the recognition of that blockade it was shown by evidence not capable of contradiction and which was furnished in part by the officials of neutral nations that the few ports of the confederacy before which any naval forces at all were stationed were invested so inefficiently that hundreds of entries were effected into them after the declaration of the blockade that our enemies admitted the inefficiency of their blockade in the most forcible manner by repeated official complaints of the sale to us of goods contraband of war a sale which could not possibly have affected their interests if their pretended blockade had been sufficient really to prevent access to our coasts that they alleged their inability to render their paper blockade effective as the excuse for the odious barbarity of destroying the entrance to one of the harbors by sinking vessels loaded with stone in the channel that our commerce with foreign nations was interrupted not by the effective investment of our ports but by watching the ports of the west indies not only by the seizure of ships in the attempt to enter the confederate ports but by the capture on the high seas of neutral vessels by the cruisers of our enemies whenever supposed to be bound to any point on our extensive coast without inquiry whether a single blockading vessel was to be found at such a point that blockading vessels had left the ports at which they were stationed for distant expeditions were absent for many days and returned without notice either of the cessation or renewal of the blockade in a word that every prescription of maritime law and every right of neutral nations to trade with the belligerent under the sanction of principles heretofore universally respected were systematically and persistently violated by the united states neutral europe received our remonstrances and submitted in almost unbroken silence to all the wrongs that the united states chose to inflict on its commerce the cabinet of great britain however did not confine itself to such implied acquiescence in these breaches of international law which resulted from simple inaction but in a published dispatch of the minister for foreign affairs assumed to make a change in the principle enunciated by the congress of paris to which the faith of the british government was considered to be pledged the change was so important and so prejudicial to the interests of the confederacy that after a vain attempt to obtain satisfactory explanations from that government i directed a solemn protest to be made in a published dispatch from her majesty's foreign office to her minister at washington under the date of february eleventh eighteen sixty two occurred the following passage her majesty's government however are of the opinion that assuming that the blockade was duly notified and also that a number of ships is stationed and remains at the entrance of a port sufficient really to prevent access to it or to create an evident danger of entering it or leaving it and that these ships do not voluntarily permit ingress or egress the fact that various ships may have successfully escaped through it as in the particular instance here referred to will not of itself prevent the blockade from being an effectual one by international law the words which i have italicized were an addition made by the british government of its own authority to a principle the exact terms of which were settled with deliberation by the common consent of civilized nations and by implied convention with our government as already explained and their effect was clearly to reopen to the prejudice of the confederacy one of the very disputed questions of the law of blockade which the congress of paris proposed to settle the importance of this change was readily illustrated by taking one of our ports as an example there was evident danger in entering the port of wilmington from the presence of a blockading force and by this test the blockade was effective access is not really prevented by the blockading fleet to the same port for steamers were continually arriving and departing so that tried by this test the blockade was ineffective and invalid thus while every energy of our country was evoked in the struggle for maintaining its existence the neutral nations of europe pursued a policy which nominally impartial was practically most favorable to our enemies and most detrimental to us the exercise of the neutral right of refusing entry into their ports to prizes taken by both belligerents was especially hurtful to the confederacy it was sternly adhered to and enforced the assertion of the neutral right of commerce with a belligerent whose ports are not blockaded by fleets sufficient really to prevent access to them would have been eminently beneficial to the confederate states and only thus hurtful to the united states it was complacently abandoned the duty of neutral states to receive with cordiality and recognize with respect any new confederation that independent states may think proper to form was too clear to admit of denial but its postponement was equally beneficial to the united states and detrimental to the confederacy it was postponed in this statement of our relations with the nations of europe it has been my purpose to point out distinctly that the confederacy had no complaint to make that those nations declared their neutrality it could neither expect nor desire more 
the complaint was that the declared neutrality was delusive not real that recognized neutral rights were alternately asserted and waived in such manner as to bear with great severity on us while conferring signal advantages on our enemy perhaps it may not be out of place here to notice a correspondence between the cabinets of france great britain and russia relative to a mediation between the confederacy and the united states on october thirtieth eighteen sixty two the french minister of foreign affairs drouin de la Huse, addressed a note to the ambassadors of france at london and st petersburg in this dispatch he stated that the emperor had followed with painful interest the struggle which had then been going on for more than a year on this continent he observed that the proofs of energy perseverance and courage on both sides had been given at the expense of innumerable calamities and immense bloodshed to the accompaniments of civil conflict was to be added at the apprehension of servile war which would be the climax of so many irreparable misfortunes if these calamities affected america only the sufferings of a friendly nation would be enough to excite the anxiety and sympathy of the emperor but europe also had suffered in one of the principal branches of her industry and her artisans had been subjected to most cruel trials france and the maritime powers had during the struggle maintained the strictest neutrality but the sentiments by which they were animated far from imposing on them anything like indifference seem on the contrary to require that they should assist the two belligerent parties in an endeavor to escape from a position which appeared to have no issue the forces of the two sides had hitherto fought with balanced success and the latest accounts did not show any prospect of a speedy termination of the war these circumstances taken together seemed to favor the adoption of measures which might bring about a truce the emperor of the french therefore was of the opinion that there was now an opportunity of offering to the belligerents the good offices of the maritime powers he therefore proposed to her majesty as well as to the emperor of russia that the three courts should endeavor both at washington and in communication with the confederate states to bring about a suspension of arms for six months during which time every act of hostility direct or indirect should cease at sea as well as on land this armistice might if necessary be renewed for a further period this proposal he proceeded to say would not imply on the part of the three powers any judgment on the origin of the war or any pressure on the negotiations for peace which it was hoped would take place during the armistice the three powers would only interfere to smooth the obstacles and only within the limits which the two interested parties would prescribe the french government was of the opinion that even in the event of a failure of immediate success those overtures might have proved useful in leading the minds of men heated by passion to consider the advantages of conciliation and peace the reply of great britain through lord john russell on november thirteenth eighteen sixty two is really contained in this extract after weighing all the information which has been received from america her majesty's government are led to the conclusion that there is no ground at the present moment to hope that the federal government would accept the proposal suggested and a refusal from washington at the present time would prevent any speedy renewal of the offer the russian government in reply said according to the information we have hitherto received we are inclined to believe that a combined step between france england and russia no matter how conciliatory and how cautiously made if it were taken with an official and collective character would run the risk of causing precisely the very opposite of the object of pacification which is the aim of the wishes of the three courts the unfavorable reception of the proposal was communicated by the french minister of foreign affairs to the representative of france at washington in this communication he said convinced as we were that an understanding between the three powers in the sense presented by us would answer as much the interests of the american people as our own that even that understanding was in the existing circumstances a duty of humanity you will easily form an idea of our regret at seeing the initiative we have taken after mature reflection remains without results being also desirous of informing mr dayton the united states minister of our project i confidently communicated it to him and even read in his presence the dispatch sent to london and st petersburg i could not but be surprised that the minister of the united states should oppose his objections to the project i communicated to him and to hear him express personally some doubts as to the reception which would be given by the cabinet at washington to the joint offers of the good offices of france russia and great britain it has already been stated that by common understanding the initiative in all action touching the contest on this continent had been left by foreign powers to the two great maritime nations of western europe and that the governments of these two nations had agreed to take no measures without previous concert the result of these arrangements therefore placed it in the power of either france or england to obstruct at pleasure the recognition to which the confederacy was justly entitled or even to prolong the continuance of hostilities on this side of the atlantic if the policy of either could be promoted by the postponement of peace 
each two thus became possessed of great influence in so shaping the general exercise of neutral rights in europe as to render them subservient to the purpose of aiding one of the belligerents to the detriment of the other perhaps it may not be out of place to present a few examples by which to show the true nature of the neutrality professed in this war in may eighteen sixty one the government of her britannic majesty assured our enemies that the sympathies of this country great britain were rather with the north than with the south on june first eighteen sixty one the british government interdicted the use of its ports to armed ships and privateers both of the united states and the so-called confederate states with their prizes the secretary of state of the united states fully appreciated the character and motive of this interdiction when he observed to lord lyons who communicated it that this measure and that of the same character which had been adopted by france would probably prove a death blow to southern privateering a means it will be remembered which the united states had refused to abandon for themselves on the twelfth of june eighteen sixty one the united states minister in london informed her majesty's minister for foreign affairs that the fact of his having held interviews with the commissioners of our government had given great dissatisfaction and that a protraction of this would be viewed by the united states as hostile in spirit and to require some corresponding action accordingly in response to this imitation her majesty's minister gave assurance that he had no expectation of seeing them any more further extracts will show the marked encouragement to the united states to persevere in its paper blockade and unmistakable imitations that her majesty's government would not contest its validity on may twenty first eighteen o one earl russell pointed out to the united states minister in london that the blockade might no doubt be made effective considering the small number of harbors on the southern coast even though the extent of three thousand miles were comprehended in the terms of that blockade on january fourteenth eighteen sixty two her majesty's minister in washington communicated to his government that in extenuation of the barbarous attempt to destroy the port of charleston by sinking a stone fleet in the harbor mr seward had explained that the government of the united states had last spring with a navy very little prepared for so extensive an operation undertaken to blockade upward of three thousand miles of coast the secretary of the navy had reported that he could stop up the large holes by means of his ships but that he could not stop up the small ones it has been found necessary therefore to close some of the numerous small inlets by sinking vessels in the channel on may sixth eighteen sixty two so far from claiming the right of british subjects as neutrals to trade with us as belligerents and to disregard the blockade on the grounds of this explicit confession by our enemy of his inability to render it effective her majesty's minister for foreign affairs claimed credit with the united states for friendly action in respecting it his lordship stated that the united states government on the allegation of a rebellion pervading from nine to eleven states of the union have now for more than twelve months endeavored to maintain a blockade of three thousand miles of coast this blockade kept up irregularly but when enforced enforced severely has seriously injured the trade and manufactures of the united kingdom thousands are now obliged to resort to the poor rates for subsistence owing to this blockade yet her majesty's government has never sought to take advantage of the obvious imperfections of this blockade in order to declare it ineffective they have to the loss and detriment of the british nation scrupulously observed the duties of great britain toward a friendly state it is not necessary to pursue this subject further suffice it to say that the british government when called upon to redeem its pledge made at paris in eighteen fifty six and renewed to the confederacy in eighteen sixty one replied that it could not regard the blockade of southern ports as having been otherwise than practically effective in february eighteen sixty two and that the manner in which it has since been enforced gives to neutral governments no excuse for asserting that the blockade had not been effectively maintained the partiality of her majesty's government in favor of our enemies was further evinced in the marked difference of its conduct on the subject of the purchase of supplies by the two belligerents this difference was conspicuous from the very commencement of the war as early as may first eighteen sixty one the british minister in washington was informed by the secretary of state of the united states that he had sent agents to england and that others would go to france to purchase arms and this fact was communicated to the british foreign office which interposed no objection yet in october of the same year earl russell entertained the complaint of the united states minister in london that the confederate states were importing contraband of war from the island of nassau directed inquiry into the matter and obtained a report from the authorities of the island denying the allegations which report was enclosed to mr adams and received by him as satisfactory evidence to dissipate the suspicion thrown upon the authorities by that unwarrantable act so too when the confederate government purchased in great britain as a neutral country with strict observance both of the law and of nations and the municipal law of great britain vessels which were subsequently armed and commissioned as vessels of war after they had been far removed from english waters 
the british government in violation of its own laws and in deference to the inopportune demands of the united states made an ineffectual attempt to seize one vessel and did actually seize and detain another which touched at the island of nassau on her way to a confederate port and subjected her to all unfounded prosecution at the very time when cargoes of munitions of war were openly shipped from british ports to new york to be used in warfare against us further instances need not be adduced to show how detrimental to us and advantageous to our enemy was the manner in which the leading european power observed its hollow profession of neutrality toward the belligerents End of section twenty four